Chapter 26 of The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 26 Deputation from the Asnabones Characteristic Speech of Yellow Welly Visit to the Fort Visit to Fort Union Rescue of five white men from starvation. Arrival at Fort Cass. Departure for the village. Visit of the snakes to the crows. We received another deputation from the Nanny Bones to sue for a renewal of peace. We had lost a warrior and two women. We had been massacred when away from the village, and on discovery of the bodies, we followed the trail of the perp traders in the direction of the Blackfoot country. We eventually discovered that many petty outrages which we had charged upon the Blackfeet were in reality committed by the treacherous Asnabones. On their return from their thievish inroads, they were in the habit of proceeding very near to a Blackfoot village with which they were at peace and then turning obliquely would cross the Missouri into their own country. Becoming acquainted with this oft-repeated ruse, we determined to chastise them. I accordingly crossed the Missouri with a force of 850 men and invaded their territory with the determination to inflict upon them such a chastisement as should recall them to a sense of decency. We encountered a small village, only numbering 40 lodges, on their way to Fort Union and within a few hundred yards of the fort. Seeing our approach, they entrenched themselves in a hollow, rendering our assault a work of danger. But we stormed in their position and killed 26 warriors, all of whom we scalped. The remainder we could not get at, as we found their position impregnable. Admonished by this chastisement, they sent another deputation to us to treat for the reestablishment of peace. But their propositions were unfavorably received, and Yellow Belly favored them with his sentiments in the following rather unpalatable and characteristic strain. No, said he, in answer to their representations, we make peace with you no more. You are dogs. You are women slayer. You are unworthy of the confidence or notice of our people. You lie when you come and say that you want peace. You have crooked and forked tongues. They are subtle like the tongue of the serpent. Your hearts are corrupt. They are offensive in our nostrils. We made peace with you before because we pitied you. We looked upon you with contempt as not even worthy to be killed by the sparrowhawks. We did not wish for your scalps. They disgrace our others. We never mix them even with those of the Blackfeet. When we are compelled to take them from you on account of your treachery, we give them to our pack dogs, and even they howl at them. Before we gave your horses to carry you home and guns to kill your buffalo, we gave you meat and drink. You ate and drank and smoked with us. After all this, you consider yourselves great braves in scalping two of our women. Our women would rub out your nation and and put out all your fires if we should let them loose at you. Come and steal our horses when you think best, and get caught at it if you want to feel the weight of our tomahawks. Go. We will not make peace with you. Go. After this very cordial reception, we had no more intercourse with Asnabones for some time. Shortly after the departure of this delegation, we set out for the fort to trade away our peltry, which amounted to a considerable number of packs. On arriving there, I found a letter from a Mr. Halsey, who then had charge of Fort Union, the headquarters of the American Fur Company. The letter was couched in rather strong terms and was evidently written when he was under the influence of temper. The company had their trading post among every tribe with which the Crows were at war, and for many months past there had been a great falling off in trade. The Indians had brought in but little peltry, and the universal complaint among all was that it took all their time to defend themselves against the Crows. The Crows had killed scores of their warriors.
the crows had stolen all their horses. The crows had captured their women and children. The crows had kept them mourning and crying. Their trappers dare not go out to trap for fear of the crows. Their hunters dare not and could not kill buffalo for fear of the crows. In short, by this letter it appeared that the poor crows were the constant terror of all the surrounding tribes. He concluded his epistle for dash sake. Do keep your D.D. Indians at home so that the other tribes may have a chance to work a little and the company may drive a more profitable business. I knew perfectly well that those incessant wars were very prejudicial to the company's interests, but it was impossible for me to remedy the evil. Other tribes were continually attacking the crows, killing their braves and stealing their horses, and, of course, they were bound to make reprisals. In justice to the crows, I must say that other tribes were generally the aggressors until the policy was forced upon me of endeavoring to conquer a peace. I thought if I could make the Crow Nation a terror to all their neighbors, that their antagonists would be reduced to petition for peace and then turn their battle axes into beaver traps and their lances into hunting knives. Our villagers, having made their purchase, left the fort but stayed in the vicinity, engaged in trapping and making robes. The letter I had just received from Halsey requested my attendance on him that spring. I left my people and went down the river to Fort Union. On arriving, I found a large body of the Asnabones and camped near the fort. Their chief immediately came to me, wishing me to conclude peace with them as representative of the Crow Nation. They attempted to palliate their late misdeeds by throwing the blame on a few Asnabones, desperados, who had acted without the authority of the cognizance of the National Council, and that they had been severely punished by the tribe for their excesses. In answer, I told them that I had no authority to conclude peace, that even if I had, they would not observe a peace longer than one moon, that I thought the crows would throw difficulties in the way of entertaining their propositions, but that they could apply to the council again and learn how they were inclined. Mr. Halsey and all the sub-traders presented interceded with me to exert myself in establishing a peace between the two nations, which request I promised to comply with. The chiefs inquired whether we would take their lives in the event of their visiting us on such a mission. I assured them that the crows would hold their lives sacred, that they were not dogs as many nations were, but that they were a great and magnanimous nation whose power was predominant and who killed no enemies but in battle. I remained at the fort about three weeks, and as most of the sub-traders, clerks, and interpreters were in, we had a glorious time. It was at least three or four years since I had last visited there, for though I fought a battle outside its walls lately, I did not see fit at this time to make them a call. The boats being ready to return, I started with them, but their progress was so slow and wearisome on their way up to the Yellowstone that I leaped ashore, intending to make my way over dry land. I have always rejoiced that I was prompted to take that step, for I became instrumental thereby in performing a merciful deed among so many that might be termed unmerciful. I had not traveled more than three miles when I came across a white man named Fuller in a famishing condition. I had a companion with me whom I started off to the boats to bid them prepare something suitable to recover the poor fellow and to order them to touch on shore when they came to where he lay. Fuller was quite delirious. I had discovered him just in the nick of time, as he could not have survived many hours longer. My companion was not long in performing his errand, and when the boat touched for him, we carried him on board and gave him tea and warm restoratives. He shortly revived and then gave me to understand in a very incoherent manner that he had four companions in similar condition near to where I had found him. 
At this intelligence, we went on shore again to succor them also. We had a long hunt before we succeeded in finding them, and when we at last discovered them, we found them picking and eating rosebuds, or rather the pods containing seed of last year's growth. When they saw us approaching, they attempted to run, supposing us to be Indians, but their strength failing them, they sought to conceal themselves in the bushes. We made known our errand to them and invited them on board the boat. Our opportune offer of service seemed so providential that the fortitude of the poor famished fellows could not sustain them, and they all gave way to a plentiful flood of tears. We conveyed them on board to the boat and furnished them with food adapted to their emaciated condition. When in some measure restored, they informed us that they had been trapping in the mountains their party originally consisted of 11 men, that they were on their road to Fort Cass with their pack horses and four packs of beaver when they were set upon by the Blackfeet who killed six of their party and despoiled them of every article they had. And it was by a miracle that they escaped from their hands. When they had supposed themselves near the fort, they saw a great number of Indians whom they took for Blackfeet to avoid them, they took a wide circuit through the prairie. The Indians whom they mistook for Blackfeet were a party of crows, and if they had gone up to them and made their cats known, the crows would have escorted them to the fort and probably have pursued the Blackfeet and have retaken their property. On returning from their circuit, they struck the river a great distance below the fort and were still traveling down the river in search of it. They had nothing to eat, and nothing to kill game with to relieve their wants. They went on with the boats, while I and my companion resumed our overland route. We reached the fort seven days in advance of the boats. I only rested one night there, and then proceeded directly on to my Indian home. Shortly after my arrival there, the villagers moved on up the river, proceeding leisurely and killing buffalo and dressing robes on the way. We finally reached the mountain streams, and, as it was now clear, September, the beaver were getting to be in fine condition for trapping. We had at this time a visit from 800 lodges of the snakes who came for the purpose of trading, as they had no trading post of their own. They remained with us several weeks, and we had a very agreeable time together. This furnished me with an opportunity of enlarging to the crows upon the superior delights of peace. We could visit the lodges of our snake friends, and they could visit ours without cutting each other's throats. Our women could chatter together, our children gamble and have their sham battles together, while the old veterans could talk over their achievements and smile at the mimic war hopes of their children. They could also trade together and derive mutual benefit from the fair exchange of the commodities. I contrasted this with the incessant butcheries that distinguished their intercourse with some tribes and asked them which relation was the more desirable. The crows had many things to trade away which they had no need for, or... If they had needed them, they could replace them with a fresh supply from the fort. The nation was desirous that their guests should see the trading post, where all their goods were stored beyond the reach of their enemies, and whence they drew their supplies, as often as they need of them. For the simple crows supposed that the posts, with their contents, were the property of the nation, and that the whites who were in charge there were their own agents. To gratify their natural pride, I led a party to the fort, among whom were 200 of our snake visitors. On entering the fort and looking over the storehouse, they were struck dumb with astonishment. They could never comprehend the vastness of the wealth that was displayed before them. They had never before seen a depot of goods, and this exceeded all they had any previous experience of. The rows of guns highly polished, the battle axes, lance blades, scarlet cloth, beads, 
and many of the curiosities that had never seen before filled them with admir admiration that could not gaze sufficiently at these indications of our wealth. They inquired of the crows whether our nation made all these articles there. They told them that they did not, that they were made at our great fort below, in comparison with which this was but a small lodge that all our supplies were manufactured there and brought up the river in great boats by our white friends. They then inquired by what means they had gained the alliance of the whites, that instead of killing them and banishing them from their hunting grounds as they did to many nations, they should give themselves the great trouble to serve them with their boats and bring them such immense supplies. The crows informed them that their great chief, the medicine calf, had been instrumental in accomplishing all this. By his long residence with the whites, after his sale to them by the Cheyennes, when he had become a great brave, he had gained surprising influence with the great white chief who loved the medicine calf, and had taught him to make forts, and had suffered him to come back to his people in order to teach them to become great and overcome all their enemies. The snakes were wonder-stricken at such marvels. The unassailable fort, which a single bombshell would have blown to atoms, filled with an inexhaustible store of rich goods. Our great fort down the river, in comparison with which this was but a small lodge, and where all these marvelous products of our ingenuity were manufactured. Our mysterious connection with the whites which procured us advantage of their unremunerated services and shielded us with the irresistible succor of the great white chief. All this overpowered their imagination. The wealth and power of the Crow nations ex exceeded all conception, and to oppose them in war was to incur unavoidable destruction. After the snakes had traded off their stock of peltry, Obtaining large supplies in exchange, we returned to the village. They had wonderful narratives of the big fort and the wealth of the crow nation to spin to their fellow villages. In fact, they were so impressed with the idea of our superiority that 200 lodges of the snakes joined our nation and never separated from them. They had a chief of their own, but conformed to our laws and regulations, proving themselves faithful fellow citizens and emulating our best warriors in battle. This coalition increased our force to the number of 500 warriors, more than we had lost in battle for four years preceding. They intermarried with our women and in a few years were so completely transformed that they had quite forgotten their snake origin. On our return, the remainder of friends left us. During our absence, the Blackfeet had invaded our dominion and made off with upward of 3,000 of our horses, very greatly to our detriment. The snakes were anxious to pursue them, or at least to assist their hosts in recapturing their stolen property, but Longhead declined their pro-offered service. He said, no, I am too old to run after them, and the warriors must have someone to direct them. Should any accident befall my people, the medicine chief would be grieved. We must wait his return from the fort. If he then deems it proper to punish them, he will not be long without the means. Our villages still remained together, and we moved on to the headwaters of the Yellowstone. We had several war parties out, and some endeavoring to retrieve our equine losses while those who remained in the village applied themselves to trapping and hunting. The snake women were very skillful in dressing wolves, far superior to our own, as they had been more engaged in it. My warriors were again burning with the desire for war and horse raids, although our prairies were alive with animals. Inaction seemed to consume them. In spite of my prohibition, they would steal away in parties during the night. When convicted, I would inflict severe floggings upon them by my dog soldiers, who did not spare the lash. But it was to little purpose. 
In fact, they took it as an honorable distinction to receive a lashing, inasmuch as it indicated their overriding ardor for the war, and the culprit who received a flogging this morning for disobedience of orders was sure to be off at night again. An old warrior despises the sight of a trap. Hunting buffalo even does not afford him excitement enough. Nothing but war or a horse raid is a business worth their attending to. And the chief who seeks to control this predilection too far loses popularity. Accordingly, I gave way to the general desire of my warriors. I selected 160 trusty braves, intending to lay alongside my old friends, the Blackfeet, and wipe out one or two old scores I had marked against them. I invaded their territory with my little force and marched on, admonishing my spies to extreme vigilance. We came in sight of a village and secreted ourselves till the proper hour of night. On our march, we discovered a single Indian. Some of the party called him to them and clubbed him down and scalped him. He had mistaken us for his own people. At midnight, we visited their herd and drove out 640 head. A number of their best cattle were tied at the doors of their lodges and in their corrals. I arrived home safe with my booty, and as I had taken one scalp, we had a great dance. All our other parties were very successful, excepting one. That was the one that had gone on an expedition against the Arapahoes. Pine Leaf was in that number. They had taken about a thousand horses, and having reached the distance that they supposed safe, they slackened their pace and were proceeding carelessly along. Suddenly their pursuers came in sight, a strong posse comatus, and retook all their animals except those that bore the fugitives and killed three of their comrades. The heroine came back in the morning, looking like the last of her race. One of our victorious parties brought back fifty boys and girls whom they had captured while gathering fruit. Since the loss of our three thousand horses to the Blackfeet, we had captured 6,000, 2,500 of which had been recovered from the Blackfeet. We now moved on to the Yellowstone and crossed it. The villages still keeping together, we then journeyed on slowly in the direction of the fort, trapping and hunting all the way. We kept a vigilant eye upon our prisoners for fear that they might attempt an escape to their own tribes, and thus bring upon us a foe when we had no time to attend to him. This was a very productive fall for peltry, and we sent in great quantities to the fort in advance of our arrival. I remained at the trading post nearly the whole of, of the winter. In the early spring, the crows sent for me to rejoin them. I went accordingly, and found that their long-continued good fortune had suffered a reverse. They had grown careless in their expedition and had lost some of their warriors. They wished my aid to revenge their death and wash their faces. I required them to defer their retaliation until their robes were dressed and sent to the fort. They took hold of the business in good earnest, and every robe was soon ready for market. It was now time to plant our tobacco, and we all moved in the direction of our planting ground. The seed was put in, and the attending ceremonial gone through with. Our Pacific business thus completed, the warriors began to prepare for war. Our horses had been but little used during the winter, and they were all fat and in high condition. I took 360 warriors and went against the Cheyennes. We discovered a moving village of 60 lodges, charged on it, and bore away nine scalps with considerable booty, without losing one drop of blood. Pine Leaf was in my party, and being so unfortunate and not to count one coup, she was greatly out of humor and blamed me for depriving her of the opportunity of killing an enemy. The truth is, we had no time to favor her, as I was desirous to secure our booty and get off without endangering the loss of a man. 
Her young Blackfoot prisoner had become quite a warrior. He went to war constantly and bid fair to equal his, his captor in valor. He was already a match for an ordinary Sioux warrior and took great pride in his sister pine leaf. All our war parties returned without loss, and the nation resumed its customary good spirits. I then returned to the fort where I rested all the summer. My thoughts had for a long time past reverted to home. Year after year had rolled away, and now that I had attained middle life, they seemed to pass me with accelerated pace, and the question would intrude upon my mind. What had I done? When I abandoned myself seriously to reflection, it seemed as if I had slumbered away the last twelve years. Others had accomplished the same toils as myself, and were now enjoying the fruits of their labor, and living in luxury and ease. But what had been my career? and what advance had I made towards this desirable consummation. I had just visited the Indian Territory to gratify a youthful, a youthful thirst for adventure. I had narrowly escaped starvation in a service in which I had no interest. I had traversed the fastness of the far Rocky Mountains in summer heats and winter frosts. I had encountered savage beasts and wild men until my deliverance was a prevailing miracle. By the mere badinage of a fellow trapper, I had been adopted among the savages and had conformed my superior habits to their ruthless and untutored way. I had accompanied them in their mutual slaughters and dyed my hand crimson with the blood of victims who had never injured me. I had distinguished myself in my barbarian seclusion, and had risen to supreme command in the nation I had devoted myself to, and what had I to show for so much wasted energy and such a catalog of ruthless deeds? I had been the means of saving many a fellow creature's life. Did they still owe me gratitude? Possibly some few did, while others had forgotten my name. In good truth, when I sought the results of my prolonged labors, I found I had simply wasted my time. I had bestowed years upon others and only moments upon myself. However, I still lived, and there was yet time to take more heed unto my ways. I resolved to go home and see my friends, deliver myself from this present vagabond life. The attachments I had formed during my savage chieftainship still retained some hold upon my affections, and it was barely possible I might return to them and end my days among my trusty braves. There, at least, was fidelity, and when my soul should depart for the spirit land, their rude faith would prompt them to paint my bones and treasure them until I should visit them from my ever-flowering hunting grounds and demand them at their hands." Such sober thoughts as these occupied my mind during my summer residence at the fort. I had brought with me all the peltry we had accumulated in order to be in season for the boats which were soon to start for the lower fort. I had directed the village to follow along with whatever peltry they may have collected before the departure of the boats. In obedience to this instruction, about 250 warriors came down bringing their commodities with them, but the boats had gone, and I still was waiting at the fort. One day a party of my men were out to hunt buffalo for our own use when they accidentally scared up eleven Blackfeet who were lurking about on the lookout for horses. They chased them into our old camping grounds, and the fugitives had taken refuge in our old temporary fort. I was sitting at the fort the while, busily conversing with persons present. I heard the report of their guns, and supposed if the affair proved serious, I should promptly be sent for. Bad hand, one of my leaders finally said, They are fighting out yonder, and I don't suppose they can do anything without we are with them. Let us go. We each threw on a chief's coat and went down to see how matters stood. I found the Blackfeet fortified in their position, 
and our men ineffectually firing upon them. I ordered an immediate assault, placing myself at their head. We advanced a few paces at a rapid rate, when I fell senseless with the blood gushing from my mouth in a stream. All supposed me mortally wounded, and I was carried in the fort to breathe my last. The boats had left, and Tullock happened to be starting after them just as I was carried in. Seeing my wounded condition, and everyone pronouncing me in a dying state, he reported me as being dead at the lower fort, whence the news traveled to my friends in St. Louis that I had been killed in a fight with the Indians. In an hour or two it was discovered that there was still life in me and that I was reviving. I was examined, there were no bullet wounds on my body, and again it was proved that my broad-bladed hunting knife, though not the same one, had averted the blow. It had been struck with an ounce of lead impelled with the full force of gunpowder. I speedily recovered, but continued sore for a long time. Every Blackfoot was killed by my men, who scaled their defense and leaped upon them in such numbers that they almost smothered them. Only four of my warriors were wounded. Intelligence of my injury was sent to the village, which was three weeks in reaching them. One thousand warriors instantly set out for the fort. All my wives accompanied them, but I had recovered before their arrival. Our party had scarcely encamped outside the fort when the Blackfeet, who were always haunting us, stole about 800 head of horses. On discovering the theft, a large party started on their trail up the river. The depredators would have to cross the river to get home, and there was no crossing for horses nearer than 15 miles, after which they had to go on to the Mussel Shell, a distance of 20 miles further, and only 10 from the fort. I knew that this would be the route of the fugitives because it was their regular beat. I had had no thought of going until at suddenly occurred to me that the party in pursuit would most likely fail to overtake the thieves, while I had so admirable an opportunity to catch them on the muscle cell. I took a party, therefore, forded the river near the fort, and went on straight to the muscle shell, where I posted my men. Our unsuspecting victims came up, singing in great merriment, and driving our horses before them all of which were jaded. I suffered them to approach close upon us, and then gave the word to charge. Never was a party taken more by surprise. They were too dumbfounded to offer resistance, and all we had to do was to chop them down. We had their twenty-four scalps in a little more than the same number of seconds. When the other party came up and found the work done, they thought we had been rained down then. They knew they had left us at the fort, and we had not passed them on the way, and where did we come from? Pine Leaf was with the party, and she was ready to blow me off my horse. It was unfair to take the job out of their hands, after they had almost run their horses off their legs in the chase. I expressed my regret at the fortunate turn affairs had taken, and promised never to offend in the same manner again but it was a long while before I could banter her into a good humor. I remained at the fort all the summer, as before stated, intending to go down the river on my way to St. Louis with the last boat in the fall. While idling there, I found the five men whom I had rescued from starvation in a penniless condition and unable to go to work again. It seemed the company had had issued orders to their agents to furnish no more outfits to free trappers on their personal credit, as the risk was too great, from their extreme liability to be killed by Indians. To engage to work for the company at the same price they were paying hands was only perpetuating their poverty, for they were running the same risk of their lives as of trapping for themselves, and their remuneration was but one to ten. They were downhearted and knew not what to do. Considering their sad condition, I determined to befriend them 
and risk the chances. I therefore offer to give them an excellent outfit and direct them to the best beaver ground in the Crow Nation, where they would be protected from all harm by my Crow warriors as my friends, my interest to be one half of the proceeds. This offer was cheerfully accepted by the five men, and they were highly elated at the prospect. I then acquainted the Crows that those men were my friends, that they were the remains of a party of eleven, of whom six had been killed by the Blackfeet, who had despoiled them of everything they had, and that I had found these in the prairies almost famished to death. I had engaged them to stay in the nation and trap for me, and I wished my faithful Crow braves to protect them in their pursuit, and suffer none to offer them molestation. This they all readily promised to do, and were even pleased with the trust, for it was a belief with the Crows that the beavers in their streams were too numerous ever to be diminished. My bosom friend offered to remain with them to show them the best streams and render them all the assistance in his power. He was a most valuable auxiliary, as his skill in trapping I never saw excelled. They went to work and met with extraordinary success. My share of their labors of less than three months amounted to five thousand dollars. End of chapter 26「27 The Life and Adventure of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner」「This LibriVox recording is in the public domain」Recording by Gary Ullman Chapter 27 Departure for St. Louis Visit Fort Union Fort Clark Descend to the Arikara Country Am Taken Prisoner Extraordinary Means of Release Reach St. Louis, scarcely recognize my sisters, changes, estrangement of friends, sigh for my Indian home. The Sparrowhawk Nation was all assembled at the fort to take leave of the medicine calf for several moons. The boats had arrived filled with a fresh stock of goods, and the nation made purchases to the amount of many thousands of dollars, the boats being now ready to return again. I made a short address to my people before I bade them adieu. Sparrowhawks, I said, I am going to leave you for a few moons to visit my friends among the white men. I shall return to you by green grass when the boats come back from the country of the whites. While I am away, I desire you to remember the counsel I have often given you. I wish you to send out no war parties because you want for nothing and your nation is feared by all the neighboring tribes. Keep a good lookout over your horses so as to afford the enemy no opportunity of stealing them. It is through carelessness in the horse guards that half the horses are lost and it is the loss of horses that leads to half the battles that you fight. It is better not to have your horses stolen in the first place than to steal more in the place of those you have lost. I also commend Mr. Tullock to your care, as well as all the inmates of the fort. Visit them often. See that they are not besieged or starved out by their enemies. Do not let or any other bad Indians harm them. Behave yourselves and become my faithful crows. Adieu. They all promised obedience to my instruction, and I was soon on board. The boats were cast loose, and we were borne rapidly downstream by the swift current of the Yellowstone. We called at Fort Union, and I stayed there three days. Here I had a fine canoe built, and two oarsmen furnished me to carry me to St. Louis. I was bearer of a large packet of letters, and when my little craft was finished, I stepped on board and launched out upon the swift rolling current of the Missouri. After the brilliant opportunities I had had of realizing a princely fortune, my only wealth consisted of an order upon the company for $7,800. Arriving at Fort Clark, we made another short stay. The Arikaras, whose country was some 150 miles further down, had just stolen nearly all the horses belonging to the fort. Belmere 
the interpreter of the fort, proposed to me to go after them and see if we could recover some of the horses. I consented, and we went down to their village in my canoe, and on our arrival there found them all dancing. Antonio Garro, with two relatives, were in the number. On seeing our approach, one shouted, Here comes white men, and Garro and his brother instantly sprang towards us, pushed us into a lodge, where we were apparently prisoners. A council was summoned to decide upon our fate, and I had but slight hopes of ever seeing St. Louis. A young Indian came at that moment, and mentioned in a whisper to Peter that there was a large boat approaching. He made a long harangue before the others, in which he earnestly and energetically declaimed against taking the lives of white men. He concluded his oration by saying, You have now my opinion, and remember, if you decide upon taking these white men's lives, I stay with you no longer. He then left the council and went down to the boat, where he advised the occupants to cross to the other side of the river, as the Indians were at that moment deliberating upon the fate of Belmere and three others. Garrow's father happened to be on board, who was a great man among the Indians, and on learning what business was in hand, he provided himself with a club and entered the village with his son Peter. He then set about the council and administrated to all the members such a hearty thrashing, laying about him as if fighting wild bulls, that I thought he must surely slay some of them. There, exclaimed the old man, after having belabored them till he was out of breath, I'll teach you to deliberate on the lives of white men, dogs as ye are. The Indians offered no resistance and said not a word. We remained all night with old Garrow's company and returned to the fort in the morning. Belbia recovered his own horse but could obtain none belonging to the fort. We called at all the forts that lay in our way to collect what dispatches they had to send, making but brief stay. However, as I was impatient to be getting on, at Fort Keneal I obtained a passenger a son of Mr. Pappin, who was going to St. Louis, and I received reiterated charges to be very careful of him. Soon after our departure from the fort, there came on a cold rainstorm, which lasted several hours. The storm raged fiercely, and we had to make fast to a snag in the middle of the river to save ourselves from driving ashore. I had my Indian fire striker, and amid all the wind and rain, I repeatedly lit my pipe. My young passenger was astonished at the performance. If you could strike a fire, he exclaimed, in such a storm as this, I do not fear perishing. When the storm had somewhat abated, we landed to encamp. I shot two fat wild turkeys, which were quite a rarity to me, after having lived so many years on buffalo meat there being no turkeys in the Crow country. On arriving at Jefferson City, I felt quite sick, showed symptoms of fever, but I was anxious to reach home without laying up. A steamboat coming down the river, I went on board, canoe and all, and was soon landed on the dock of St. Louis. It was fourteen years since I had last seen the city, and what a difference was observable in those years but I was too sick to take much notice of things, and hastened to my sister's house, accompanied by the carpenter of the boat. He rapped. The door was opened by my younger sister. I was supporting myself against the wall. Greetings passed between them, for my companion was acquainted with my family, and he then informed her that he was the bearer of sad news. Her brother James was dead. My sister Louise began to cry and informed him that they had learned the news some weeks since. Then turning to me, he said, Come in, Jim, and see your sister cry for you. I advanced and addressed her in my old familiar manner. How do you do, Lou? I must have been a curious-looking object for an affectionate sister to recognize. All my clothing consisted of dressed antelope deer and the skins of mountain sheep highly ornamented by my Indian wives. My long hair is black as the raven's wing, 
descended to my hips, and I presented more the appearance of a crow than that of a civilized being. She gazed at me for a moment with a searching look, and then exclaiming, My God, is it my brother? She flew into my arms and was for some time unable to speak. At length, she said, We received a letter informing us of your death, and that Mr. Tullock had seen you born into Fort Cass dead. My eldest sister, Matilda, went upstairs entertaining a few female friends, and Lou bounded up stairs to acquaint her that her brother James wished to speak to her. Thinking her to be jesting, she said, Are you not ashamed of yourself to jest on such a subject? And she shed tears at thus having me recalled to remembrance. Louise asserted her earnestness, and Matilda reproved her for her wantonness, but would not budge to go and see for herself. At length, a Mrs. Leferrier said, Matilda, I believe she is in earnest, and if you do not go and see, I will. She had been a child with me, and we used to repeat our catechisms together. Now she was married and a mother of several children. She came tripping down the stairs into my sister's apartment, making a ceremonious courtesy as she entered. My sister introduced her to me, asking me if I did not recollect my commere, for we were baptized together. I had forgotten her, but the mention of this circumstance recalled her to my mind, and there was another embracing. Her faith being thus confirmed, my sister Matilda was called down, and my reception from her was even more cordial than from the preceding friends. She was a woman of great warmth of feeling, and her heart was full to overflowing with the emotions my name had called up. She was the eldest of the family, and since her mother's death she had been at once mother and sister to us all. Although I was the vagrant of the family, I still lived in her sisterly heart, and the supposition that my earthly career was closed and only hallowed my memory in her affections. This was my second reception by my relatives after I had been supposed dead. One by my savage friends, who, in welcoming me as their long-lost child, exhibited all the genuine emotions of untutored nature, and this second by my civilized friends, who, if less energetic in their demonstrations of attachment, showed equal heartfelt joy, equal sincerity, and far superior decorum. The following morning I visited the company's office and delivered my letters. I became too weak to walk home, and Mr. Shotto very obligingly drove me back in his carriage. I was compelled to take to my bed, where I was confined for several days, under good medical attendance, and most assiduously attended by my relatives. Their answers to my many inquiries confounded me entirely. Where is my father? He went back to Virginia and died there many years ago. Where are my brothers? They are scattered across the country. Where is such and such a friend? In his grave. Where is Eliza? She was married a month ago after re receiving intelligence of your certain death. I ceased by querying and averted my eyes from my sister's gaze. And this, I mused, is my return home after years of bright anticipations of welcome. This is my secure and sunshiny haven. After so long and dangerous a voyage, my father dead, my brothers dispersed, my friends in their graves, and my loved one married. She did well. I have no right to complain. She is lost to me forever. If a man's home exists in the heart of his friends, with the death and alienation of those friends, his cherished home fades away, and he is again a wanderer upon the earth. I do not know whether it was disappointment at so much death, mutation, and estrangement, or whether I bore the disease immediately in my own heart. But I was disappointed in my return home. The anticipations I had formed were not realized. A feeling of cynicism passed over me. I thought of my Indian home and of the unsophisticated hearts I had left behind. Their lives 
were savage, and their perpetual animosities repulsive. But with this dark background, there was much vivid coloring in relief. If the Indian was unrelenting and murdered with his lance, his battle axe, and his knife, his white brother was equally unfailing and had ways of torturing his victim. If less violent, not the less certain. The savage is artless, and when you win his admiration, there is no envious reservation to prompt him to do injustice to your name. You live among them honored, and on your death your bones are stored religiously in their great cave along with others of preceding generations, to be each year visited and painted and reflected on by a host of devoted companions. There is not the elegance there, the luxury, the refined breeding, but there is rude plenty. Prairie studded with horses and room to wander without any man to call your steps in question. My child was there and his mother, whom I loved, a return there was in no way unnatural. I had acquired their habits and was in some manner useful to them. I had no tie to hold me here, and I already almost determined upon returning to my Indian home. Such thoughts as these, as I lay on my sick bed, passed continuously through my mind. A few of my early friends, as they heard of my return, came one after the other to visit me, but they were all changed. The flight of time has wrought furrows upon their smooth brows, and the shadow of the wings of time was resting upon the few fair cheeks I had known in my younger days. End of chapter 27《Chapter Twenty Eight of the Life and Adventure of James B. Beckwith by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter Twenty Eight: Disagreeable Re-Encounters in St. Louis. Messages arrive from Fort Cass. Imminent peril of the whites from the infuriated crows. The cause. Immediate return. Incidents of my arrival. Pine leaf substitute for Eliza. Last battle with the Blackfeet. Final adieu to the Crows. It now comes in the order of relation to describe two or three unpleasant re-encounters I had with various parties in St. Louis, growing out of the misunderstanding already related between the Crows and Mr. Fitzpatrick's party. I had already heard reports in the mountains detrimental to my character for my supposed action in the matter, but I had never paid much attention to them. Friends had cautioned me that there were large sums of money offered for my life and that several men had even undertaken to earn the rewards. I could not credit such friendly intimations, still I thought, on the principle that there is never smoke, but there is fire. But that it would be as well to keep myself a little on my guard. I had recovered from my sickness, and I spent much of my time about town. My friends repeatedly inquired of me if I had seen Fitzpatrick, wondering how so much interest could attach to my meeting with this man. I asked one day what reason there was for making the inquiry. My friend answers, I don't wish you to adduce me as authority, but there are strong threats of taking your life for an alleged robbery of Fitzpatrick by the Crow Nation in which you were deeply concerned. I saw now what to prepare for, although I still inclined to doubt that any man possessed of ordinary perceptions could, could charge me with an offense of which I was so manifestly innocent. True, I had met Fitzpatrick several times, and instead of his former cordial salutation, it was with difficulty he addressed a civil word to me. Shortly after this conversation with my friend, I went to the St. Louis Theater. Between the pieces, I had stepped to the saloon to obtain some refreshment, and I saw Fitzpatrick enter with four other not very respectable citizens. They advanced directly towards me. Fitzpatrick then pointed me out to them, saying, 
There's the crow. Then, said the others, we are black faced. Let us have his scalp. They immediately drew their knives and rushed on me. I then thought of my friend's sanitary counsel to be on guard, but I had no weapon about me. With the agility of a cat, I sprung over the counter and commenced passing tumblers faster than they had been in the habit of receiving them. I had felled one or two of my assailants, and I saw I was in for a serious disturbance. A friend, and he is still living in St. Louis, wealthy and influential, stepped behind the bar and, slapping me on the shoulder, said, Look out, Bedford. You will hurt some of your friends. I replied that my friends did not appear to be very numerous just then. You have friends present, he added, and passing an enormous bowie knife into my hand, stepped out again. Now I was all right, and felt myself a match for the five ruffians. My practice with the battle axe, in a case where the quickness of thought required a corresponding rapidity of action, then came into play. I made a sortie from my position on to the open floor and challenged the five bullies to come on at the same time, which in my excited state was natural enough, calling them by the hardest names. My mind was fully made up to kill them if they had only come at me. My arm was nervous, and my friends who knew me at this time can tell whether I was quick lotioned or not. I had been in situations where I had to ply my battle axe with rapidity and precision to redeem my own skull. I was still in full possession of my belligerent powers and had the feeling of justice to sustain me. I stood at bay with my large bowing knife drawn, momentarily hesitating whether to give the crow war hoop or not. When Sheriff Busby laid hands on me and quested me to be quiet, Although boiling with rage, I respected the officer's presence, and the assassins marched off to the body of the theater. I followed them to the door and defied them to descend to the street with me. But the sheriff, becoming angry and threatening me with the caliber, I straightway left the theater. I stood upon the steps, and a friend coming up, I borrowed a well-loaded pistol of him, and moved slowly away, thinking that five would surely never allow themselves to be cowed by one man. Shortly after, I perceived the whole party approaching, and stepping back on the sidewalk, in front of the high wall, I waited their coming up. On they came, swaggering along, assuming the appearance of intoxication, and talking with drunken incoherency. When they had approached near enough to suit me, I ordered them to halt and crossed over to the other side of the street. Who are you? inquired one of them. I am he whom you are after, Jim Beckworth. And if you advance one step further, I will blow the tops of your heads off. You are drunk, aren't you? said one of the party. No, I am not drunk, I replied. I never drink anything to make a dog of me like yourselves. I stood during this short colloquy in the middle of the sidewalk with my pistol already cocked in one hand and my huge bowie knife in the other. One step forward would have been fatal to any one of them. Oh, he's drunk, said one. Let's cross over to the other side. And all five actually did pass over, which, if any of them is still living and has any regard for the truth, he must admit to this day. I then proceeded home. My sister had been informed of the re-encounter, and on my return home I found her frightened almost to death. For Forsyth, one of the party, had long been the terror of St. Louis, having badly maimed many men, and the information that he was after me led her to the conclusion that I would surely be killed. A few days after I met two of the party, Forsyth and Kinney, when Fort Sint accosted me, your name is Beckworth, I believe, I answered. That is my name. I understand that you have been circulating a report that I attempted to assassinate you. I have told that you and your gang have been endeavoring to murder me, I replied, and I repeated here. I will teach you to repeat such tales about me, he said fiercely, and drew his knife, which he called 
his Arkansas toothpick from his pocket. The knife I had provided myself with against any emergency was too large to carry about me conveniently, so I carried it at my back, having the handle within reach of my finger and thumb. Seeing his motion, I whipped it out in a second. Now, said I, you miserable ruffian, you miserable ruffian, draw your knife and come on. I will not leave a piece of you big enough to choke a dog. Come, interposed Kinney. Let us not make blackguards of ourselves. Let us be going. And they actually did pass on without drawing a weapon. I was much pleased that this happened in a public part of the city and in open day. For the bully, whom it was believed the law could not humble, was visibly cowed, and in the presence of a large concourse of men. I had no more trouble from the party afterwards. In connection with this affair, it is but justice to myself to mention that, when Captain Sublet, Fitzpatrick, and myself happened to meet in the office of Mr. Choctaw, Captain Sublet interrogated Fitzpatrick upon the cause of his hostility towards me, and represented to him at length the open absurdity of his trumping up a charge of robbery of his party in the mountains against me. Being thus pressed, Fitzpatrick used the following words, I never believe the truth of the charge myself, but when I am in the company of sundry persons, they try to persuade me into the belief of it in order to raise trouble. I repeat, it is not my belief at this present moment, and I will not be persuaded into believing it again. Then, turning to me, he said, Beckworth, I have done you a great injustice by even by ever harboring such a thought. I acknowledge it freely. I ask your forgiveness for the same. Let us be as we formerly were, friends, and think no more about it. Friends, we therefore mutually pledged ourselves, and friends, we have since remained up to this day. While in town, I called on General Ashley, but he happened to be away from home. I was about leaving the house when a melodious voice invited me in to wait the general's return. My husband will soon be back, the lady said, and will doubtless be pleased to see you. I turned and really thought I was looking on an angel's face. She moved toward me with such grace and uttered such dulcet and harmonious sounds that I was riveted to the spot. It was the first time I had seen the lady of General Ashley. I accepted her invitation and was shown into a neat little parlor, the lady taking a seat at the window to act as my entertainer until the return of the general. If I mistake not, she said, you are a mountaineer. I put on all the airs possible and replied, yes, madam, I was with General Ashley when he first went into the mountains. Her grace and affability so charmed me that I could not fix my ideas upon all the remarks she addressed to me. I was conscious. I was not showing myself off to advantage, and she kept me saying, Yes, madam, and no, madam, without any correct understanding of the appropriateness, until she espied the general approaching. Here comes the general, lady said. I knew he would not be long away. Shortly the general entered the lodge and fixed his eye upon me in an instant, at the same time whipping his pantaloons playfully with his riding whip. Rising from a better chair than the whole crow nation possessed, I said without ceremony, How do you do, general? Gracious heavens, is this you, Beckworth? And he seized my hand with the grip of a vice, and nearly shook off my scalp while his lady laughed heartily at the rough salutation of two old mountaineers. My dear, said the general, let me introduce you to Mr. Beckworth, of whom you have heard me so often make mention. This is the man that saved my life on three different occasions in the Rocky Mountains. Had it not been for our visitor, you would not have been Mrs. Ashley at this moment. But you look sickly, James. What is the matter? I replied, I had been confined to my bed since my arrival in St. Louis. We had a long conversation about the mountains and my residence with the Crow Nation. I was very hospitably entertained by my former commander and his amiable lady, 
and when I left, the promise was extorted from me to make a repeated call upon them so long as I remained in the city. About the latter end of March, a courier arrived from Fort Cass, bringing tidings of a most alarming character. He had come along through all that vast extent of Indian territory without being molested. It seemed as though a special providence had shielded him. He found me in a theater and gave me a hasty rehearsal of the business. It seems that a party of trappers who had heard of my departure for St. Louis having fallen in with a number of crows, had practiced upon them in regard to me. Your great chief has gone to the white nation, said the trapper spokesman. Yes, he has gone to see his friend, the great white chief, and you will never see him again. Yes, he will come back in the season of green grass. No, the great white chief has killed him. Killed him? Yes. What had he done that he should kill him? He was angry because he left the whites and came to live with the Indians because he fought for them. It is the greatest wonder in the world that every one of the trapper party did not lose their scalps on the spot. If the Indians had any prominent leader among them, they infallibly would have been all killed and have paid the penalty of their mischievous lying. Unfortunate for the crows, they believed all the words of a white man thinking his tongue is always straight. These trappers, by their idle invention, had jeopardized the lives of all the white men in the mountains. The Indians said no more, but dashed off to the village and carried the news of my death. How do you know that he is dead? they inquired. Because the whites told us so, and their tongues are not forked. The great white chief was angry because he stayed with our people, and he killed them. A council was immediately held to decide upon measures of vengeance. It was determined to proceed to the fort and kill every white man there and divide all the goods, guns, and ammunition among themselves, then to send out parties in every direction to make a general massacre of every white man. Innumerable fingers were cut off, and hair without measure in mourning for me. A costly sacrifice was then made to the great spirit, and the nation next set out about carrying out their plan of vengeance. The village moved towards the fort. Many were opposed to being too hasty, but all agreed that their decision should be acted upon. The night before reached the fort, four women ran on in advance of the village to acquaint Mr. Tullock of the sanguinary intention of the crows. Every precaution was taken to withstand them. Every gun was loaded. The village arrived, and contrary to all precedent, the gates of the fort were closed. The savages were infuriated. The whites had heard of the death of Medicine Calf and had closed the gates to prevent the anticipated vengeance. The inmates of the fort were in imminent peril. Horror was visible on their countenances. They might hold their positions for a while, but an investment by from ten to fifteen thousand savages must reduce it eventually. Tullock was seated on the fort in great perplexity. Many of the veteran Crow warriors were pacing to and fro outside the enclosure. Yellow Belly was provisional head chief during my absence. Tullock called him to him. He rode up and inquired, What is the matter? Why are your gates shut against us? I had a dream last night, replied Tullock, and my medicine told me I had to fight my own people today. Yes, your bird told you truth. He did not lie. Your chief has killed the medicine calf, and we are going to kill you all. But the medicine calf is not dead. He will certainly come back again. Yes, he is dead. The whites told us so, and they never lie. You need not try to escape by saying he is not dead, for we will not believe your words. You cannot escape us. You can neither dig into the ground nor fly into the air. If you attempt to run... I will put 5,000 warriors upon your trail and follow you to the white chief. Even there you shall not escape us. We have loved the whites, but we now hate them, and we are all angry. You have but little meat in the fort, and I know it. When that is gone, you die. My son, little Jim, was standing near the fort, and Mr. Tully called him to him. The child's answer was, Away, you smell bloody. 
Mr. Tulloch, however, induced him to approach and said, Black Panther, I have always loved your father and you and all the warriors. Have I ever told you a lie? No. They have told you that your father is dead, but they have lied. He lives and will come back to you the white chief has not killed him my words are true do you believe your friend and the friend of your father yes i love my father he is a great chief when he is here i feel happy i feel strong but if he is dead i shall never feel happy any more my mother has cried four sons for him and tells me i shall see him no more which makes me cry your father should come back my son if you will listen to what i now say to you i will listen go then, and ask Yellow Blally to grant me time to send for your father to the country of the white men. And if he is not there by the time the cherries shall have turned red, I will then lay down my head, and you may cut it off, and the warriors may kill us all, for we will not fight against them. Go and tell the chief that he must grant what I have told you for the sake, what I have told you for your sake, and if he does not listen to you, you will never see your father any more. Go. The child accordingly went to Yellow Belly and begged him to grant one request. The chief, supposing that he was about to request permission to kill a particular man at the fort, said, Certainly, my son, any request you make shall be granted. Speak, what is it? The child then informed Yellow Belly what the crane had said, and he would have his father back by the time the cherries turned red, or that he would suffer his head to be cut off and deliver up his whites to the crows, and would not fight. It shall be so, my son, Yellow Belly assented. Go and tell the crane to send for your father, for not a warrior shall follow the trail of the white runner, even look upon it. If he does as he says, the whites shall all live. If he fails, they shall all die. Now go and harangue the people, and tell all the warriors that the crane is going to send for your father, and the warrior who follows the runner's trail shall die. Yellow Belly has said it. He mounted a horse and did as the chief had directed. Joseph Pappin volunteered to deliver the message to me. It was encountering a fearful hazard. His inducement was a bonus of $1,000. The morning following the receipt of this intelligence, I saw Mr. Chowchow, who was in receipt of a letter from Mr. Tulloch, by the same messenger. He was in great uneasiness of mind. There was over $100,000 worth of goods in the fort, and he urged me to start without delay. The distance from St. Louis was estimated at 2,750 miles, and the safety of the men rendered the greatest expedition necessary. Any sum I might ask would be willingly paid me. Go, said he, engage as many men as you wish, purchase all the horses you require, we will pay the bills. He also furnished me with instructions to all the ages on the way to provide me with whatever I inquired for. The price I demanded for my services was $5,000, which was, without scruple, allowed me. I hired two men to accompany me, Pappin being one to whom I gave fifteen hundred and one thousand dollars respectively, our horses being procured and every necessary supplied us. Away we started upon our journey, which occupied us fifty-three days, as the traveling was bad. Our last resting place was Fort Clark. Thence we struck directly across through a hostile Indian country, arriving in safety, within hailing distance of the fort before the cherries were ripe, although they were very near it. I rested on a gentle rise of ground to contemplate the mass of people I saw before me. There they lay, in their absorbing devotedness to their absent chief. Day and night, for long months, they had stayed by that wooden enclosure, watching for my return, or to take fearful vengeance upon their prey. They had loved the whites, but these whites had now killed their chief, because he had returned to his own people to fight for his kindred and nation. The chief who had loved them much and made them rich and strong. They were now feared by their enemies and respected by all. Their prairies were covered with thousands of horses, and their lodges were full of wealth derived from the whites. For this, the white chief had killed them, and a war of extermination was denounced against them. The fort and its inmates were within their grasp. 
If the crane would redeem his pledge and produce their missing chief, all were well. But if the appointed time passed by and he were not forthcoming, it was fearful to contemplate the vengeance they would inflict. When I thought of those contemptible wrenches, who merely to wanton with the face that the artless savages reposed in them, could fabricate a lie that aroused all this impending danger, I felt that a death at the stake would not transcend their deserts. I put my horse into speed and rode in among the Indians. I made the usual salutations on arriving before them, and riding through their ranks sullenly, I repeated two or three times, I am angry. Every eye was turned on me, but not a warrior stood. The women seized their children and ran into the lodges. The medicine calf arrived, but he was angry. I advanced to the strong and well-secured gate of the fort and struck it a heavy blow with my battle-axe. Hello, boys, I shouted, open your gates and admit a friend. Jim Beckworth, by heavens, Jim Beckworth, was repeated from tongue to tongue. The gates flew open upon their massive hinges, and as I rode through, I said, Leave the gates open, boys. There is no longer danger. I exchanged but a few words with Mr. Tullock, as I had a difficult business before me. The people I had to mollify were subject to strange caprices, and I had not resolved what policy to adapt towards them. I went and sat down sullenly, hanging my head so low that my chin rested on my breast. This was a token of my great displeasure. The braves came round me slowly. My wives all formed themselves in a circular line and marched round me, each one pausing as she passed to place her hand on my back of my neck. The brave old yellow belly was the first one to speak, and what he said was to the purpose. What is the matter with our chief, he inquired. Who has angered the medicine calf? Did I not tell you, I said, that I left you in charge of the crane and that these are the whites during my absence, and what do I behold on my return? Yes, I told you I would take care of the crane and these are the whites while well, you were gone, and I have done so. My warriors have killed buffalo for them to eat, and our women have brought them wood and water for their use, and they are all alive. Look, yonder is the crane, and his white people are all with him. Are they dead? No, but you intended to kill them. Yes, but listen, if you had not returned before the cherries turned red, we would have killed, we should have killed them all, and every other white man beside them that we could have found in the Amahamahas Rocky Mountains. Now hear what I have to say. Suppose I am now going to war, or I am going to die. I come to you and say, my friend, I am going to die yonder. I want you to be a kind friend to my children and protect them after I depart for the land of the Great Spirit. I go out and die. My wives come to you with their fingers cut off and their hair gone and the warm blood pouring from their bodies. They are crying mournfully and your heart pities them. Among the children is a son in whom you behold the image of your friend who is no more. The mother of that child you know to be good and virtuous. You have seen a triumphant entry into the medicine lodge, where you have beheld so many cut to pieces in attempting the same. You say, here is the virtuous wife of my friend. She is beloved and respected by the whole nation. She asks you to revenge her loss, the loss that has deprived her of her husband and the child of its father. In such case, what would you do? Speak. I should certainly take my warriors, I replied, and go and avenge your loss. That is just what I was going to do for your relatives, friends, and nation. Now punish me if I have done wrong. I had nothing to say in answer, and my head again fell. The spell was not yet broken. The crow belt, an old and crafty brave, whispered to a young warrior who rose in silence and immediately left the fort. Mr. Tullock shortly presented himself and commenced tantalizing the crows. What are your warriors waiting for, who have been thirsting so many sons to kill the whites? You have been brave for a long while. Where is all your bravery now? 
The gates are set wide open, and only three have joined the few whites whom you thirsted to kid. Why don't you begin? What are you afraid of? She continued in this aggravating strain, the warriors hearing it all, although they did not appear to notice her. The woman's voice was agreeably relieved by tones uttered outside the gate, which at that moment fell upon my ear, which I readily recognized as the voice of Pine Leaf. She was haranguing her warriors in an animated manner, and delivering what, in civilized life, would be called a valedictorial address. Warriors, she said, I am now about to make a great sacrifice for my people. For many winters I have been on the war path with you. I should tread that path no more. You have now to fight the enemy without me. When I laid down my needle and my beads and took up the battle axe and lance, my arm was weak, but few winters have passed over my head. My brother has been killed by the enemy and was gone to the hunting ground of the Great Spirit. I saw him in my dreams. He would beckon for his sister to come to him. It was my heart's desire to go to him, but I wished first to become a warrior, that I might avenge his death upon his foes before I went away. I said I would kill one hundred foes before I married any living man. I have more than kept my word, as our great chief and medicine men can tell you. As my arm increased in strength, the enemy learned to fear me. I have accomplished the task I set before me. Henceforth I leave the war paths of my people. I have fought my last battle and hurled my last lance. I am a warrior no more. Today the medicine calf has returned. He has returned angry at the follies of his people, and they fear that he will again leave them. They believe that he loves me and that my devotion to him will attach him to the nation. I therefore bestow myself upon him. Perhaps he will be contented with me and will leave us no more. Warriors, farewell. She then entered the fort and sent Sparrowhawks. One who has followed you for many winters is about to leave your war path forever. When have you seen Bart Chiampi shrink from the charge? You have seen her lance red with the blood of the enemy more than ten times ten. You know what her vow was, and you know she has kept her word. Many of you tried to make her break a word, which you knew she had passed in a great spirit when she lost her brother. But you found that, though a woman, she had the heart of a warrior. Do not turn your heads, but listen. You have seen that a woman can keep her word. During the many winters that I have followed you faithfully in the war path, you have refused to let me into the war path secret although you tell it to the striplings on their second excursion. It was unfair that I could not know it, that I must be sent away with women and children when the secret was made known to those one battle braves. If you had seen fit to tell it to me, it would have been secret until my death. But let it go. I care no further for it. I am about to sacrifice what I have always chosen to preserve. My liberty. The back of my steed has been my lodge and my home. On his back, armed with my lance and battle axe, I knew no fear. The medicine chief, when fighting by my side, has displayed a noble courage and a lofty spirit, and he won from my heart what no other warrior has ever won, the promise to marry him when my vow was fulfilled. He has done much for our people. He has fought their enemies and spilled his blood for them. When I shall become his wife, I shall be fond and faithful to him. My heart feels pure before the Great Spirit and the Son. When I shall be no more on the war path, obey the voice of the medicine calf, and you will grow stronger and stronger. We shall continue a great and happy people, and he will leave us no more. I have done. She then approached me, every eye being intently fixed upon her. She placed her hand under my chin, lifted my head up forcibly. Look at me, she said. I know your heart is crying for the follies of the people, but let it cry no more. I know you have ridden day and night to keep us from evil. You have made us strong, and your desire is to preserve us strong. Now stay at home with us. You will not be obliged to go to war more than twice in twelve moons. And now, my friend, I am yours after you have so long been seeking me. 
I believe you love me, for you have often told me you did, and I believe you have not a forked tongue. Our lodge shall be a happy one. When you depart to the happy hunting ground, I will be ready there to welcome you. This day I become your wife. Bar-Chiam P is a warrior no more. This relieved me of my melancholy. I shook the braves by the hand all around and narrated much of my recent adventures to them. When I came to my danger in the Arikara country, they were almost boiling with wrath and asked my permission to go and exterminate them. Pine Leaf left the fort with my sisters to go and dress for the short marriage ceremony. She had so long worn the war custom that female apparel seemed hardly to become her. She returned so transformed in appearance that the beholder could scarcely recognize her for the same person. When I visited her lodge in the evening, I found her dressed like a queen with a lodge full of her own and my relatives to, to witness the Neptunes. She was naturally a pensive, deep-thinking girl. Her mind seemed absorbed in some other object than worldly matters. It might be that her continual remembrance of her brother's early fall had tinged the mind with melancholy, or it might be constitutional to her. But for an Indian girl, she had more of that winning grace, more of those feminine blandishments. In short, she approached nearer to our ideal of a woman than her savage birth and breed would seem to render possible. This was my last marriage in the Crow Nation. Pine Leaf, the pride and admiration of a people, was no longer the dauntless and victorious warrior, the avenger of the fall of her brother. She retired from the field of her glory and became the affectionate wife of the medicine calf. The difficulty being now entirely removed, we quitted our encampment and went on a hunting excursion. We were away but a few days and then returned to the fort. One morning it was discovered a large drove of horses were missing. A party was dispatched along the trail, which conducted them precisely the same route they took before. I raised the party and again struck across the mussel shell, and finding I was before the fugitives, I secreted my warriors as before. We had waited but a few moments when I saw the enemy emerge from the pines, not more than a mile distance. Pine Leaf and my little wife were with me. My new bride, as she saw the enemy approach, lost all recollection of a new character. Her eye assumed its a former martial fire, and... Had she had her former war equipments, beyond all doubt she would have joined in the dash upon the foe. The pursued, which was a party of Blackfeet, were hard pressed by their pursuers in the rear, but very shortly they were harder pushed in the van. When within proper distance, I gave the word, Who ki he charge, and every Blackfoot instantly perished. So sudden was our attack, they had not time to fire a gun. I struck down one man, and, looking round for another to ride it, I found they were all dead. The pursuers did not arrive in time to participate in the fight. We took 38 scalps and recovered 1,000 horses, which we returned to the fort. This was my last battle in the Crow Nation. The scalp I relieved the Blackfoot of was the last I ever took for them. Before my sudden recall from St. Louis, I had entered into negotiation, which I now felt I would like to complete. I had informed the Crows, after my marriage with Pine Leaf, that I must return to the country of the Whites, as they had called me away before I had time to finish my business. When the boats were ready to go downstream, I stepped on board and proceeded as far as Fort Union. Previous to departing, I informed the Crows that I should be back in four season, and I, at that time, supposed I should. I told them to credit no reports of my death, for they were all false. The whites would never kill me. Pine Leaf inquired if I would certainly come back. I assured her that, if life was preserved to me, I would. I had been married but five weeks when I left, and I had never seen her since. I was disappointed in my expectation of entering into a satisfactory engagement to the agent of the company, so I kept on to St. Louis. 
In good truth, I was tired of savage life under any aspect. I knew that if I remained with them, it would be war and carnage to the end of the chapter, and my mind sickened at the repetition of such scenes. Savage life admits of no repose to the man who desires to retain the character of a great brave. There is no retiring upon his laurels. I could have become a pipe man, but I did not like to descend to that. And further, I could not reconcile myself to a life of inactivity. Pine leaf and my little wife would have excited their powers of pleasure to procure me happiness, but I felt I was not doing justice to myself to relapse irretrievably into barbarism. It certainly grieved me to leave the people who reposed so much trust in me, and with whom I had been associated so long. And indeed, could I have made an engagement with the American Fur Company, as I had hoped to do, I should have redeemed my promise to the Crows, and possibly have finished my days with them. But, being mistaken in my calculations, I was led on to scenes wilder and still more various yet dignified with the name of greater utility because associated with the interests of civilization. End of chapter 28。Chapter 29 of The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner this Liberace recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Oldman. Chapter 29. Return to St. Louis. Interview with General Gaines. The Muleteers Company. Departure for Florida. Wreck of the Maid of New York. Arrival at Fort Brook. Tampa Bay. Barrier of Dispatches to General Jessup. Battle of Oak Key Toby, Anecdotes and Incidents I had speedy passage to St. Louis and arrived there after an absence of five months. I mentioned that I had left some business unsettled at the time of my sudden leave. This was none other than an affair matrimonial. But on my return I had some misunderstanding with my fair Dulcinea and the courtship dropped through. At this time the Florida War was unfinished. General Gaines was in St. Louis for the purpose of raising a company of men familiar with Indian habits. Mr. Sublet had spoken to him about me and had recommended me as being particularly well acquainted with Indian life. The general sent a request that I would call upon him at his quarters. I went accordingly and was introduced by Sublet. The general inquired of me how I would like to go to Florida to fight the Indians. I replied that I had seen so much of Indian warfare during the last 16 years that I was about tired of it and did not want to engage in it again, at least for the present. He remarked there was a good opportunity there for renown. He wished, he said, to raise a company which would go down as muleteers, that their duties would be light, and so on through the stereotype benefits peculiar to a soldier's life. Sublet recommended me to engage. Florida, he said, was a delightful country, and I should find a wide difference between the cold regions of the Rocky Mountains and the genial and salubrious south. The general then inquired if I could not raise a company of mountain boys to go with me. I replied that I thought I could, or that at any rate I would make the effort. The trapping business was unusually dull at that time, and there was plenty of unoccupied men in the city ready to engage in any enterprise. I went among my acquaintances and soon collected a company of sixty-four men. I went and reported my success to the general. He wished to see the men. I brought them all forward and had their names enrolled. I was appointed captain of the company with three lieutenants elected from the men. On the ninth day of my stay in St. Louis, we went on board a steamer going downstream and were quickly on our way to the Seminole country. We had a delightful journey to New Orleans, where we were detained five days in waiting for a vessel to transport us to the fields of renown. While waiting in New Orleans, I fell in with several old acquaintances who gave me an elegant parting dinner. 
I then spotted the commission of captain in the service of Uncle Sam. Our vessel, the mate of New York, Captain Carr being at length ready for sea, my soldiers with their horses were taken on board, and we set sail for Tampa Bay. I now, for the first time in my life, saw salt water, and the sickness it produced in me led me to curse General Gaines and the trappings of war to boot. Our vessel stranded on a reef, and there she remained snug enough, all efforts to dislodge her proving fruitless. There was one small island in sight to leeward. In every other direction there was nothing visible but the heaving ocean. Wreckers who seemed to rise from the sea foam flocked instantly around us and were received by our captain with us with a ready volley of nautical compliment. The vessel had settled deeply into a bed of sand and rock. The water was rapidly gaining in a hold, and my commission together with my gallant command companions in arm seemed at the moment to have a slim chance of ever serving our respective uncle in the fields of renown. I ascended the rigging to take a survey of the country. Many a time an elevated prospect had delivered me from difficulties, if dissimilar, not less imminent than those that now menaced me. Still I felt that, could these rat lines I was now ascending be transformed into the back of my Indian war steed, this ocean be replaced with a prairie, and that this inspect which they call an island to be transmuted into a buffalo, I would give my chance of a major generalship in purchase of the change, for the sensations of hunger I began to feel were uncomfortably acute, and I saw no immediate prospects of alleviating the pain. Suddenly I saw a long line of black smoke, which I thought must be from a prairie fire. I reported my discovery to the captain, and he hoisted our colors at half-mast to signal for assistance. A small steamer came in sight and made toward it, towards us, and finally ranged up under our stern. She took off all my men except myself and twelve others. I wrote to the commandant at Tampa Bay to inform him of our situation and asking him for immediate assistance. After twelve days' stay on the reef, two small brigs came out to us, and received on board ourselves with our horses and forage, conveying us to Tampa Bay, where they cast anchor. Major Bryant sent for me to his quarters, and I forthwith presented myself before him. This officer gave me a very cordial welcome, congratulating the service on having an experienced mountaineer and saying several other very complimentary things. At length, he said, Captain Beckworth, I wish to open a communication between this port and the headquarters of Colonel Jessup, a distance of about 100 miles. I have received no dispatches from there, although nine couriers have been dispatched by Colonel Taylor. I replied, sir, I have no knowledge of the country. I know nothing of its roads or trails, the situation of its posts, nor do I so much as know the position of Colonel Jessup's command. To attempt to convey dispatches when so little prepared to keep out of harm's way, I very much fear would be to again disappoint the service in delivery of its messages and to afford the Seminoles an additional scalp to those they already taken. He pooh-poohed my objections. A man, said Major Bryant, who had fought the Indians in the Rocky Mountains the number of years that you have will find no difficulty here in Florida. Well, I assented, furnish me with the bearings of the country and direct me to the colonel's camp and I will do my best to reach there. Accordingly, the major furnished me with all the necessary instructions and I started alone on my error. It was my acquired habit never to travel along any beaten pass or open trail but rather to give such a road a wide berth and take the chances of the open country i observed my invariable custom on this occasion merely keeping in view the bearing of the position i was steering for i started from major bryant's post about sunrise and reached the colonel's headquarters at nightfall the following day I passed through the camp without seeing it, but the sound of a bugle falling on my ear, I tacked about and finally alighted upon it. As I rode up, I was hailed by a sentinel. Who comes there? And expressed, what you want in this camp? 
I wish to see Colonel Jessup, call the officer of the guard. Vat for you come from dat way, where is the Shiminoes? Call your officer of the guard, and I said I impatiently. The officer of the guard at length appeared. What are you here again for? he inquired of me. I wish to see the commanding officer, I replied. Yes, you are always wishing to see the commanding officer, he said. But he will not be troubled with you much longer. He will soon commence hanging you all. I demand to be shown to the commanding officer. Sir, I reiterate. Who are you, then? I am bearer of dispatches. Give them to me. I was not instructed to give them to you. I shall not do it, sir. I believe you came from the Seminoles. You came from that direction. You believe wrong, sir. Will you show me to Colonel Jess? Jessup, or will you not? This very cautious officer of the guard then went to the marquee of the colonel and addressed him. Here is another of those Seminoles, sir, who says he has dispatches for you. What shall I do with him? The colonel came out and eyed me scrutinizingly. Have you brought dispatches for me, he inquired. I have, sir. From where? From Tampa Bay, sir. He came from the Seminole, colonel, interposed the officer of the guard. You are mistaken again, sir, I said, giving him the look of a crow in the midst of a battle. I was not yet hireling enough to feel aggravated at being called by implication a liar. Let me see your dispatches, said the colonel. I handed him the documents. He took them and passed into his tent. This did not suit me. I resolved to return instantly. I had not been treated with common civility. Nor inquiries were made about my appetite. I was not even invited to light for my horse. I had neither eaten nor slept since I left Tampa Bay. I was on the point of turning my horse's bay head, secretly resolving that these were the last dispatches I would bear in that direction when the colonel called. Captain Beckworth, a light, a light, sir, and come into my quarters. Oddly have Captain Beckworth's horse taken immediate care of. You must be hungry, Captain. What I need now most is sleep. I said, let me have a little repose, and then I shall feel refreshed and not refuse to sit down to a meal. The colonel bowed assent, and raising a canvas door, pointed out to me a place for repose, at the same time promising me I shall not be disturbed. When I awoke, I presented myself and was regaled with a good substantial supper. This recruited me, and I was again fit for service. The colonel made many inquiries of my past service. Major Bryant had made very favorable mention of me and his dispatches, which seemed to have inspired quite an interest in the colonel's mind. He asked me if I was a native of Florida, where I had spent my early days, and my reason for entering the army. I answered all his questions as briefly as possible, mentioning that I had been tempted among the Seminoles by the promise held out by General Gaines of my gaining renown. The colonel thought my company of mountaineers a valuable acquisition to the service, and he made no doubt we should achieve great credit in ferreting out the hiding places of the Indians. He soon had his papers ready. They were delivered to me, and I departed. On the way, I stopped at a fort, the name of which I forget, and took a fresh horse. I finally arrived at the bay without seeing an Indian. I stayed with my company for two or three weeks at Fort Brooke, during which time we were engaged in breaking in mules. We were then placed under the command of Colonel Taylor, afterwards General and President of the United States, whose force was composed of the United States troops and volunteers, some of the latter being from Missouri. The Colonel advanced southward with 1,600 men, erecting as we advanced a fort at the interval of every 25 miles. On the morning of Christmas Day, 1837, our camp was beleaguered by a large force of Indians, and Colonel Taylor ordered an advance upon them. The spot was thickly grown with trees, and numbers of our assailants were concealed among the branches. As our line advanced, therefore, many were singled out by the enemy, and we lost fearfully in killed and wounded. The yelling was the most deafening I had ever heard, for there were many Negroes among the enemy, and their yells drowned out those of the red men. I soon found 
we had a different enemy from the black feet to fight and different ground to fight on the country lost several valuable lives through this slight brush with the indians the gallant colonel gentry of the missouri volunteers was shot through the head colonel thompson and several other officers were also among the slain the enemy had made an excellent choice of ground and we could see our troops while remaining concealed themselves i placed myself behind a tree and captain morgan of the missouri spies was similarly sheltered close by we were surrounded with indians and one was watching on the opposite side of a tree that protected me for a chance to get my scalp a missourian picked off a fine fat negro who had ensconced himself in a live oak tree as he fell to the ground it shook beneath him the fruit was ripe but unfit for food seeing the men dropping around major price ordered a retreat the order was instantly countermanded by Colonel Davenport, who, by so doing, saved many lives. Colonel Forster had taken a very exposed position on the bole of the tree where he was visible to all. He ordered his men to lie low and load their muskets. He waited till he saw a favorable opportunity and then shouted, Fire, boys, pour it into those red and black rascals. A charge with bayonets was finally ordered and the Indians, not relishing the look of the sharp steel, retreated. However, not before they had seized a sergeant major and a private from our line, and scalped them alive. This was the Battle of Okeechobee, which lasted four hours. We lost over a hundred and killed and wounded. The enemy left nine Indians and a Negro dead upon the field. Sam Jones, the half-breed, was only eight miles distant with a force of a thousand warriors most providentially he had been dissuaded by the negroes from advancing who assured him that the whites would not fight on christmas day it was reported that colonel taylor was uncontrollably angry during the battle and that his aides and officers had to hold him by main force to prevent him from rushing among the enemy and meeting certain death i do not know what truth there is in this for I saw nothing of it, nor indeed did I see the colonel during the whole of the four hours' fighting. On the conclusion of the action, Colonel Taylor wished to send dispatches to Tampa Bay. He requested Captain Lomax to take his company and go with them. The captain refused for the reason that he and his men would infallibly be massacred. The colonel remarked then, Since you are all afraid, I will go myself. He sent for me and demanded if I could raise a sufficient number of brave men among my mountaineers to carry a dispatch to the bay. I answered certainly, if I could have his favorite horse, which was the fleetest one in the whole army, and such excellent bottom that he was fresh after a journey as before. I considered that if I had to run the gauntlet through a host of Seminoles and infuriated Negroes, the best horse was none too good and was indeed my only means of salvation. When ready to start, I applied for the dispatches. Where are your men? asked the colonel. My men are in their quarters, colonel. I said, I'm going to carry those dispatches by myself. They must go through, he remarked. I want them to go well guarded. I'm not going to fight, colonel, I replied. I'm going to run. And one man will make less noise than twenty. If I am not killed, the dispatches shall arrive safely. My life is certainly worth as much to me as the charge I am entrusted with, and for personal safety I prefer going alone. In our progress out, the troops had cut their way through several hummocks and had thrown the bushes up on both sides. I had to pass through some of these lanes. It was night when I started, and I was riding through one of these excavations at a good pace. I heard a sudden noise in the bush. I saw myself in a trap, and my hair bristled up with a fright. I was greatly relieved, however, by the speedy discovery that it was only a deer I had scared, which was scampering away at its utmost speed. I continued on, resting a short time at each fort, till I arrived in sight of Fort Brook. As soon as I arrived within hailing distance, I shouted, Victory! Victory! which brought out officers and men, impatient to hear the news. 
I could not see that Okeechobee was much of a victory. Indeed, I shrewdly suspected that the enemy had the advantage, but it was called a victory by the soldiers, and they were the best qualified to decide. On my return, I found Colonel Taylor. Soon after the battle, I had retrograded to Fort Bassinger. We lay at that fort a long while. Spies were vigilantly on the lookout, but nothing very encouraging was reported. I and my company of mountaineers did not encamp with the other troops, but took up our quarters at a considerable distance from the main guard. We were quite tired of inactivity and wanted to go somewhere and do something. Being quartered by ourselves, we were not subjected to the restrictions and military regulation of the camp. We had our own jollifications and indulged in some little comforts which the camp did not enjoy. We always would have a large fire when there was need for it, for it destroyed the millions of mosquitoes and other vermin that annoyed us, and as some of our company were always about, the Indians never molested us. There was a large hummock about four miles distant from the fort, which the Indians infested in great numbers, but as they could not be dislodged without great loss, our colonel was constrained to content himself with closely watching them. One day I proposed to my men to take a stroll, and they fell with great alacrity into the proposition. We passed down to the interdicted hummock, where we shot two deer, found quite an assortment of stock. We drove them all to camp before us, to the great admiration of the officers and men present. We had captured quite a drove of hogs, several head of cattle, and a good sprinkling of Seminole ponies. We saw no Indians at the hummock, though certainly we did not search very diligently for them. During our stay at the fort, the communication between that post and Charlotte's Harbor was closed, and one messenger had been killed. The quartermaster inquired of me if I would undertake the trip. I told him I would, and set one hundred dollars as the price of the undertaking, which he thought quite reasonable. I started with the dispatches, and proceeded at an easy gallop, my eye glancing in every direction, as had been my wont for many years. In casting a look about two gunshots ahead, I felt sure that I saw some feathers showing themselves just above the palmettos and exactly in the direction that I was bending my step. I rode a short distance further, and my suspicions were confirmed. I immediately stopped my horse and dismounted, as though for the purpose of adjusting my saddle, but in reality to watch my supposed foes. In a minute or two, several heads appeared, looking in my direction, and withdrew again in an instant. Immediately the heads declined behind the grass. I sprang upon my horse and reined him out of the road, taking a wide circuit around them, which I knew would carry me out of danger. I then looked after them and tantalized them with my gestures in every manner possible, motioning them to come and see me. But they seemed to be aware that their legs were not long enough to reach me, so they digested their disappointment and troubled me no further. I arrived safe at the harbor that same day, delivered my dispatches, and was back at the fort the following night. We now experienced a heavy rain, which deluged the entire country and prevented any further operations against the Indians. The colonel ordered a retreat to Tampa Bay, and as there was no danger of molestation on the way, many of the officers obtained liberty to gallop on in advance of the army. Captain Bryant rode a very valuable black charger, acknowledged to be the best horse in camp. After traveling on a while, the colonel said, have a notion to ride on and get in today, as my presence is required. You can get in tomorrow at your leisure. Number said, if you can get in today, we can. And finally, the whole party pur proposed starting off together. We at length came to a swampy place in the road, which spread over five miles, and in many places took our horses off their feet. This place forded. There was then a narrow stream, and after that it was all dry land. Having passed the swamp and the stream and got fairly on to dry land again, 
I took the saddle off my mule, which example all followed, and with the assistance of a brother officer, wrung the saddle blanket as dry as possible, and then spread it out fairly in the sun to dry. In the meanwhile, the horses helped themselves to a good feed of grass, and we all partook of a hearty lunch likewise. Thus refreshed, we saddled up and proceeded again. After a few miles travel, we discovered the rear of Bryant's party, who were toiling slowly alone and goring their animals' flanks in the vain endeavor to urge them into speed. We passed them with a hearty cheer. We journeyed on until within three miles of the fort, where there was a short bend in the road, and a foot trail across, which saved about a hundred yards. Now, gentlemen, said I, let us raise a gallop and pass everybody on the road. The work was at once accomplished. Some of my men deriding those left behind account of their miserable progress. We then all struck into a gallop and soon reached the fort. Several of our company found time to get quite intoxicated before the quartermaster arrived. He, however, soon recovered his equanimity of temper and begged a solution of the mystery of how we could come in with our animals fresh while his and his companion's horses were jaded to death. He was referred by all to the captain of the mountaineers. I said, a horse colonel is only flesh and blood, and this system requires greater care than that of almost any other animal. We beat your powerful steer with inferior animals by affording them a short rest with a mouthful or two of grass on the road and by wringing our blankets after we had passed the water. Now we had another long interval of inactivity, and I began to grow tired of Florida. With its inaccessible hummocks, it seemed to me to be a country dear, even at the price of the powder that would be required to blow the Indians out of it, and certainly a poor field to work in for renown. My company and I, its commander, had nothing to do except carry an occasional dispatch and I wanted excitement of some kind. I was indifferent of what nature, even if it was no better than barring horses of the Blackfeet. The Seminoles had no authors white stealing, and, or I should have certainly have exercised my talent for the benefit of the United States. The last dispatches that I carried in Florida, I bore from Fort Day to Fort Brook. In accomplishing this, I traveled with my customary caution, avoiding the trail as much as possible in a part where I anticipated no danger. I took the trail and fell asleep on my horse, for I had ridden four nights and days without rest, except what I had snatched upon horseback. Suddenly my horse sprang aside, instantly awakened me. I found I had been sleeping too long, for I had passed the turning point and was now near a hummock. To return would cost me several miles' travel. My horse's ears informed me there was something in motion nearby. I pondered my position and ultimately resolved to take the chances and go ahead. The road through the hummock was just wide enough to admit the army wagons to pass. I bid my horse go, and he sprang forward with tremendous bounds. He had not reached through this dark and dangerous pass, when I saw the flash of several guns, and the balls whizzed harmlessly past me. I discharged my pistols at the lair of my foes, and traveled on in safety to the fort. I grew tired of this, and informed Colonel Bryan that I wished to resign my task. Why? said he, everybody who undertakes it gets killed. Why, you never see any Indians. What are we to do? When in camp, I had frequently seen men come running in half dead with alarm, saying they had seen Indians or had been fired upon by Indians. I remarked that they were always ridiculed by the officers. Even the privates disbelieved them. Seeing this, I determined to say nothing about my adventures, for if they had received my assertion with incredulity, it might have led to an unpleasant scene in the wigwam. I was determined to return to the home of the free and the land of the brave for I felt that the mountains and the prairies of the great west, although less attended with renown 
at least would afford me more of the substantial comforts of life and suit my peculiar taste better than the service of uncle sam in florida the commander of the fort after reading the dispatched endorsed on it beckworth fired on by a party of indians when near this post he then returned it to me and i rode on to fort brooke colonel bryan having read the dispatch said ah beckworth you have been fired on i see why did you not tell us so on your arrival i informed him of my reasons as before stated he smiled. Your word would have been believed by us all, he said. It is these stupid foreigners that we discredit, who don't know an Indian from a stump. They have deceived us too often for us to put further faith in them. A Seminole came into the fort a few days subsequent to this to give himself up, his arm being broken. When questioned about it, he said that a white man had broken it in such a hammock on such a night. I then knew that my pistols, with which I fired at random, had done the mischief. Alligator, the Seminole chief, shortly after came in and informed Colonel Taylor that he and his tribe had concluded to remove to their new home and requested the colonel to send down wagons to transport their women and children. I have fought you a long time, said the red man, but I cannot beat you. If I kill ten of your warriors... You sent a hundred to replace them. I am not ready to go and save the rest of my people. Yes, the colonel answered. Your talk is good. You can now go to your new home and be happy. There is a man pointing to me who is a great chief of a great nation. You will, for what I know, be neighbors to his people. He and his people will teach you to hunt the buffalo, and I hope you will be good friends. While I was with the army, a tragedy occurred which I have never seen in any public print, and I deem it of sufficient interest to make mention of it here. A young private of very respectable connections had been tried for some offense and sentenced to receive a flogging, which was carried unmercifully into effect. After he had recovered, the surgeon bade him go and report himself fit for duty. I will go, said he, but it will be my last duty. Accordingly, he fixed his bayonet and repaired to the officer's quarter where he found the captain and first lieutenant of, of his company. He advanced upon them, saying, You have disgraced me with an inhuman flogging. Die. He shot the captain dead, plunged his bayonet through the body of the lieutenant, also killing him on the spot. He straightway gave himself up, was tried by court-martial, and sentenced to be shot. The execution of the sentence was withheld by Colonel Taylor, who had forwarded the particulars of the trial to the Department of Washington and was waiting the results of official investigation. The case was found worthy of executive interference. A pardon was signed by the President and sent on, and the young man was liberated from confinement. Such inhuman treatment as this poor young soldier received at the hands of his officer has resulted, I have no shadow of a doubt, in the death of many an officer on the battlefield. I remember at the Battle of Okeechobee, a young lieutenant riding up to Colonel Forster and saying, Colonel, I've been shot at twice and not the enemy either. It was by no friend, I will swear, said the colonel. You can leave the field and learn to treat your men well in the future. This I witnessed myself, but whether the young buckskin profited by the sharp cut of the colonel, I was unable to say. There was a Tennessean in camp, a great foot racer, who was incessantly boasting about his wonderful pedestrian powers. He had a valuable horse, which he offered to stake against any person in the camp for a race of sixty yards, as he was considered a great leg by all. No one ventured to take him up on his offer. I offered myself as a competitor, but all sought to dissuade me. Don't run against him, said Daddy. That fellow will outrun Lucifer himself. He has beat every man who has run against him in Florida. However, I staked a hundred dollars against his horse and entered the lists. We started together, but as I did not see my antagonist either ahead of me or by my side, I looked around and saw him coming up. 
I went out a good distance ahead of him, and did not exert myself either. The enemy having submitted to the government, there was nothing more for us to do, and I asked for a furlough to return to St. Louis. I and my company were enlisted for a year. Ten months of this time had been served, and I obtained a furlough for the remaining two months. We embarked for New Orleans, Colonel Gates and his regiment taking passage in the same ship. Arriving at my place of destination in safety, I stayed but one night in the Crescent City and then took the steamer to St. Louis, where we had a good time while steaming up and I was very well satisfied to jump ashore once again at my old home. My company all left but two, one of whom died in New Orleans, the other was killed by Seminoles after I left. End of chapter 29「The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 30. Departure for the Mountains. Severe Sickness on the Way. Arrival at Bent's Fort. Arrival at Sublet's Fort. Interview with the Cheyennes. Difficulty with a Sioux Warrior. His Death. Successful trade open with various tribes. Incidents. I stayed but five days in St. Louis, which time I devoted to a hasty visit among my friends. I entered into service with Messrs. Sublet and Vasquez to return to the mountains and trade with any tribes I might find on the headwaters of the Platte and Arkansas rivers. The country embraces the hunting grounds of the Cheyennes, the Arapahoes, the Sioux, and the Iantans. All preliminaries being arranged, which are of no interest to the reader, I bade my friends once more adieu. In stepping on board a steamboat bound for the Missouri, we were soon breasting its broad and turbulent current. We spent the fourth on board amid much noise, revelry, and drunken patriotism. We were landed in safety at Independence, where we received our wagons, cattle, etc., with which to convey the immense stock of goods I had bought through the Indian country. We were very successful in escaping accident in our progress over the plains until we reached the ridge, which passed between the Arkansas and Platte rivers. While ascending this ridge, accompanied with Mr. Vasquez, I was sunstroke. We were at that time twenty miles from water. I was burning with thirst. The heat was intolerable, and hostile Indians were before us. After incredible suffering, we reached the river bank and crossed the stream to an island where I lay me down to die. All our medicines were in the wagons and two days' journey in our rear. My fatigue and suffering had thrown me into a fever. I became delirious and grew rapidly worse. I requested my companion to return to the wagons and procure me some medicine, but he refused to leave me, lest I might die in his absence. I said to him, If you stay by me, I shall certainly die, for you cannot relieve me. But if you go, and nature holds out till you return, there is some chance of my gaining relief. Go, I added, and hasten your return. He left me at my entreaties, but filled all our vessels with water before he started. I speedily fell asleep. I know not how long I remained unconscious. When I at length awoke, I drank an inordinate quantity which caused me to perspire copiously. This relieved me, and my recovery commenced from that moment, although I still suffer from a severe headache. The third day of my friend's absence, I could walk about a little, and the fourth day at noon, I kept a good lookout in the direction. I expected succor. Suddenly I saw a head appear, and another then another, until four showed themselves. They are Indians, I said to myself, but if they are only four, I stand a passable chance with them, so let them come on. I saw they had discovered me, so I arose and showed myself. With joyous shouts they flew towards me. It was my companion with three others, who had come either to bury me or to assist me to the wagon. 
The joy on beholding me so miraculously restored was unbounded, while my delight at seeing them was almost as great. We remained on the island that night, and the following morning started for the wagons, which we found in two days. In going for assistance, my friend had a narrow escape. He came suddenly upon a party of Pawnees, and one made a rush for his horse. He discharged his rifle hastily and missed his mark. He then had to trust to his horse's heels, but as he was jaded, he did not make very good speed. The Indians were on foot and gave close chase, but when they saw his rifle reloaded, they fell back to a wider distance and plied him with arrows until he was out of reach. I was placed in a wagon and attended on as far as our circumstances would admit, until I recovered my accustomed health. We stayed one night at Burt's Fort on the Arkansas, and then moved on to our destination on the south fork of the Platte. Here we erected suitable buildings within the fort for our proposed trading, and, among others, a barn which we proceeded to fill with hay for the coming winter. While staying at the fort, a man inquired of Sublet his reason for bringing up such a rascally fellow as I, to prompt the Indian into raising and massacring all the whites. Murray, said Sublet, for that was the man's name, it is unsafe for you to express such sentiments in relation to Beckworth. Should they reach his ears, he would surely make you rue it. I have heard these foul aspersions upon his character before, and I am in a position to know that they are all unfounded. Had I the least suspicion of his integrity, I should be the last man to take him in my employ. This conversation was reported to me at some distance from the fort, where Murray was perfectly safe. But these foul reports annoyed me exceedingly. They were like stabs in the dark, for no one ever accused me to my face of such misdeeds. After having placed things to rights, we were dining together within the fort when Mr. Sublet rose and said, Traders and clerks, you have come here to the mountains to work for me, and I expect every man to do his best. If I am prospered, I will do well by all of you. I desire a regular system established in my business out here, that my interests may be placed upon a secure footing. I am now going to deliver the key of my entire stock of goods to one man among you in whom I have implicit confidence, and whose long experience and intimate acquaintance with the Indian character preeminently entitle him to the trust. This man will have full command of the fort and full charge of its affairs. I wish you to receive him as a representative of myself, and whatever orders you receive from him, obey them carefully and to the very letter. All present promised ready acquiescence to the wishes of our chief. He then delivered the key to me, saying, Beckworth, I place this trust in your keeping, believing you to be as morally worthy of the confidence I repose in you, as you are practically qualified to advance my interest. I abandon my affairs to your keeping. Do your best. I shall be satisfied. I was so entirely unprepared for this distinguished mark of confidence that for a moment I was unable to reply. After a momentary irresolution, I said, Mr. Sublet, you have other men present who are better able to discharge this trust. I thank you for the flattering reference, but I beg to be excused from assuming the responsibility. I engage you, he answers, to serve me in this cap capacity and I wish you to accept the charge. In that case, I said, I will do my best to promote your interest. Shortly after, he called me apart and said, Beckworth, I am deeply in debt. I have been losing for a long time. If you can replace me in one year, you shall be substantially rewarded, and I shall feel sincerely grateful for your service. How much do you owe? I inquired. Over $17,000. Well, said I, if the men cooperate with me and carry out my instructions, I feel confident of working you straight. I forthwith set about establishing subposts in various places with the Sioux, Arapahoes, Iatans, and Cheyennes, and selected the best man at hand to attend them. I placed one at the mouth of Crow Creek, 
which I called my post, but left a man in charge of it, as I was at present fully occupied in traveling from one post to another. We had not as yet found any customers, but as we were in the Cheyenne country, I knew some of the nation could not be very far off. I sent three different messages in search of them to invite them to trade, but they all returned without having discovered the whereabouts of the Indians. Tired of these failures, I took a man with me and started in the direction of the Laramie Mountain. While ascending the mount, I cast my eyes in the direction of a valley and discovered buffalo running in small groups, which was sufficient evidence that they had been chased recently by Indians. We went no further, but encamped there, and at nightfall we saw fires. The next morning a dense smoke hung like a cloud over the village of the Cheyennes. We ate a hasty meal and started to pay them a visit. As we approached the village, we saw William Bent, an interpreter, entering before us. He visited the chief's lodge. We followed him in and seated ourselves near him. He looked aghast and addressed me. My God, Beckworth, how dare you come among the Cheyennes? Don't you know that they will kill you if they discover you? I replied that I thought not. He had come on the same errand as ourselves, namely to induce a portion of the village to remove to the Platte, as buffalo were abundant in that region. After a conversation was held between Bent and a chief, the latter inquired of Bent who we were. He informed them that we were left-hands, sublets, men. What do they want here, he asked. They come for the same purpose that I have, Bent answers, to have you move on to the plot. Bent then inquired of me what account I wished to give of myself as he would interpret for me. But preferring to interpret for myself, I asked if there was a crow among them that I could speak to. At the word crow, they all started, and every eye was riveted upon me. One stepped forward and said, I am a crow. You a crow? Yes. How long have you been away from them? Twenty winters. Bent was in the greatest perplexity. You are not surely going to tell them who you are, Jim. If you do, you cost your friends nothing for your funeral. This apprehension on the part of Bent proved to me that although he had lived among the Indians, he had still much to learn of their real character. I therefore requested him to quiet his fears and bide the result. Turning to the crow, I then said, Tell the Cheyennes that I have fought them many winters, that I have killed so many of their people, that I am buried with their scalps. I have taken a host of their women and children prisoners. I have ridden the horses until their backs were sore. I have eaten their fat buffalo until I was full. I have eaten their cherries and the other fruit of their land until I can eat no more. I have killed a great crow chief and have obliged to run away or be killed by them. I have come to the Cheyennes, who are the bravest people in the mountain, as I do not wish to be killed by any of the inferior tribes. I have come here to be killed by the Cheyennes, cut up and thrown out for their dogs to eat, so that they may say they have killed the great crow chief. He interpreted this unreserved declaration faithfully to the chief, and I observed Bent ready to fall from a seat at what he deemed my foolhardy audacity. You are certainly bereft of your senses, he remarked. These Indians will make sausage meat of you. Old Bark, the patriarch of the Cheyennes, rose and said, Warrior, we have seen you before. We know you. We knew you when you came in. Now we know you well. We know you are a great brave. You say you have killed many of our warriors. We know you do not lie. We like a great brave, and we will not kill you. You shall live. I answered, If you will not kill me, I will live with you. If you become poor, like some of the other tribes, and you need warriors to help you against your enemies, my arm is strong, and perhaps I will assist you to overcome them. But I will not at this time give you my word that I will do so. If you do not kill me, I am going to trade with you for many moons. I will trade with you fairly. I will not treat you as some of the traders have treated me. I have a great many goods over on the plat, such as you want, more than would fill many of your lodges. They are new and look well. But mind you, you must trade fairly with me, 
I have heard that you sometimes treat your traders badly, that you take away their goods and whip them, and make them run out of your country to save their lives. Your people must never serve me in this matter. They must pay me for all they get, and if anyone strikes me, I shall kill him, and thereby show you that I am brave. If anyone should strike me, and I should not kill him, you would call me a woman and say I was no brave. They then asked me, through the Crow interpreter, if I was in such and such a battle between their nation and the Crows, all of which questions I answered faithfully. Do you remember that in such a battle we lost such a brave, describing him? Yes. Who killed him? I did. Or, if I did not kill him, I would tell them the name of the Crow who did. Did he fight well? Yes, he fought well. He died like a brave man then. They would ejaculate. Were you in such a battle, asked another? Yes. Did you see such a warrior fall? Yes. Did he fight strong like a brave? No, he did not fight well. Ugh! He was no brave. He deserved to be killed. In battle, every warrior has his personal device painted on his shield, chosen according to his fancy. My armorial bearing was a crescent with a green bird between the horns and a star on each side of the field. I described my novel device, and there was a great movement among them, for most of them distinctly recollected that shield, and I saw myself rising in their estimation. Their brave hearts rejoiced to have a true warrior before them, for they esteemed me as brave as themselves. One of their great chiefs, named Bobtail Horse, arose and asked me if I remembered the battle on Pole Creek. I replied that I did. You killed me there, he said, but I did not die. And he pointed out two scars upon his chest, just below the lower rib, where the balls from my gun entered, and which must have killed anybody but an Indian. Where did I hit you, he asked. Ugh, said I, you missed me. Oh, Bark then said, warrior, you killed me once, too. Look here, and he withdrew the hair from his right temple, and I saw that his cheek had been badly torn, and his ear was entirely missing. But he added, I did not die. You fought bravely that day. Had I gone among the Pawnees, the Sioux, or many other tribes that held this talk, I should have been hewn to pieces in a moment. But the Cheyenne were great braves themselves and admired the quality in others, the Crows being their only equal. While I sat talking thus, one of my men entered the village bearing two ten-gallon kegs of whiskey. He requested me to take one and sell it out. While he went to the other end of the village where the Sioux were encamped to sell the other, I had hitherto always opposed the sale of liquor to the Indians, and during my chieftainship of the Crows not one drop had ever been brought into the village. But now I was restrained by no such moral obligation. I was a mere trader hazarding my life among the savages to make money for my employers. The sale of liquor is one of the most profitable branches of a trader's business, and since the appetite for the vile potion has already been created, my personal influence in the matter was very slight. I was no longer in a position to prohibit the introduction of the white man's fire war. If I had refused to sell it to the Indians, plenty more traders would have furnished it to them, and my conscientious scruples would benefit the Indians none, and would deprive my embarrassed employer of a very considerable source of profit. Running these things hurriedly over in my mind, I took the pro and keg and dealt it all out within two hours. Certainly the rate of profit was high enough. If a man wants a good price for the sale of his soul to his satanic majesty, let him engage in the liquor business among the nations of the Rocky Mountains. Our liquor was a choice article, one pint of alcohol costing, I suppose, six cents, was manufactured into five times the quantity of whiskey, and this was retailed to our insatiate customers at the rate of one pint for each buffalo robe. If the robe was an extra fine one, I might possibly open my heart and give two pints, but I felt no particular inducement to liberality in my dealings, for I thought the greatest kindness I could show my customers 
was to withhold the commodity entirely. Before I got through with my keg, I had a row with an Indian which cost him his life on the spot. While I was busy intending the tap, a tall Sioux warrior came into my establishment, already the worst for liquor, which he had obtained elsewhere. He made some formidable strides around and near me, and then inquired for the crow. I was pointed out to him, and pot valiant, he swaggered up to me. You are a crow, he exclaimed. Yes. You are a great crow brave. Yes. You have killed a host of Sioux. No, I have killed a host of Cheyennes, but I have only killed fourteen Sioux with my own hand. Look at me, he said, with a drunken gasconade. My arm is strong. I am the greatest brave in the Sioux nation. Now come out, and I will kill you. No, I said, I did not come here to be killed or to kill. I came here to trade. I could kill you as easily as I could kill a squaw, but you know that you have a host of warriors here, while I am alone. They would kill me after I had killed you, but if I should come inside of your village with twenty of my crow warriors, you would all run and leave your lodges, women and children. Go away, I want nothing to do with you. Your tongue is strong, but you are no brave. I told the Cheyennes but a few moments previously that I had been among all the nations in the country, and that it had ever been my invariable rule, when struck by a red man, to kill him. I was determined to prove the truth of my declaration in this instant. I had my battle-axe hanging from my wrist, and I was ready at a moment's warning. The Sioux continued his abuse of me in his own tongue, which I paid no attention to, for I supposed that, like his white brethren, he might utter a great deal of provocation in his cups and straightway repent it when he became sober finally became so importunate that I saw it was time to take an active part. I said, You want to kill me, eh? I would fight with you, only I know I should be killed by the Sioux afterwards, and I should have you for my waiter in the spirit land. I would rather kill a good brave if I kill any. This was a very opprobious speech, for it is their faith that when an Indian is slain who has previous slain a foe, the first killed warrior becomes the waiter in the spirit land to the one who has laid him low. Indeed, it was more than he could endure. He jerked off the cloth that was fastened round his hip and stuck me in the face with it. I grasped my battle-axe, but the blow I aimed was arrested by a large pole, which impeded over his head and saved him from immediate death. The lodge pole was nearly severed by the blow. I raised my arm again, but, but it was restrained by the Cheyennes, who had been sitting round with their heads declined during the Sioux's previous abuse. The Sioux chief, Bull Bear, was standing near and was acquainted with the whole particulars of the difficulty. He advanced and chopped his warrior down, hanked him to pieces after he fell. Ugh, grunted he, as coolly as possible. You ought to have been killed long ago, you bad Indian. This demonstration on my part had a good effect. The Indians examined the cut inflicted by the edge of my axe on a large pole and declared mine a strong arm. They saw I was in earnest and would do what I had threatened, and except in one single instance I had no further trouble. Influenced by my persuasions, two hundred lodges of the Cheyenne started for the Platte bent to myself accompanying them. On our way thither, we met one of my wagons, loaded with goods, on its way to the north fork of the Platte. There was a forty-gallon cask of whiskey among its contents, and as the Indians insisted on having it opened, I brought it out of the wagon and broached it. Ben begged me not to touch it, but to wait till we reached the fort. I was there for the purpose of making money, and when a chance offered, it was my duty to make the most of it. On that he left me and went to the fort. I commenced dealing it out. Before it was half gone, I had realized sixteen horses and over two hundred robes. While I was busy in my traffic, the Indians brought in four trappers whom they had chanced to pick up. The poor fellow appeared half frightened to death, not knowing what their fate would be. I addressed them in English. How are you, boys? Where are you bound? These Indians must decide that, they replied. Are they good Indians? 
Yes, I replied, they will not harm you. They inform me that they were returning from the mountains with twelve packs of beaver, and while in camp one night the crows had stolen their horses. They had catched their peltry and now wanted to buy more horses to carry it to some fort. I made a bargain with them for their beaver, and, taking some horses, went with them myself to their late encampment, for I could not trust them alone for fear they would take their skins to some other post. We disinterred the peltry and with it reached the fort without accident. The trappers stayed with us two or three weeks, and then, purchasing their outfit and horses, they again started for the mountains. We had a prosperous fall and winter trade, and accumulated more peltry than our wagons could transport, and we had to build boats to convey it to St. Louis. At the settlement of accounts, it was found that we had clear sufficient to pay Mr. Sublet's debts and enough over to buy a handsome stock of goods for the next season's trade. I spent the summer at the fort while Sublet and Fitzpatrick went on with the peltry to St. Louis. I had but little to do, as the Indians had removed to their summer retreats, and I spent my time very agreeably with the few men remaining behind in hunting buffalo for our own use. About the last of August our goods arrived, and we set ourselves to work again at business. I put up at the north fork of the Platte, and had a busy fall and winter trade, making very profitable bargains for the company. The Cheyennes thought me the best trader that ever visited them, and would not allow any other company to traffic with their villages. This solely vexed by rival traders, and once or twice I had my life attempted in consequence. When others came to ask permission to open a trading post, the Cheyennes would say, No, we do all our trading with the crow. He will not cheat us. His whiskey is strong. When I found I had obtained the confidence of the nation, I told the Cheyennes that if they allowed other traders to come in, I should leave them, and they would be cheated by those who sold poor whiskey. That would not make them marry half so soon as mine. This may be considered selfish, but I knew that our company was keenly competed with by three or four rival companies, and the same representations that I used to keep the trade in my hands were freely urged by others to attract it from me. There was also a further inducement for the Cheyennes to do their business with me, which was founded upon their respect for me as a great brave who had killed a number of their countrymen. Whether there was diplomatic finesse enough in their minds to reflect that, while I was harmlessly engaged with them, I could not be fighting in the bands of their enemy, and added to my present number of scalps, I cannot pretend to sound. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 of the Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 31. Invitation to Visit the Outlaws. Interview with the Elk that Calls. Profitable Trade with the Outlaws. Return to the Post. Great Alarms Among the Traders. Five Horses Killed at the Fort. Flight from the Sioux. Safe Arrival at the Fort. Trade with the Arapahoes. Attacked by a Cheyenne warrior. Peace restored. While in the midst of my occupations, a messenger was dispatched to me by the chief of a Cheyenne village, at that time encamped about twenty miles distance, with an invitation to visit them and trade there. This village was composed of outlaws from all the surrounding tribes who were expelled from their various communities for sundry infractions of their rude criminal code. They had acquired a hard name for their cruelties and excesses, and many white traders were known to have been killed among them. The chief's name was Mohi Nistu, the elk that calls, and he was a terror to all white people in the region. The village numbered 300 lodges and could bring from 12 to 1,500 warriors into the field the best fighters of the nation. We called it the city of refuge. The messenger arrived at my post and inquired for the crow. I am the crow, I answered. 
The great chief, Mohi Nestu, wants the Crow to come to his lodge. What does he want with me? He wants to trade much. What does he want to trade? He wants much whiskey, much beads, much scarlet, much kettles, and he enumerated a list of articles. Have your people any robes? Buy them? Walk. They have so much robes that they cannot move without them. Any horses? Great many good crow horses. Well, said I, I will go straightway, and you must show me the way. Who will go to the village of the Elk of Calls, I asked. I want two men. Peterson and another volunteered to accompany me, but by this time the matter in hand had reached Sublet's ears, and he came forward and said, You are not going to the village of the outlaws, Beckworth. Yes, I replied, I am. Don't you know they kill whites there? Yes, I know that they have killed them. Well, I object to your going. Captain Sublet, I said, I have, I have promised the Indian that I will go, and go I must. There has been no trader there for a long time, and they are a rich prize. He saw that I was resolved, and, having given me the control of the affairs, he withdrew his objection and said no more. I accordingly prepared for the journey, ordering the horses. I packed up my goods together with twenty gallons of whiskey, and issued forth on my way to uncertain destruction, and bearing with me the means of destruction certain. The Indian conducted me to the chief's lodge. I dismounted, my two men following my example. The chief came to us and passed the usual compliments. He had desired me to take off my packs, at which request I immediately remounted my horse. What is the matter? inquired the chief. When I send for my friends to come and see me, I said, I never ask them to unpack their horses or to guard them, but I have it done for them. You are right, my friend, he said. It shall be done. Get off your horse and come into my lodge. I dismounted again, was about to follow him. My men, who did not understand our conversation, arrested my path to inquire what was in the wind. I bade them keep quiet, as all was amicable, and then entered the lodge. We held a long conversation together, during which the chief made many inquiries of a similar nature to those addressed me at the first village. In recounting our achievements, I found that I had stolen his horses, and that he had made reprisals upon the crows, so that we were about even in the horse trade. At length he wished me to broach the whiskey. No, said I, my friend, I will not open the whiskey until you send for your women to come with their robes, and they have brought what goods they want first. They work hard and dress all your robes. They deserve to trade first. They wish to buy many things to wear, so that your warriors may love them. When they have traded all they wish, then I will open my whiskey, and the men can get drunk. But if the men get drunk first, your women will be afraid of them, and they will take all the robes, and the women will get nothing. Your words are true, my friend, said the chief. Our women shall trade before the men get drunk. They dress all our robes. It shall be according to your words. Accordingly, he sent for all the women who had robes and wished to sell, to come and trade with the crows. They were not long in obeying the summons. Forward they came, some with one robe, some with two. Two was the most that any of them had, as the men had reserved the most to purchase whiskey. The trading was expeditiously effected. We did not have to take down and open all our goods, and then sell a skein of thread and be informed by our customer that she would look elsewhere first and perhaps call again, which is the practice of many young ladies, especially where there is an attractive shopman. We could hardly hand out things fast enough. We served all the women to their entire satisfaction and closed out our stock of dry goods. We then proceeded to the whiskey. Before opening the kegs, I laid down my rules to the chief. I told him that his people might spree as long as they chose, but they must not obstruct my business or interfere with me. As the liquor was served out to them, they must carry it out of the lodge and not stay to be in my way and give me trouble. This was readily asserted to, and the sales began. Whiskey will have the same effect everywhere, and if a man will traffic in the cursed stuff, he must submit to his share of the mischief he creates. 
My understanding with the chief was productive of no effect. He came into the lodge saying, I have killed an Indian. I looked and saw that his battle axe was dripping with blood. Yells and tumult increased outside. The chief was again making his way towards the lodge, protected by a host of friends, while behind him and striving to get at him was an infuriated throng, fighting and yelling like devils. My store in an instant was filled to overflowing with opposing parties, composed of outlaws from a dozen tribes. I sprang to secure my gun and my companions. Mistaking my movements, supposed I had started to run, and they broke out at the back of the lodge, and did not stop until they reached our post on the plat. Battle axes and knives fairly rung through the lodge during the continuance of the fight, but it was over in a few minutes, and they withdrew, to the place outside and renewed it to greater advantage at the restoration of peace some ghastly wounds were shown to me but singular to say none of the belligerents were killed mohi nestu after a short interval returned without having received a single scratch and said all was quiet again and that they wanted more whiskey the women wished to get some also he informed me he i knew that if the women were going to join in, I must have another supply, and I told the chief I had not enough left to get the women drunk. Send for more, then, said he. Our women are buried up and smothered with robes and will buy very much. I soon found a volunteer to run to the post to carry an order to sublet to send me twenty gallons more of whiskey. My assistants, after making their hasty exit from the back of the chief's lodge, reported at the post the state of affairs at the village of the outlaws at the time they left. Guns were being fired, they said, and beyond all that, Beckworth was killed. No one dared to go and ascertain the result. Sublet was in great trouble. I did my utmost to prevent his going, he consoled himself by saying, but he went in opposition to all orders and advice. So if he is killed, the responsibility does not rest upon me. By and by, my messenger arrived with the order for more whiskey. Sublet took the letter and read it. Ho, oh, said he, Jim is not dead yet. He has sent for more fire water. Who will take it to him? Four men volunteered for the errand and arrived with it the next day. The Indians took their horses away from them, and they became alarmed. But when they shortly after saw me up to my neck in buffalo robes, their fear subsided. These two kegs went off as actively as the preceding, and the robes fairly poured in. The whole village moved on towards the post, singing, dancing, and drinking, and when I had approached within five miles, I had to send for two kegs more. In short, the sixty gallons of wire water realized to the company over eleven hundred robes and eighteen horses, worth in St. Louis six thousand dollars. This trading whiskey for Indian property is one of the most infernal practices ever entered into by man. Let the reader sit down and figure up the profits on a forty-gallon cask of alcohol, and he will be thunderstruck or rather whiskey struck, when disposed of. Four gallons of water are added to each gallon of alcohol. In 200 gallons, there are 1,600 pints, for each one of which the trader gets a buffalo robe worth $5. The Indian women toil many long weeks to dress these 1,600 robes. The white trader gets them all for worse than nothing, for the poor Indian mother hides herself and her children in the forest until the effect of the poison passes away from her husband, fathers and brothers, who love them when they have no whiskey and abuse and kill them when they have. Six thousand dollars for sixty gallons of alcohol. Is it a wonder that with such profits in prospect, men get rich who are engaged in the fur trade, or is it a miracle that the poor buffalo are becoming gradually exterminated. Being killed with so little remorse, 
that their very hides among the indians themselves are known by the appellation of a pint of whisky the chief made me a gratuity of forty roads on two subsequent visits i paid him on his invitation he made me further presents until he had presented me with one hundred and eighty five roads without receiving any equivalent the extent of his royal munificence seriously alarmed sublet it was just the same profuse spirit he said that had bred disputes with other traders often resulting in their losing their lives it is as well a savage custom as civilized to expect a commiserate return for any favors bestowed and an indian is so punctilious in the observance of this etiquette that he will part with his last horse and his last blanket rather than receive a favor without requital me honestu without intending it was rather troublesome on this point when he became sober after these drunken carousals he would begin to reflect seriously on things he would find his robes all gone his women's labor for it would take months of toil in dressing and ornamenting these robes thrown unprofitably away his people had nothing to show for their late pile of wealth and their wants would remain unsupplied they would have no guns or ammunition to fight the crows who were always well supplied and their whole year earnings were squandered these reflections would naturally make him discontented and irritable and he would betake himself to the post reparations white man he would say i have given you my robes which my warriors have spent months in hunting which my women enslaved a whole year in dressing and what do you give me in return i have nothing you give me fire water which makes me and my people mad and it is gone and we have nothing to hunt more buffalo with and to fight our enemies the generality of traders will endeavor to make it apparent to him that there was a fair exchange of commodities effected and that he had the worth of his wares and they can do no more for him this anchored him and in his disappointment and vexation he would raise the war hoop his warriors would rush to him he would harangue them for a moment an assault would be made upon the trading post the goods would be seized and in many instances the trader would be massacred and scalped i saw the necessary relation between all these events and knew that simple justice at exchanges would avoid all such catastrophes i therefore told sublet to feel no uneasiness as i could arrange matters so as to afford a general satisfaction well he said go your own way to destruction a day or two after this sublet came to inform me that mohinestu was on his way to the fort i looked out and saw the chief and his wife both approaching on horseback as he entered i received him with great ceremony taking him by the hand and bidding him welcome to the fort i had his horse well attended to a sumptuous supper for himself and his wife served up and while the meal was preparing entertained him with liquors fit to make any toper's mouth water after supper he got gloriously fuddled and went to bed ignorant of what was passing in the world around him in the morning i inquired of him how he felt wug much bad head ache strong i then gave him another whiskey punch well flavored with spices he and his lady drank deeply and then partook of a hearty breakfast he then felt well again i next led him into the store where we had a large assortment of every indian novelty i knew we had children as well as how many so i selected a five-striped hudson bay blanket for himself another for his wife and one for each of his children beside an extra scarlet blanket for his eldest son a young warrior to his wife i also gave a two-gallon brass kettle and beads enough to last her for a year or two in fact i selected more or less of every description of article that i thought would be useful to them or that i thought an indian eye could covert these presents i ceremoniously laid upon the counter until i had two or three large piles of quite attractive-looking goods 
The chief and his wife had watched me laying all these goods before there. I then asked them if they saw anything more anywhere in the store that they thought they would like. Mihonestu opened his eyes wide with surprise. What? he explained. Are all those things for us? Yes, I said. They are for you, your wife, and your children. Something for you all. When I have a friend, I like to be liberal in my gifts to him. I never rob the red men. I never take all their robes and give them nothing but whiskey. I give them something good for themselves, their wives and their children. My heart is big. I know what the wed red want and what their families want. My friend, your heart is too big. You give me much more than I ever had before. You will be very poor. No, I said. I have many things here, all mine. I am rich. When I find a good friend, I make him rich like me. I then bade him look the store carefully through to see if there was anything more than he would like. He looked, but saw nothing more than he needed. I then made the same request of his wife, whose satisfaction beamed all over her face. But she, too, was fully supplied. I then stepped into another room and returned with a fine new gun with a hundred rounds of ammunition and a new, highly finished, silver-mounted battle-axe. This was the Comble de Bienfaites. I thought he would not recover from the shock. He took the battle-axe in his hand and examined it minutely, his face distorted with a broad grin all the while. Huge, said he, you give me much too much. You, I gave you no robes, but you have proved that you are my friend. When they were ready to start, there was an extra horse for him and a fine mare for his wife, ready waiting at the door. There, my friend, said I, is a good horse for you. He is swift to run the buffalo. Here is a fine mare for you, I said to his wife. Indian women love to raise handsome colts. I gave her to you, and you must not let the crows steal her from you. She displayed every tooth in her head in token of her satisfaction, and she mounted to return home. The chief said as he left, I am going on a war party, and then to kill buffalo. I will come back again in a few moons. I will then come and see you, and I will kill you. I will crush you to death with robes. And away they went, never better satisfied in their lives. Now is it to be supposed that the company lost anything by this liberality? That chief, whose hands were stained with the blood of so many traitors, would have defended my life till the last gasp. While I was in his country, no other trader could have bartered a plug of tobacco with him or his people. The company still derived great profits from his trade. Beside the immense returns derived from my transactions with the village, I cleared over five hundred dollars from my exchanges with the chief alone, after the full value of my munificent presents had been deducted. One day the Cheyenne dog soldiers were to have a dance and count their coups. I called all the crows who were in the band and asked them if the regulations would admit of my joining in the dance. Certainly, they said, nothing will please them more. They will then believe that you have joined them. Accordingly, I painted myself, put on a uniform, including a chief's coat, now new from the shelves, and painted my white leggings with stripes, donating a great number of coups. When ready, I walked towards them as great a man as any. On seeing me approach, there was a general inquiry. Who is that? Where did he come from? When the ceremonies commenced, I joined in and danced as hard as any of them. The drum at last sounded to announce the time to begin to count. I stepped forward first and began. Cheyennes, do you remember that you had a warrior killed at such a place wearing such and such marks of distinction? Yes, we know it. I killed him. He was a great brave. There was a tap on the drum and one coup was counted. I proceeded until I had counted my five coups, which is the limited number between the dances. Next in turn, the bobtailed horse counted his five on the crows, and to his various allusions, I assented with the customary I remember. This betrayed who I was, and they were delighted to see one of the dog soldiers of the crows 
joined their band. The bobtailed horse made me a valuable present, and I returned to the fort with six splendid war horses and, and thirty fine robes presented to me at that dance. As my initiation gifts were bounty money, I suppose, for joining their army. I was then a dog soldier in the picked troop of the Cheyennes, compelled to defend the village against every enemy until I died like Macbeth with harness on his back. The Crows had been informed by sundry persons in the employ of the American Fur Company that I had joined their inveterate enemies. They were satisfied with my proceedings. The medicine calf is a cunning chief, they said. He best knows how to act. He has joined the Cheyennes to learn all about their numbers, the routes of their villages, and so forth. When he has learned all that he wants, he will return to us, and then we can fight the Cheyenne to greater advantage. I was now in my second winter with Sublet in the Cheyenne and Sioux country. He had succeeded far beyond his expectation, and he still continued to make money by thousands. We had curtailed the number of subposts and thereby materially reduced his expenses. Indeed, they were now less than half of what they were the preceding winter. Leaving sublets, I went down to the South Platte, distant 150 miles, and indulged in a short rest, till I heard that the Cheyennes of the Arkansas, those that I first visited, were about to make their spring trade, and I went over to meet them and bring them to our fort. I found them, all appeared to be glad to see me, and they returned with me. In crossing the divide or ridge between the two rivers, our spies in advance discovered a party of Pawnees, and a charge was immediately made upon them. We only killed three of the enemy. I countered a coup by capturing a rifle. The victim who abandoned it had already been killed. While we engaged the enemy, the village went into camp, and I proposed to my fellow warriors to return to the village after the manner of the crows, which was agreed to. There were several in the party, so we could easily raise a good crow song, and the Cheyenne warriors could join in. We struck up merrily and advanced towards the village. As soon as the women heard our voices, they ran out to see who was coming. There were several captive crows among the Cheyenne who, I suppose, had lived among them ever since I had been sold to the whites. These recognized our stave and exclaimed, Those are crows coming. We know their song. This brought out the whole village who stood waiting our arrival in surprise and wonderment. As we drew near, however, they distinguished me in the party, and the mystery was solved. The crow is with the Cheyennes. We performed all kinds of antics, made a circuit round the village, going through evolutions and performances which the Cheyennes had never before seen, but with which they were so highly pleased that they adopted the dance into the celebrations of their nation. That night, the scalp dance was performed, which I took part in as a great man as any. I sung the crow song to the especial admiration of the fair sex. The next morning we resumed our journey to the fort, which we reached after three days' travel. The village had brought a great number of robes, together with some beaver, and a great trade was opened with them. At this time I had a difficulty with a Cheyenne the only one I ever had with any of the tribe. I was eating dinner one day when a great brave came in and demanded whiskey. I repaired to the store with him to supply his want when I found he had no robes to pay for it and was, beside, intoxicated. I refused to give him the whiskey, telling him he must first go and bring a robe. This probably aggravated him, and he made a sudden cut at me with his sword, which I very fortunately dodged, and before he could raise his weapon again, I had him between my feet on the ground, and I had left my battle axe on my seat at the table, and I called out for someone to bring it to me, but no one came with it. I at length released him, and he went whooping away to obtain his gun to shoot the crow. I sized my own and waited for him at the door while all the inmates of the fort begged of me not to shoot him. 
after some little delay he appeared gun in hand but three cheyenne warriors interfered to stop him and he returned into his lodge the day following he sent for sublet and myself to go and dine with him and we went accordingly sublet was apprehensive of mischief from my visit and endowed and endeavored to dissuade me from going but i foresaw no danger and knew further that it would be a cause of offence to the indian to neglect his invitation when we entered his lodge he was glad to see us and bade me to be seated on a pile of robes i sat down as desired and our host after holding a short conversation with sublet turned to me and spoke as follows o oh, tunny crow i was a fool yesterday you spared my life i do not want you to be angry with me because i am not angry with you i was drunk i had drunk too much of your whiskey and it made my heart black i did not know what i was doing very well said i i am not angry with you when you attempted to kill me i was angry and if my battle axe had been in my hand i should have killed you you are alive and i am glad of it take those robes he rejoined and hereafter you shall be my brother and i will be your brother these robes will make your heart right and we will quarrel no more i took the robes with me ten in number and found my heart perfectly mollified messrs sublent and vasque having realized immense profit during their three years of partnership disposed of all their interest and effects in the rocky mountain fur business and returned to st louis this threw me entirely out of business when messrs bent and saverin wished to engage me in their employ after some negotiation with them i concluded a bargain and, in, and entered into their service in the latter part of the summer of eighteen forty we immediately proceeded to establish subposts in various directions and i repaired to laramie fort as soon as it was known among the indians that the crow was trading at bent's post they came flocking in with their robes old smoke the head of the head chief of another band of outlaws known as smoke's band claimed by no particular nation or tribe visited me with his village and commenced a great spree i gave them a grand entertainment which seemed to tickle their taste highly they kept up their carousal until they had parted with two thousand robes but had no more remaining they then demanded whiskey and i refused it no trust the motto we see inscribed in every low drinking saloon in st louis is equally our system in dealing with the indians they became infuriated at my refusal and clamoured and threatened if i persisted i knew it was no use to give way so i adhered to my resolution thereupon they commenced firing upon the store and showered the bullets through every assailable point the windows were shot entirely out and the assailants swore vengeance against the crow according to their talk i had my choice either to die or give them whiskey to drink i had but one man with me at the store there had been several canadians in the fort but on the first alarm they ran to their houses which was built around the fort within the pickets to obtain their guns but on the indians informing them that they would not hurt them that it was only the crow they were after the canadians stayed within doors and abandoned me to my fate i and my companion sat down with our rifles ready cocked well prepared to defend the entrance to the fort we had plenty of guns in hand ready loaded and there must a few have fallen before they passed the gate at dusk i closed the door and we lay upon our arms all night the indians kept up a great tumult and pother but attempted nothing messrs bent and severine arrived in the morning and wanted to be informed of the cause of the disturbance i acquainted them and they approved my conduct they were astonished at my immense pile of robes and applauded my fortitude when the outlaws became sobered they expressed contrition for what they had done and charged their excesses upon john barleycorn which plea i admitted at the same time it appeared quite inconsistent that i who was that celebrated gentleman's high priest should be set upon and almost murdered by his devotees 
nothing noteworthy occurred until the following january when the indians being again on a spree once more attempted my life i fled to a post in the arapaho country in charge of mr alex warfeld now a colonel in the army he resigned the post to me and took my place at bent's post i had but little trouble with the indians here cut nose an old brave who it seems had been in the habit of obtaining his drams of warfield gratis expected to be supplied by me on the same terms i had resisted this invasion and seriously ruffled the feathers of the old chief thereby he left at my refusal and did not return again that day during the ensuing night the pawnees came and stole both his horse and mine the old man raised the party went in pursuit recaptured all the horses took two scalps and returned in high spirits he visited the store and informed me what he had done well said i that is because i gave you no drink yesterday if i had given you whiskey you would have drunk too much been sick this morning in consequence then you would not have been able to pursue the pawnees and you would have lost your horses however i gave him some whiskey then in honor of his achievements this as i had expected pleased the old fellow when he restored me my horses and charged me nothing for their recapture as soon as the spring trade was over i abandoned that post and returned to the arkansas Saverin desired me to go and see if i could open a trade with a village of arapahoes which he had heard were encamped at forty miles distance i accordingly started in their direction accompanied by two men we journeyed on until we had arrived within a short distance of the village when we discovered on our road a band of three or four hundred travelling indians i saw that they were comanches and i bade the two men to run for their lives as i knew the comanches would kill them i directed them to the arapaho village and bade them shout their loudest when they came in sight of it they left me and ascended a slight eminence a little distance in advance and then shouting to the extent of their lungs they put their horses down at the best speed i rode up after them and telegraphed with my blanket to the village to have them come quickly they abide they obeyed my motions and fell in with the comanches on the way to me the two tribes proved to be friends and my companions were safe on arriving at the village i found abundance of robes and opened a very successful trade with the people this finished i returned to the fort and assisted the other employees in loading the wagon for their trip to st louis end of chapter thirty one Chapter thirty two of The Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter thirty two First Trip to New Mexico. Return to the Indians with Goods. Success in Trade. Enter into Business in St. Fernandez. Got Married. Return to the Indians. The fortunate peculation proceed to California with goods. I had now accumulated a considerable sum of money and thought I might as well put it to some use for my own profit as risk my life in the service of others while they derived the lion's share for my industry. It was now about three years since I had left St. Louis on my present excursion and i began to weary of the monotony of my life i was within five days journey of new mexico and i determined upon going to take a look at the northern portion of this unbounded territory i had but one man with me named charles town when i started upon my new exploration on our road thither we passed near to a utah village and two or three of their warriors presented themselves before us to hold a parley while the chief sat down on a log close by. They said, as we reined in our horses for a moment, you make our paths bad by coming into our country. You will go back and tell the Cheyennes and Arapahoes where we are. They will then come and kill us and steal our horses. 
Come here. Our chief wants to see you. This was spoken in tolerably good Spanish. Come on, said I, addressing my companion. Let us not be annoyed by these trifling Indians. And I urged my horse against the Indian spokesman, knocking him into the dirt. He arose exclaiming, Woof! Shawnee! We then rode on without further molestation. They evidently mistaken me for a Shawnee. They had robbed several white men, and after beating them savagely, had liberated them. I had no matter of fear of them, for I knew them to be a great cowards. With one hundred and fifty good crow warriors, I would have chased a thousand of them. We passed on into St. Fernandez, and found quite a number of American traders there, established in a business and supplying both mountaineers and Indians with goods. Here I encountered an old acquaintance named Lee, with whom I entered into partnership. We purchased one hundred gallons of alcohol and a stock of fancy articles to return to the Indian country and trade for robes and other peltry. We visited the Cheyennes on the south fork of the Platte. We passed Bent's Fort on our way thither. He hailed us and inquired where we were going. I informed him that we were on our way to the Cheyenne village. He, pray, he begged me not to go, as I value my safety. It was only the day previous, he said, that he had traded them and bought eighteen horses from their village. They came the next morning and took them forcibly back and threatened him with their guns. If he said a word against their proceedings, I replied to him that I anticipated no danger and left him to pass on to their village. The Indians were delighted at my arrival. I had heard that the whooping cough was very prevalent, prevalent among the children, and as we happened to have several baskets of corn and beans and a large quantity of dried pumpkins, we could not have come at a more opportune moment. I told the Indians, in answer to their welcome, that I had come back to see there because I had heard their children were all sick. I called attention to my stock of vegetables as coolants as being best adapted for food for their children and the best calculated to restore them to health. Besides, I added, I brought a little whiskey along to put good life into your hearts. They were then in their sobered feelings, which will return to them after their carousels, and which present so dangerous a time to the trader. Their horses were all away, their robes were gone, they had nothing to show in return for them. Their children were sick and dying, their wives mourning and half distracted, and they could obtain nothing at the fort to alleviate their sufferings. I could understand the whole corollary of incidents, like their intemperate white brethren, who will occasionally review matters after a prolonged spree, and who will see the effects of dissipation in their desolate homes, their heartbroken wives, their ragged and starving children. What are their feelings at such contemplation? Unquestionably hostility against the cause of their destitution, whether they recognized it in themselves, the willing instruments or the liquor that infatuated them, or the dealer that supplied it to them. The Indians seem to have one circle of reasoning and invariably vent their spleen upon the trader. It was this reactionary feeling that had led the Indians to recover by force of arms the horses they had parted with previously. I knew better how to manage them. I deposited my goods at Old Bark's Lodge, who felt highly honored with the trust. The villagers collected round, and a dispute arose among them whether the whiskey should be broached or not. Porcupine Bear objected, and Bobtail Horse, his brother-in-law, strongly advocated my opening the kegs. This led to a warm altercation between the two warriors, until the disputed question was to be decided by the abotrement of battle. They both left the lodge to prepare for the combat, and returned in a few minutes fully armed and equipped. Porcupine Bear argued his cause in the following strain. Cheyennes, look at me, and listen well to my words. I am now about to fight my brother. I shall fight him, and shall kill him if I can. In doing this, I do not fight my brother, but I fight the greatest enemy of my people. 
Once we were a great and powerful nation. Our hearts were proud, our arms were strong. But a few winters ago, all other tribes feared us. Now the Pawnees dared across our hunting grounds and kill our buffalo. Once we could beat the crows and unaided destroy their villages. Now we call other villages to our assistance, and we cannot defend ourselves from the assault of the enemy. How is this, Cheyennes? The crows drink no whiskey. The earnings of their hunters and toils of their women are bartered to the white man for weapons and ammunition. This keeps them powerful and dreaded by their enemies. We kill buffalo by the thousands. Our women's hands are sore with dressing the robes, and what do we part with them to the white trader for? We pay them for the white man's fire water, which turns our brains upside down, which makes our hearts black and renders our arms weak. It takes away our warrior's skills, makes them shoot wrong in battle. Our enemies who drink no whiskey, when they shoot, always kill their foe. We have no ammunition to encounter our foes, and we have become as dogs, which have nothing but their teeth. Our prairies were once again covered with horses as the trees were covered with leaves. Where are they now? asked the crows, who drink no whiskey. When we are all drunk, they come and take them from before our eyes. Our legs are helpless, and we cannot follow them. We are only fearful to our women, take up their children and conceal themselves among the rocks and in the forests, for we are wolves in our lodges. We growl at them like bears when they are famishing. Our children are not sick. Our women are weak with watching. Let us not scare them away from our lodges with their sick children in their arms. The great spirit will be offended at it. I had rather go to the great and happy hunting ground now than live and see the downfall of my nation. Our fires begin to burn dim and will soon go out entirely. Many people are becoming like the Pawnees. They buy the whiskey of the trader, and because he is weak and not able to fight them, they go and steal from his lodge. I say, let us buy of the crow what is useful and good, but his whiskey we will not touch. Let him take that away with him. I have spoken all I have to say, and if my brother wishes to kill me for it, I am ready to die. I will go and sit with my fathers in the spirit land, where I shall soon point down to the last expiring fire of the Cheyennes, and when they inquire the cause of this decline of their people, I will tell them with a straight tongue that it was the fire water of the trader that put it out. Old Bark then advanced between the two belligerents and thus spoke, Cheyennes, I am your great chief, and you know me. My word of this day shall be obeyed. The crow has come among us again and has brought us good things that we need. He has brought us a little whiskey. He is poor, while we are yet strong, and we will buy all he has brought with him. This day we will drink. It will make us merry and feel good to one another. We will all drink this once, but we will not act like fools. We will not quarrel and fight and frighten our women and children. Now, as warriors... Give me your weapons. This fiat admitted no appeal. It was law and gospel to his people. Disobedience to his command subjected the offender to immediate death at the hands of the dog soldiers. The warriors delivered up their battle axes, and the old chief handed them to me. Crow, he said he, take these weapons that I have taken from my two children. Keep them until we have drunk up your whiskey and... And let no one have them till I bid you. Now, Crow, we are ready. Slim face and gray head, two dog soldiers then harangued the village and desired all who wished to trade to come and bring their robes and horses to Old Bark's lodge. And to remember that they were trading with the honest Crow and not with the white man and that what they paid him was his. They answered the summons in flocks. The women first, according to my established rule, my corn, beans, and pumpkins exhaled like the dew, and I received in exchange their beautiful fancy robes. The women served. The men next came in for whiskey. I sold on credit to some. 
When one wanted thus to deal, he would tell me what kind of a horse a mule he had. I would appeal to Old Bark for confirmation of the statement. If he verified it, I served the liquor. They all got drunk. Porcupine Bear, the temperance orator, with the rest, but there was not a single fight all passed off harmoniously. I received over four hundred splendid robes, beside moccasins and fancy articles. When I was ready to leave, thirty-eight horses and mules, a number corresponding to what I had marked, were brought forward. I packed up my peltry and sent my partner on in advance with everything except the horse I rode, telling him I would overtake him shortly. I had reserved a five-gallon keg of whiskey unknown to all, and when about to start, I produced it and presented it to the crowd. They were charmed and insisted on making me a return. They brought me over forty of their finest robes, such as the young squaws finished with immense labor to present to their lovers. Old Bark gave me a good mule to pack them, and another chief gave me a second. I then took my leave, promising to return by leaf fall. When I passed Ben to this post, he was perfectly confounded. He had seen one train pass belonging to me, and now I was conducting another when at the same time he had supposed that there was not a robe in the village. Beckworth, said he, how you manage Indians as you do beats my understanding. I told him that it was easily accounted for, that the Indians knew that the whites cheated them, and knew that they could believe what I said. Beside that, they naturally felt superior in confidence in me on account of my supposed affinity of race. I had lived so much among them, I could enter into their feelings and be in every respect one of themselves. This was an inducement which no acknowledged white trader could ever hope to hold out. I rode on and overtook my partner in advance. He had had an adventure. A party of Cheyennes, led by a chief named Three Crows, had met him and rifled him of a three-gallon keg of whiskey, which we had reserved for our own use on our way to St. Fernandez. The chief stopped him and said, I smell whiskey, and we must have some. My partner told him that he had none. Whoa, my nose don't lie. But your tongue does. I smell it strong, and if you do not hand it out, we shall unpack all your horses and find it. Well, said the man, I have a little, but it belongs to the crow, and he wants it himself. Give it to me, said the chief, and tell him that three crows took it. There was no alternative, and he gave him the keg. They carried it along until they came to a creek, where they sat down and had a jollification. I passed them while they were in the midst of it, but did not see them, although they saw me. When I met the chief some time subsequently and charged them with the larceny, he gave me ten robes and a good host to compound the felony. We shot several buffalo on our way, enough to load all our horses with meat and tallow. We exchanged our effects in Santa Fe for goods, and carried them to San Fernando, a distance of 60 miles. Here we established a store as our headquarters for the Indian trade, where I resided some time, living very fast and happily, according to the manner of the inhabitants. Among other doings, I got married to Senorita Luis Sandoval. In the fall, I returned to the Indian country, taking my wife with me. We reached the Arkansas about the 1st of October, 1842, where I erected a trading post and opened a successful business. In a very short time, I was joined by from 15 to 20 free trappers with their families. We all united our labors and constructed an adobe fort 60 yards square. By the following spring, we had grown into quite a little settlement, and we gave it the name of Pueblo. Many of the company devoted themselves to agriculture and raised very good crops the first season, such as wheat, corn, oats, potatoes, and abundance of almost all kinds of vegetables. When the spring trade was over, I sent all my peltry to independence and brought with the proceeds $3,000 worth of articles 
suitable for the trade in new mexico but on the arrival of the goods the whole country was in a ferment on account of colonel cook's expedition from texas which resulted so disastrously for the parties concerned this affected the minds of the new mexicans unfavorably for my interest inasmuch as their former preference for united states novelties was now turned into strong repugnance for everything american i therefore could obtain no sale for my goods and determined to return to my indian friends i bought a load of whiskey to trade for a horse to pack my goods to california where i intended removing i succeeded in my adventure and obtained forty horses and mules upon which i packed my merchandise quickly find myself on the way to the golden state i started with fifteen men three of whom were mexican when i reached the utah country i found that the indians were waging exterminating war upon the mexicans but i did not learn it in time to save the lives of my three unhappy followers who lagging too far in the rear were set upon by the Indians and slain. In passing through their country, I did considerable trading, exchanging my merchandise for elk, deer, and antelope skins, very beautifully dressed. I arrived in Pueblo de Angeles, California, in January 1844. There I indulged in my new passion for trade and did a very profitable business for several months. At the breaking out of the revolution in 1845, I took an active part against the mother country, of which I will furnish some details in my next chapter. End of chapter 32「trial and subsequent release the upper californians on account of the great distance from the mexican government had long enjoyed the forms of an independent principality although recognizing themselves as a portion of the mexican republic they had for years past had the election of their own officers their governor inclusive and enjoyed comparatively immunity from taxes and other political vexations under this abandonment the inhabitants lived prosperous and contented their hills and prairies were literally were literally swarming with cattle immense numbers of these were slaughtered annually for their hides and tallow and as they had no armies of liberation to support and no costly government to maintain an extravagance they passed their lives in a state of contentment every man sitting under his own vine and his own fig tree Two years prior to my arrival, all this had been changed. President Santa Anna had appointed one of his creatures, Turihan, governor. With absolute and tyrannical power, he arrived with an army of bandits to subject the defenseless inhabitants to every wrong that a debasing tyranny so readily indulges in. Heavy taxes were imposed for the support of the home government, and troops were quartered to the great annoyance and cost of the honest people. The lives of the inhabitants were continually in danger from three excesses of the worthless vagabonds who had been forced upon them. Their property was rifled before their eyes, their daughters were ravished in their presence or carried forcibly to the filthy barracks. The people's patience became at length exhausted, and they determined to die rather than submit to such inflictions. But they were ignorant how to shake off the yoke. They were unaccustomed to war and knew nothing about political organization. However, Providence finally raised up a man for the purpose. 
General Jose Castro, who had filled the office of commander under the former system, but had been forced to retire into privacy at the inauguration of the Reign of Terror. He stepped boldly forth and declared to the people his readiness to lead them to the warfare that should deliver their country from the scourge that afflicted them. He called upon them to second his exertions, and never desert his banner until California were purified of her present pollution. His patriotic appeal was responded to by all ranks. Hundreds flocked to his standard. The young and the old left their ranches and their cattle grounds and rallied round their well-tried chief. There was at that time quite a number of Americans in the country, and according to their interest and predilections, they ranged themselves upon opposite sides. Our present worthy and much respected citizen, General Sutter, was at that time, if I mistake not, a colonel in the forces of, in the central government, and at the outbreak of the revolution, he drew his sword for Santa Ana, and entered into active service against the rebels in Pueblo de Angeles. There was an American, long resident in a country named J. Rowland, who sought my cooperation in the popular cause. He said that every American who could use a rifle was a host against the invaders, and besought me to arm in defense and to influence my men likewise to espouse the cause. I replied to his solicitations by promising him my active cooperation, and also that I would represent his argument to the men living with me. Accordingly, I informed my people that I intended to shoulder my rifle in the defense of life and property, and they were unanimous in their resolution to accompany me. Hence, there were thirteen riflemen instead of one. We shortly after received an accession of sixty more good frontiersmen and mustered ourselves for service. The company elected me captain, but I declined the office. Mr. Bell finally assumed the command with the promise of my unflinching support in extremities. Our company steadily increased in number until we had 160 men, including native Californians, who joined us with rifles. General Castro's first movement was against Pueblo. He entered the place at the head of his forces and took the fort, arsenal, with all the government arms, ammunition, and stores, with the slight loss of one officer wounded. This enabled the rebels to arm themselves, and he was shortly at the head of a small but well-appointed army. The general highly extolled the rifle battalion, and he looked upon it as a powerful support. Castro then took a detachment of rebel troops and proceeded northward to reconnoiter the enemy's position. Our main body, also moving in the direction of the enemy as far as Monterey, where were the governor's headquarters. On first hearing the intelligence of the outbreak, the governor had put his forces in motion and issued orders to shoot the rebels when wherever met and destroy their property of whatever kind. General Castro, having proceeded as far as Santa Barbara, a distance of 96 miles, and having obtained full information concerning the movements of the governor, returned and joined the main body. During his expedition, he captured five Americans in the Mexican service. He disarmed them, telling them that he had no disposition to injure Americans, and that he would return their arms as soon as he had expelled the enemies of the people. Our forces were concentrated in a large open prairie, the enemy being stationed at no great distance likewise on the prairie. I ascended one morning the summit of a mountain, which would afford me a fair view of the enemy's camp, just to discover their numbers and strength of position. On my road... I encountered two Americans who were serving in the capacity of spies to the enemy. I accosted them and expressed surprise to see them in the service of such an old rascal as Torrijon, and recommended them to join the popular cause. But they seemed to have an eye to the promised booty of the rebels, and my arguments could not influence them. I dispatched one of them with a letter to Grant, 
an American who held the commission of captain in the governor's army, offering him, as we did not wish to fight against our American brethren, to withdraw all the Americans from the rebel ranks. If he would do the same on the side of the governor and leave the Mexicans and Californians, who were most interested in the issue, to measure their strength. Some Germans who were with us also made the same proposal to Colonel Sutter. Our messenger conveyed the dispatches and delivered the German's letter to Colonel Sutter, who read both that and our letter to Captain Gant. He returned for answer that, unless the Americans withdrew from the insurgent army immediately, he would shoot us every one by ten o'clock the next morning. This embittered us the more against the barbarity of the opposing power and we resolved to make their leaders, not excepting Setter, feel the effect of our rifle as soon as they placed themselves within range. On the following morning, a weak and ineffective cannonade commenced on both sides. We lay low, awaiting the enemy's charge. As their riflemen had shown themselves, and we were desirous to obtain a sight of them, myself with seven or eight others advanced cautiously in search of them. On our way we discovered a small cannon, which the enemy had loaded and was about to discharge upon our ranks. Had there been a gunner among them, it must have done us great injury. We advanced within a few yards of the piece, and had raised ourselves up to shoot the artillery men, when one of our party arrested our aim by suddenly exclaiming, Don't shoot! Don't shoot! He then pointed out the enemy's riflemen, carefully emerging from a hollow, with the intention of stealing upon our flank, and saluting us with a volley of lead. I lay down my rifle, and hailed them to halt. I recognized a number of the mountaineers, among them with some of whom I had intimate, intimate acquaintance, and I urged them to adopt the cause of the people, for the side they had now espoused was one no American should be seen to defend. They heard me throw, and all, or nearly all the Americans were persuaded by my arguments and returned with me to join our battalion. This assured us of victory. The cannonade was perfectly harmless. Some of the balls passed 300 feet over our heads. Others plowed up the prairie as near to their ranks as ours. All the damage we received was one wagon shivered to pieces and a horse killed under Colonel Price, which animal had been captured by us at Pueblo and was now serving in the rebel forces with the same rank he had held under government. The desertion of the riflemen seriously affected the enemy's prospects of, desert, of victory. Ten o'clock had passed, and Colonel Sutter had not put his threat into execution. The enemy finally retired from the field and marched in the direction of Pueblo. I took a party and ascended a mountain to encamp. While thus employed, a courier sent from our commander brought us orders to return immediately. We instantly obeyed and found the army gone, with only one man remaining to direct our steps. On coming up with our forces, we found that our colonel had made a movement which cut off all retreat from the enemy, and which must bring him to an engagement or an unconditional surrender. In the morning, I again took a party with me and mounted an eminence to reconnoiter the enemy's position. We approached within 500 yards of their camp, where we shot a bullock, which we quietly proceeded to dress. While we were thus engaged, I perceived an officer approaching from the enemy's camp to ascertain who we were. I took my rifle and dodged among the bushes, eager to get a shot at him. But before I do so, one of my men prematurely fired and missed his mark. The officer had dismounted in order to get a nearer view of us, and this admonitory shot warned him back into camp. Myself and another advanced to within fifty rods of it and boldly seized the officer's horse, and they did not fire a shot at us. 
We saw their camp was hemmed in on all sides. Our artillery was placed in battery, matches lighted, and men in position. All was ready for action. The enemy, perceiving their desperate condition, sent a flag of truth for a negotiation. Articles of capitulation were eventually drawn up and signed to the effect that the governor and his forces should immediately lay down their arms and leave for Acapulco as soon as their embarkation could be accomplished. Accordingly, they laid down their arms and marched under escort to the Embaradara, distant twenty miles from Pueblo. The governor was not permitted to return to Monterey, but his lady was sent for to the Embaradara, where she joined her husband and they quit the country together. Colonel Sutter, on the day of the embarkation, left his detachment of naked Indians with the army and proceeded, as we suppose, to his fort on the Sacramento. But he returned the next day and gave himself up to us. His force of Indians were very well drilled, but would have been far better employed in raising cabbages on his farm than in facing riflemen on the battlefield. A trial was held upon the colonel, which resulted in his full acquittal with the restoration of all his property fallen into our hands, such as cannon and other military effects, by the surrender of the government forces. The Americans in jest probably seemed very desirous to have the prisoner shot, which produced great alarm in his mind and recalled to his recollection his recent threat to shoot all the Americans in our army. Our countrymen were almost carried on the shoulders of the Californians in gratitude for their participation in the revolution, for although the victory had been a bloodless one, they attributed their easy won success to the dread inspired by the name of their American Confederates. After seeing the departure of the government troops, the rebel army returned to Pueblo, where they elected Colonel Pico governor. Colonel, now General Castro, commander of the forces and filled other less important offices. Fandangos, which were continued for a week, celebrated our success, and these festivities over, the insurgents returned to their various homes and occupations. Some few weeks after, a small proportion of the inhabitants sought to displace our newly elected chief magistrate and appoint some other in his place. I was sent for during the night to guard the governor's palace with my corps of rifles, and we succeeded in capturing the leading conspirators who were tried and sent to Acapulco in irons. I had a quarrel with the alcalde shortly after this service, and he put me in irons for cursing him. As soon as the governor heard of my misfortune, he had me immediately discharged from confinement. I now resumed my business and dispatched my partner, Mr. Waters, after a fresh supply of goods. But before he had time to return, fresh political commotions supervened. There, were, there still seemed to exist in the minds of the majority a strong hankering for the domination of Mexico, notwithstanding they had so recently sided with the revolutionists in shaking off the yokes of the national government. Among other causes of excitement, too, the American adventurers resident there had raised the bear flag and proclaimed their intention of establishing an independent government of their own. This caused us to be closely watched by the authorities, and matters seemed to be growing too warm to be pleasant. In the midst of this gathering ferment, news reached us from Mazatlan of the declaration of war between the United States and Mexico and I deemed it was fully time to leave. Colonel Fremont was at that juncture approaching from Oregon with a force, if combined with the Americans resident there, sufficient to conquer the whole country, and I would have liked exceedingly to join his forces, but to have proceeded towards him would have subjected me to mistrust and consequent capture and imprisonment. If I look south, the same difficulties menaced me, and the west conducted me to the Pacific Ocean. I had but little time to deliberate. My people was at war with the country I was living in. I had become security to the authorities for the good behavior of several of my federal countrymen, and I was under recognizance for my conduct. The least misadventure would compromise me, and 
I was impatient to get away. My only retreat was eastward, so considering all things fair in time of war, I, together with five trusty Americans, collected 1,800 stray horses we found roaming on the Californian ranchos and started with our utmost speed from Pueblo de Angeles. This was a fair capture, and our morals justified it, for it was wartime. We knew we should be pursued, and we lost no time in making our way toward home. We kept our herd jogging for five days and nights, only resting once a day to eat and afford the animals time to crop a mouthful of grass. We killed a fat colt occasionally, which supplied us with meat, and very delicious meat too, rather costly but the cheapest and handiest we could obtain. After five days' chase, our pursuers relaxed their speed, and we ourselves drove more leisurely. We again found the advantage that I have often spoken of before, of having a drove of horses before us, for as the animals we bestrode gave out, we could shift to a fresh one, while our pursuers were confined to one steed. When we arrived at my fort on the Arkansas, we had over 1,000 head of horses, all in good condition. There was a general rejoicing among the little community at my safe arrival, the Indians also coming in to bid me welcome. I found my wife married again, having been deceived by a false communication. A present husband had brought her a missive, purporting to be of my indicting, wherein I expressed a difference towards her person, disinclination to return home, and tendering her a discharge from all connubial obligation. She accepted the document as authentic, and solaced her abandonment by espousing her husband's messenger. My return acquainted her with the truth of the matter. She manifested extreme regret at having suffered herself to be imposed upon so readily and as a remedy for the evil offered herself back again. But I declined, preferring to enjoy once more the sweets of single blessedness. I left the fort on a visit to San Fernandez. I found business very dull there on account of the war, and great apprehensions were felt by my friends in regard to the result. Perceiving there was no very desirable place to remove to, I returned to my community. General Kearney who was just then on his march to Santa Fe. I took a drove of my horses and proceeded down the Arkansas to meet him on his route, for it was probable there might be an opportunity of effecting some advantageous exchanges. The general came up and found me in waiting with my stock. We had been acquainted for several years, and he gave me a very cordial reception. Beckworth, said the general, you have a splendid lot of horses, really. They must have cost you a great sum of money. No, general, I replied, but they cost me a great many miles of hard riding. How so? he inquired. Why, I was in California at the time the war broke out, and not having men enough at my command to take part in the fighting, I thought I could assist my country a little by starting off a small drove of the enemy's horses in order to prevent their being used against us. Ah, Beckwith, you are truly a wonderful man to possess so much foresight. And he laughed heartily. However, added he, trade them off as quickly as possible, for I want you to accompany me. You like a war, and I have a good use for you now. I informed him that I was ready for service, and accordingly I sent all my remaining horses back to my plantation and went on with the general to Santa Fe, which place submitted without firing a shot. The general sent me immediately back to Fort Leavenworth with dispatches. This was my service during the war. The occupation was a tolerably good one, and I never failed in getting my dispatches through. I enjoyed facilities superior to almost any other man, as I was known to almost all the Indians through whose country I passed. My partner and I had purchased a hotel in Santa Fe, and we transacted a very profitable business there. My associate attended to the business at a hotel, while I carried dispatches at Santa Fe was generally my starting place. Many messengers lost their lives on the route, as at the time there were dispatches to be sent, and I would not be at headquarters to carry them. 
The distance from Santa Fe to Fort Leavenworth is 913 miles. I have frequently made the trip in from 20 to 25 days. My shortest trip I accomplished in 18. I well knew that my life was at stake every trip that I made, but I liked the employment. There was a continual excitement in it. Indeed, sometimes more than I actually cared about, more particularly when I fell in with the Pawnees. The service furnished an escort of 15 or 25 men, but I always declined the company of troops as I considered myself safer without them. If I had taken troops with me, it would have led to incessant fights with the Indians, and if they had seen me with white soldiers, they would have been very apt to kill me the first opportunity. Another thing I did not think the United States regular troops good for anything against the Indians, for I knew that the Comanches would stand and fight them almost man for man. I chanced to fall in with Kit Carson one day, and I was about to start from New Mexico to Fort Leavenworth, and he proposed going with me, as he wished to learn my route. I was very much pleased with his proposal, as I thought that with Kit and his men I should go through strong-handed. I told him that I should rest at Taos one day to get my horses shod, and that he could easily come up with me there or on the road thither. I left with two men and stayed at Taos as appointed, but he failed to rejoin us. I rode on as far as my ranch. Still he did not appear. I built a large fire before proceeding into the Indian country, thinking to attract him by the smoke and thus bring him on to our trail. But I saw no more of him, and it was supposed he was lost until he eventually turned up in the city of Washington. We both had a narrow escape from Indians on that trip. I had, contrary to my usual practice, and camped one night in the prairie and was to start in the morning when we heard buffalo running close to our camp. On looking out, I saw a great number chased by the Pawnees. Although the Indians were not yet in sight, we made all possible haste to the timber, threw our horses on their sides, gagged them, and fastened them to the ground, and then secreted ourselves in the willows. The Indians flocked around, busied in their pursuit, and some of the buffaloes they dressed within gunshot of our secret camp. I thought that day the longest I had lived through, and I expect the pure animals thought so too, for they lay in one position the whole time without food or water, and without being permitted to whisper a complaint. At night we made good our escape, and arrived at the fort without further difficulty. When I was ready to return to Santa Fe, I could find no one willing to accompany me. The weather was intensively cold. No inducement that I could offer was sufficient to tempt the men to leave their comfortable fires and encounter the perils of the Indians and Jack Frost in the prairies. Many men had been frozen to death on the route, and a general shudder ran through the company when I proposed the journey to them. I could have been furnished with soldiers in plenty, but I was unwilling to take them, as it imposed so much trouble on the road, to stay to bury every man that perished with the hardships of the journey. Important dispatches had arrived from Washington, which must go through, and I looked fruitlessly around for a man hardy enough to go with me. At length a boy, a Kentuckian, volunteered. He had followed the army to the fort and had lived about the barracks until he had become well accustomed to the privations of a camp life. He was an intelligent lad, but unfortunately had a misformation of one of his feet, which seriously impeded his walking. However, I liked his pluck in proposing, and eventually consented to take him. I went with him to the sutler's store, and procured him the warmest clothing I could, and then bade him repair to my boarding house and stay there until I was ready to start. When I was prepared for departure, I furnished him with a good horse, and, taking an extra one between us, we started on the long journey. I gave him particular directions that if he should become very cold, he was to acquaint me, and I would stay and build a fire to warm him by wherever there was any wood, but the proposition he declined. Three days after we reached the Arkansas and encamped, Isaac was busied in preparing supper, while I 
walked to an eminence close by in order to survey the country. I perceived that an immense number of Indians approaching directly towards us, and at that more than three or four hundred yards distance. I shouted to Isaac to catch the horses quickly and tether them, and I hastened back to camp. He inquired what the matter was, and I told him there were a thousand Indians coming after us. The approaching individuals belonged to the Comanche tribe and numbered over a thousand warriors. They were in full speed. They dashed through the Arkansas with such precipitation that I thought they would throw all the water out of the channel and hurl it on to the bank. I ran in front of the advance and challenged them to stop. They halted for a moment and asked me who I was. I told them the crow. Thereupon they grabbed me up like a chicken and carried me into our little camp. They had nine white man's scalps, which to appearance was hardly yet cold, and they said they must kill my white boy, and his scalp would just make ten. I told them the boy was my nephew, and they must not kill him, that great braves never killed boys. They then conversed among themselves a minute or two, and finally said, He, being your nephew, may live. Tell him to make us some good black soup. I foresaw that my coffee and sugar must suffer. For my black soup, they meant coffee. I directed Isaac to set about making it, but to secrete a little for ourselves, if he could do so unperceived. The Comanches had a great fondness for coffee, and I never fell in with them without having to part with all I had, and I sometimes imagined they preferred my coffee and sugar to my scalp. The same day, just before dusk, while jogging steadily along, the boy discovered a small party of Pawnees. I hastily dismounted, tied the heads of our three horses together, prevent them from running, and directed the boy to see that they did not move. I then took his gun and my own and went away from the horses. As I was leaving, the boy inquired if he should fire too. I told him no. Not unless I was killed, and then to defend themselves as best he could. I took a secure position and fired. An Indian fell. I fired again and killed a second. They cracked away at me but did no harm. I reloaded and fired again until I had leveled five of them. They retreating at every discharge. When the fifth warrior fell, the whole party fell back to cry. I knew that after they had cried for a few minutes, they would make a rush for revenge. Therefore, I shouted to the boy to cut the animals loose and mount in haste. He did so. I sprung on my horse instantly, and we flew away, leaving the mourners to their lamentations. At every foe I shot, the boy would ejaculate, Whoop! You fetched him. He's got his gruel. And other sayings, thereby displaying more bravery than many men would have shown under similar circumstances. Ever afterwards, he considered that we were a match for any number of Pawnees, and as for the Comanches, I can beat them off with black soup. We traveled on for several miles and then encamped. In the morning, I started along a ravine for our horses, which had strayed away. I returned towards camp when, where I found that they had taken themselves up another small ravine and that I had passed them. While thus pursuing the stray animals, the boy came to acquaint me that he had seen a great number of Indians. I led the horses to the camp and then mounted a little rise of ground from whence I discreed a large village. I did not know what tribe they belonged to, though I knew they were not Pawnees, for that tribe never visited this country except on war excursions. I took the boy and walked with him up to the village, but their faces were all strange to me, nor did I like their appearance and movements. On perceiving one at a little distance wrapped in his robe, I thought he might possibly be a chief, and I approached him. He addressed me in Crow. Ah, my friend, what brought you here? I replied that, as I was passing through, I thought it well to call on him. I am glad to see you, said he. Enter my lodge. My warriors are bad today. The Indians were Apaches, and the chief was named Black Shield, an old and intimate acquaintance. He insisted on my spending the night in the village, which I consented to. He was perfectly rabid towards the whites, and stated his intention to manure the prairie with their bodies the forthcoming season. 
he would not leave one in the country. I applauded his intention, telling him the whites were unable to fight. Seeing that I was on his side, that is, if my words made me so, he continued. I have plenty of warriors, plenty of guns and balls, but I'm a little short of powder. When will you return? I informed him as nearly as I could calculate, but I add that my return was uncertain. Will you bring me some powder, he inquired. I will, I said, but I shall return by way of the Eagle Nest's Hill. That is the very place I am going to from here, he rejoined, and if I am not there myself, some of my warriors will be, and they can take it of you. This afforded me no put-off, and I accordingly promised to furnish him with the powder, if the reader will indulge me in a witticism, I beg to assure him that I carry the powder to the old chief in a horn. In the morning, he furnished me with the meat enough to subsist us for a week, together with, with new moccasins and sundry other articles. We then bade him adieu and proceeded on our journey, arriving at Santa Fe without any further noteworthy adventure. On reaching my destination, I informed some of my friends of my promise to the Black Shield and where they could find him to deliver the powder, to enable him to carry out his commendable resolution. A party started to meet him at the appointed spot, but in delivering the powder, they managed to explode it, and he and his warriors only received the bullets, of which they already had plenty. End of chapter 33「Chapter 34 of the Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter 34 Affairs at Santa Fe Insurrection at Taos Discovery of the Plot Battle at the Canyon Battles at Lambeden at Pueblo and at Taos. A Mexican woman redeemed from the Indians. Returned to Santa Fe. On my arrival at Santa Fe, I found affairs in a very disturbed state. Colonel Donifan had just gained the Battle of Brazito and was carrying all before him in that section of the country. He had forwarded orders to Santa Fe for a field battery in order to make a demonstration against Chihuahua. Major Clark was entrusted with the duty of conveying the artillery to the colonel. Scarcely had he departed when we received intelligence of an insurrection in Taos. The information was first communicated by an Indian from a village between Santa Fe and Taos, who reported to General Price that the Mexicans had massacred all the white inhabitants of that place and that a similar massacre was contemplated in Santa Fe, of which report full information could be obtained by the arrest of a Mexican who was then conveying a letter from the priest in Taos to the priest in Santa Fe. A watch was immediately set upon the priest's house, and a Mexican was seen to enter. The guard approached the door to arrest the man as he issued, but he, being apprised of the action of the authorities, left the house by another door and escaped. At night there came a violent rapping at my gate, and on going to open it I perceived my friend Charles Town, who, on being admitted, clasped me round the neck and gave vent to uncontrolled emotion. Perceiving that something alarming had occurred, I invited him into the house, spread refreshments before him, and allowed him time to recover himself. He then informed me that he had escaped almost by a miracle from Taos, where all the American residents had been killed. He was a resident there, having married a girl of New Mexico, and his wife's father had apprised him that he had better effect his escape, if possible, for if he was caught he would be inevitably massacred. His father-in-law provided him with a good horse, and he retreated into the woods where, after considerable risk and anxiety, he provincially eluded the assassins. 
On receiving this alarming information, I lost no time in repairing to the headquarters of General Price, accompanied by my informant, who related the above particulars. General Price immediately adopted the most effective measures. He assembled his officers and instructed them to set a close watch upon the house of every Mexican in the city and to suffer no person to pass in or out he also ordered that every american should hold himself in readiness for service during the night before morning several of the most influential mexican citizens were placed under arrest in searching them important conspiracies were brought to light correspondence implicating the most considerable residents were read and a plot was detected of subjecting santa fe to the same St. Bartholomew Massacre, as had just been visited upon Taos. The city was placed under martial law, and every American that could shoulder a musket was called into immediate service. All the ox drivers, mule drivers, merchants, clerks, and commissariat men were formed into ranks and file and placed in a condition for holding the city. Then, placing himself at the head of his army, four hundred strong general price marched towards taos on arriving at canjara a small town about twenty miles from santa fe we found the enemy numbering two thousand mexicans and indians were prepared to give us battle the enemy's lines were first perceived by our advance guard which instantly fell back upon the main body our line was formed and then advance made upon the enemy the mountaineer company under captain savarine being placed in charge of the baggage as soon as battle was begun however we left the baggage and ammunition wagons take care of themselves and made a descent upon the foe he fled precipitately before the charge of our lines and we encamped upon the field of battle next day we advanced to lamboda where the enemy made another stand and again fled on our approach we marched on until we arrived at taos and the barbarities we witnessed there exceeded in brutality all my previous experience with the indians bodies of our murdered fellow countrymen were lying about the streets mutilated and disfigured in every possible way and the hogs and dogs were making a repast upon the remains among the dead we recognized that of governor bent who had been recently appointed by general carney one poor victim we saw who had been stripped naked scalped alive and his eyes punched out he was groping his way through the streets beseeching someone to shoot him out of his misery while his inhuman mexican tormentors were deriving the greatest amusement from the exhibition such scenes of unexampled barbarity filled our soldiers' breasts with abhorrence. They became tiger-like in their craving for revenge. Our general directed the desecrated remains to be gathered together and a guard placed over them while he marched on with his army in pursuit of the barbarians. Late in the afternoon we arrived at Pueblo, where we found the enemy well posted having an adobe fort in their front no attack was attempted that evening and strict orders were issued for no man to venture out of the camp in the evening i was visited by a man who informed me he had a brother at rio mondo twelve miles distance whom if he was not already killed he wished to save from massacre i determined to rescue him if possible and having induced seven other good and trusty mountaineers to aid me in the attempt we left the camp unperceived and proceeded to the place indicated on our arrival we found two or three hundred mexicans all well armed we rode boldly past them and they dispersed many of them going to their homes we reached the door of the mexican general montaja who styled himself the santa anna of the north and captured him we then liberated the prisoner we were in quest of and returned to Taos with our captive general. At Taos we found our forces, which had retired upon that place from Pueblo, after having made an unsuccessful attempt to dislodge the enemy. We informed our general of our important capture, and he affected great displeasure at our disobedience of orders, although it was easy to see that, in his eyes, 
the end had justified the means. The following morning a gallows was erected, and Montaja was swung in the wind. The correspondence that had been seized in Santa Fe had implicated him in some of the blackest plots, and we thought that this summary disposal of his generalship would relieve us from all further dangers from his machinations. Having procured artillery to bombard the enemy's position, our commander returned to Pueblo. We cannonaded in good earnest, but the pieces were too small to be of much service. But we cut a breach with our axes halfway through the six-foot wall, and then finished the work with our cannon. While engaged in this novel way of getting at the enemy, a shell was thrown from a mortar at the fort, but our artillerymen, not being very skillful, in their practice, threw the shell outside the fort, and it fell among us. A young lieutenant seized it in his hands and cast it through the breach. It had not more than struck before it exploded, doing considerable damage in the fort. We then stormed the breach, which was only big enough to admit one man at a time, and carried the place without difficulty. The company of mountaineers had fallen back midway between the fort and mountain in order to pick off any Mexican who should dare to show himself. We killed 54 of the defenders as they were endeavoring to escape. Upon the person of one of whom, an officer, we found 160 doubloons. Some of the enemy fired upon us from a position at one corner of the fort through loopholes, and while looking about for a covert to get a secure shot at them, we discovered a few of the enemy hidden away in the brush. One of them, an Indian, ran towards us, exclaiming, Bueno, bueno, me like Americanos. One of the party said, If you like the Americans, take the sword and return to the brush and kill all the men you find there. He took the bro off its sword and was busy in the brush for a few minutes and then returned with his sword blade dripping with gore saying, I have killed them. Then you ought to die for killing your own people, said the American, and he shot the Indian dead. The battle lasted through the whole day and a close watch was set at night to prevent the escape of those yet occupying the fort. The assault was renewed the following morning and continued during the day also. Towards night, several white flags were raised by the enemy, but were immediately shot down by the Americans, who had determined to show no quarter. On the third morning, all the women issued from the fort, each bearing a white flag, and kneeled before the general to supplicate for the lives of their surviving friends. The general was prevailed upon and gave orders to cease fire. The enemy lost severely through their disgraceful cowardice. Our company lost but one man through the whole engagement. Nine of the most prominent conspirators were hanged at Taos, and seven or eight more at Santa Fe. It was about this time that the report reached us of the butchery of Mr. Waldo with eight or ten other Americans at the Moro. After the insurrection was suppressed, I started again for Fort Leavenworth. On my way back from the fort, I again fell in with Black Shield and his Apaches. I said to him, you told me false. You said you would meet me at Eagle's Nest, but when I went there, you were not to be found. I had to throw the powder away that I brought for you and run for my life, for the whites discovered by Aaron that were close at my heels. I know it, my friend, said Black Shield. We saw your kegs there, but the whites had taken all the powder out. I am sorry they came upon you so suddenly, for we had to run as well as you. The second day after we left the Apaches, we discovered an object in the distance which I at first looked for a stump, but still thought it singular that there should be a stump where there were no trees near. As we approached, the object moved, and we at length discovered it to be a man of the name of Elliot Lee, who had been wounded by the Apaches three or four days previously, and had not tasted food since. He had belonged to a party of seventeen or eighteen mountaineers on their way to Santa Fe. They had stopped to rest at the bank of a creek and were suddenly set upon by the Indians. Several of the party were killed, among whom was my friend Charles Town, and all the rest were more or less severely wounded. 
Some few had succeeded in getting away, notwithstanding their wounds, but Mr. Lee had been shot in the thigh and was unable to crawl along. When we picked him up, he was delirious, and his wound was greatly swollen and inflamed. We gave him food, carried him along with us, until we fortunately came up with his wagons. We then gave him into the keeping of his friends and proceeded on our way. On my arrival home, I disposed of all my property in Santa Fe and started to buy horses of the Indians to dispose of to the discharged troops. I had arrived within a short distance of my ranch when I met a man who advised me to conceal myself. Two rewards have been offered for my apprehension, one of a thousand dollars by Colonel Price and another of five hundred dollars by Mr. Kissack, quartermaster. I was accused of confederating with rebels and Indians and assisting them in stealing horses from the whites and leading the hostile bands in their warfare upon the American troops. I listened to his information and was astonished at the invention. This is news indeed, I said, but they shall not have the profit all to themselves. I would immediately go and deliver myself up and obtain the rewards. I advise you as a friend not to go, rejoined my interlocker, for they will assuredly hang you directly they lay hands upon you. Well, hang or not hang, I answered, I am resolved to go, for I have not been a month absent from Santa Fe, and I can give an account of every day and night I have since spent. At the time I met with my informant, I had an order from Captain Morris of the United States Army in my pocket authorizing me to pick up all the government horses that I might find in my rambles and bring them in. But up to the time that I was informed of the charges against me, I had found but one horse, the property of Captain Severine, and it I had restored to the owner. Accordingly, I returned without delay to Taos, where I saw Colonel Willock, who was lieutenant under Colonel Price, him I acquainted with my determination to proceed to Santa Fe to deliver myself up for the rewards that were offered for my apprehension, but he urgently requested me not to go. He was about to start with an expedition against the Apaches and wished to engage me as spy, interpreter, and guide. He promised to forward an exculpatory letter to Santa Fe that should set me all right with the authorities. The letter was sent, but not delivered, as the messenger was shot on the way. I concluded to accompany the colonel and aid him to the extent of my ability in the object of his expedition. We started with a small battalion of volunteers for the Apaches. The first day in camp, the common soldier fair was spread for dinner, which at that time I felt but little appetite for. I informed the colonel that I would go out and kill an antelope. Why, said he, there is not an antelope within ten miles around here. The soldiers have scoured the whole country without seeing one. I told them I felt sure I could find one and took up my rifle and was about to start. Hold on, cried the colonel. I will go with you and will further engage to pack on my back all you kill. We started and kept on the road for about a half a mile when I discovered the tracks of three antelopes which had just crossed our path and gone in the direction of a hill close by. The colonel did not see the tracks, and I did not point them out to him. We passed on a few rods further when I suddenly stopped, threw my head back, and began to sniff like a dog, scenting his prey. What the dickens are you sniffing so for? asked the colonel. I am sure that I smell an antelope, said I. You smell antelope? and the colonel's nostrils began to dilate. I can smell nothing. Well, colonel, I said, there are antelopes close by. I know, for my smellers never yet deceive me, and now, added I, if you will start carefully up that hollow, I will go up on the other side, and I am confident that one of us will kill one. I knew that if the animals were in the hollow, they would start at the approach of the colonel, and most probably in my direction and thus afforded me an opportunity of getting a shot at one. I proceeded cautiously along until, raising my head over an knoll, I saw the three antelopes which had crossed us. Two had already lain down, and the third was preparing to do so. When I sent a leaden messenger 
which brought him down involuntarily. The colonel shouted to inquire what I had shot at. Antelope, I answered, and he came running at his best speed. There was the very beast, beyond all dispute, to the other astonishment of the colonel, who regarded for some moments first the game and then the hunter. And you smelled them? He pondered. Well, I must confess, your olfactory nerves beat those of any man I have ever yet fell in with. Smell antelope. Ha! <laughs> I will send my boy to carry him in. But that was not the bargain, Colonel, I said. You engaged to pack in on your back all I should cull. This is your burden. The distance is but short. But the Colonel declined his engagement. We finally hung the antelope on a tree, and the Colonel, on our return to camp, dispatched his servant to fetch it in. He never could get over my smelling antelope, and we have had as many a hearty laugh at it since. The following morning, at daylight, I took five or six men with me, and proceeded on my duty as spy. When the Colonel moved on with the troops, we re we, returning to camp every evening at dusk, we frequently saw signs of Indians, but we could make no discovery of the Indians themselves. We continued our chase for nearly a month. Our coffee and sugar had given out, and our provisions were getting low. The soldiers could kill no game, and there was a general disposition, especially among the officers, to return. In leaving the camp, as usual, one morning, I directed the colonel to a camping ground and started on my search. Late in the afternoon, I discovered what I supposed to be a large party of Indians moving in our direction. I ran with all possible speed to communicate the information, but in ascending a small point of land which was in my way, I found a strange encampment of United States troops lying before me. I knew it was not Colonel Willock's command, for these had tents, wagons, and other appointments, which we were unprovided with. When I was first perceived, some of the men pointed me out to their companions. There's Beckwith. There's Jim Beckwith, I heard whispered around. I found it was a detachment commanded by Colonel Edmondson, who had just returned from Santa Fe with a reinforcement, having been defeated in an engagement with the Apaches some time previously. When the colonel saw me, he inquired of my errand. I have come after horses, I replied in Plestamont, but I see you have none. Beckworth, said Captain Donahue, I have been defending your character for a long time, and now I want you to clear up matters for yourself. I found I was not in very good savior among the parties present, owing to a mistake in my identity made by one of the soldiers during their late engagement with the Indians. It was supposed I had entered their camp, hurled my lamp through a soldier, and challenged another out to fight, telling him he was paid for fighting and it was his duty to engage me. This suspicion added to flying reports of evil doing, which derived their original in the Crow Village from my adventure with Fitzpatrick, had associated me in the soldier's mind with all the horse raids and white massacres they heard rumors of, and I was regarded by them all as a desperate lawless character who deserved hanging to the first tree wherever met. At this moment, two men came running towards the camp at full speed, shouting, To arms! To arms! As though the whole Apache nation was behind them. Where is your party? asked Colonel Edmondson of me. Coming yonder, sir, I replied, pointing in the direction of the two approaching heralds. For I suppose it was Colonel Willock's command they had seen, and whom in their fright they had mistaken for Indians. Immediately there was a bustle of preparations to receive the coming foe. Muskets were snatched up, and the men fell into line. But in a few moments, the real character of the approaching company was ascertained, and the colonel advanced to greet them. At the junction of the two parties, both engaged on the same errand, matters were discussed by the two colonels, and it was resolved to abandon the expedition, for it was manifest that the Indians were too much on the alert to be taken. I was dispatched to Santa Fe with a letter to Colonel Price from Colonels Edmondson and Willock, while they resolved to march back with their detachments, Colonel Edmondson to Santa Fe and Colonel Willock to Taos. 
The morning following, I again set out for Fort Leavenworth, having for companion Mackintosh, who, by the way, was a Cherokee and known as such to the Indians whom we fell in with on the road. We reached the fort without any accident and delivered our dispatches safe. On our return, we overtook Bullard and Company's trains of wagons, which were on their way to Santa Fe with supplies for the Army. Bullard and his partner proposed to leave their charge and go in with us, if I thought we would be able to keep up with them. I answered that we would try and keep their company as far as possible, but that they would be at liberty to proceed at any time that they considered we retarded them. They went with us as far as the Moro, two days' ride from Santa Fe, where we were compelled to leave them, as they tired out and had already detained us two full days. My next engagement in the service of Uncle Sam was a trip to Chihuahua to convey dispatches, but... Previous to starting, Captain Morris wished to engage me as a guide in an expedition against the Utah Indians. So, preferring the latter service, I transferred my trust to my brave and faithful friend, McIntosh, and accompanied Captain Morris. The expedition consisted of 90 men. The object was a treaty of peace with the Utahs. We succeeded in finding the Indians, but as they supposed our only object was to fight, it was some time before we could get up to them. We at length surprised them in a gap in the mountains when we succeeded in taking a number of prisoners, among whom were some chiefs. We explained our object. They then frankly informed us where the village was. We all repaired to it and concluded terms of peace. Our approach greatly alarmed the village at first, but they knew that, in conjunction with the Apaches, they had been guilty of many depredations although it had been their policy to throw all the blame of the mischief upon their allies. Our mission performed, we returned to Taos. I remained some weeks inactive. Taos was convulsed with continual alarms for reports that Cortez was approaching against us with a great force. The troops were all the way at Santa Fe, though, had he visited us, we could have improvised a warm reception. We had a small piece of cannon, with plenty of grape and canister, with which we could have swept the streets. We tried its effect one day just to satisfy the curiosity of the Mexicans. We put in a heavy charge of grape shot and discharged it down the street. The tawny Mexicans were wonder-stricken. They thought an army would stand but a poor chance before such a volcanic belching of iron missiles. Poultry in the vicinity of Taos became exceedingly scarce. It was a rare matter to hear a cock crow. When we did by chance hear the pleasing sound, we would listen for the repetition of it in order to learn from which direction it proceeded. We would then visit the telltale's quarters after dark, as we could obtain our poultry cheaper at night than in the daytime. Orders had been issued to take nothing from the enemy without paying for it, which orders were evidently based upon the assumption that we had money to pay with. Those without money did not feel themselves bound by the injunction. The authorities that issue similar commands in future would do well to insert some clause binding on the money list. Otherwise, these orders are all moonshine. From Taos, I proceeded to Santa Fe. I again started for the last time to Fort Leavenworth, McIntosh having safely returned from Chihuahua, again accompanying me. When we arrived at the wagon mound, we heard shots fired, and immediately after met a train of mule teams approaching at their quickest pace. The drivers advised us to return as they had been attacked by the Apaches, and if we proceeded, we could not escape being killed. I thought that my companion and I knew the Indians better than the mule drivers did, and we bade them goodbye and started on. We intended to avoid the Indians by making a circuit away from where we expected they would be, but in so doing we came directly upon the village. We stayed all night with them, were well treated, and resumed our journeys in the morning. We met a party of Americans who had been attacked by the Comanches and lost one horse but we saw no more Indians until we reached the fort. Many times wonder has been expressed how I could always travel the road in safety while other men were attacked and killed. 
The only way in which I could account for the marvel was that I knew how to act the wolf while the others did not. Of all the dispatches I had ever carried, I never lost one, while numbers who have undertaken to bear them lost not alone the dispatches but their lives, for whenever they fell in with the Indians, they were sure to be killed. The Indians knew perfectly well what my business was. They knew that I was conveying orders backwards and forwards from the great white chief to his war chiefs in New Mexico. They would frequently ask me what the orders were which I had with me. Sometimes I would tell them that the great chief of Washington was going to send on a great host of warriors to rub them all out. They would laugh heartily at the supposition, for they conceived that all American forces combined would hardly be a circumstance before them. I promised to apprise them when the white warriors were to advance against them which promise they confidently relied upon. I had to say something to keep on good terms with them and answer their inquiries to satisfy them, and then proceed with my business. The war between the great white chief and the great Mexican chief interested the Indians but little, though their conviction was that the Mexican chief would be victorious. Their sympathy was with the latter, from motives of self-interest. They were now able to go at any time and drive home all the horses, cattle, and sheep that they wanted, together with Mexican children enough to take care of them. If the white chief conquered, they supposed he would carry all the horses, cattle, and sheep home with them, and thus leave none for them. The Comanches and the Apaches had a great number of Mexicans, of both sexes among them, who seldom manifest much desire to return home. The women say that the Indians treat them better than they are treated at home. I never met but one exception to this rule, and that was a young Mexican woman captive among the Comanches. She told me that her father was wealthy and would give me $5,000 if I could procure her restoration. I bought her of the chief and conveyed her to my fort. Whence I sent information to her father to acquaint him where he could find his daughter. In a few days, her father and her husband came to her. She refused to have anything to say to her husband, for she said he was a coward. When the Indians attacked the village, he mounted his horse and fled, leaving her to their mercy. Her father pro-offered me the promised sum, but I only accepted $1,000 which returned me a good profit on the cost of the goods I had given to the Indians for a ransom. The woman returned home with her father, a valorous husband following her. Shortly after this, I returned to Santa Fe. End of chapter 34《Of the Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Holm. Chapter 35. Departure for California. Meeting with the Apaches. Hostile threats. Trouble with the Utahs. Most terrible tragedy. Society in California. Adventures with grizzly bears. The last dispatches I bore from Fort Leavenworth were addressed to California, and I had undertaken to carry them through. At Santa Fe, I rested a week, and then, taking an escort of 15 men, I started on my errand. On our arrival at the village of Abiger, we found a large party of Apaches who were in the midst of a drunken carousel. We encamped inside the corral, that being as safe a place as we could select. Little Joe, an Apache chief, inquired of me what I was going to do with these whites. I'm going to take them to California, I told him. No, said he, you shall never take them nearer to California than they are now. Well, I shall try, I said. He held some further conversation with me of a denunciatory character, then left me to return to the liquor shop. Foreseeing what was likely to result if more liquor was obtained, I visited every place in town where it was kept and informed every seller that if another drop was sold to the Indians, 
I would hang the man that did it without a minute's delay, and I would have been as good as my word, for they were all Mexicans, and I felt no great liking for them since the awful tragedy of Taos. But the priest began one or two in expostulation, but I cut them short. I'll hang your priest just as soon as any of you, if he dares to interfere in the matter. I suppose they intended to urge that their priest had authorized them to sell liquors to the Indians. My interdict stopped them, for there was no more sold while I was there. The next day I saw little Joe in one of the low saloons. The stimulus of the liquor had left him, and he had what topers called the horrors. He begged me to let him have one dram more but I refused. Whiskey, I said, put all kinds of nonsense into your head when you you get drunk, and then you are ripe for any mischief. When he had become perfectly sober, he came to me and again asked, If it were true, I'll kill your whole party, and you with them. You will never listen to us. Your ears are stopped. We all love you, but we have told you many times that we hate the whites. And do not want you to lead them through our hunting grounds and show them our paths. But you will not listen to us. And now, if you undertake to pass through that canyon, we will, without fail, kill you. Well, I replied, I shall certainly go, so you had better get your warriors ready. We packed our animals, and I directed my men to travel slowly while I went through the canyon. If I wished them to advance, I would climb up and show myself to them as a signal for them to rush through and reach me as soon as possible. I then went on all alone, as I knew that if I encountered the Indians in the canyon, they would not kill me by myself. I paused through without meeting any, and I signaled to the men to come on. They soon joined me, and we issued upon the open prairie. Here we discovered 300 Apaches, each man leading his war horse. We numbered 18 two of whom were Mexicans. They did not offer to attack us, however, and we continued our route unmolested, although they kept on our trail for 20 miles. A little before dark, we rested to take supper, starting again immediately after the meal was finished. We saw no more of the Apaches. The following afternoon, a Utah came to us. I asked him where his village was. He did not know, he said, as he had been away some time. I was going out to shoot game at the time, and I took the Indian with me, lending him a gun belonging to one of my men. I had killed two or three wild turkeys, while my Indian, discovering deer some distance off, went in pursuit. I returned to the camp, but the fellow had not arrived. When we started in the morning, he had not shown himself. The second day after the disappearance of the Indian with my gun, I was some distance in advance of the party, when, on ascending a hill, I saw a large party of Utahs ahead. They were looking down and examining the trail very closely to see if we had passed. This convinced me that the Indian fugitive had lied to me, that he knew well where his village was, and had no doubt been sent out from it as a spy. We held on our way till we came up with him, and it being then... About noon, we halted to take a long rest. The Indians soon came flocking round us, but I gave strict orders to the men to keep a good lookout and upon no account to let them touch the firearms. They swarmed around the camp, entering it one at a time, and I determined to make the first troublesome advance an excuse for getting rid of them. We packed up and moved on through the whole mass of Indians, but they did not venture an attack although it had been their intention to do so if they could have got any advantage of through our negligence. They were embittered against the whites at that time on account of a severe whipping that had been recently inflicted upon two of their warriors by Chuck, who had just passed through them, for a theft from his camp. To receive a whipping, especially at the hands of a white man, is looked upon by them as a lasting infamy, and they would prefer death to the disgrace. The next morning they overtook us again, and the Indian returned me my gun. I mollified them with a few trapping presents, and they finally left us on an apparently good term. The next hostile country that lay upon our road was that of the Navajo tribe, 
They followed us through their whole strip of territory, shouting after us and making insulting gestures. But they took the precaution to keep out of gunshot range, and I did not think it worth my while to chastise them. The next tribe on our route was the Paiuchis, which is also the last before you reach Pueblo in California. The first Paiuchis that we came across were an Indian and a squaw engaged in digging roots. On seeing us approach, the Indian took to his heels, leaving the squaw to take care of herself. I rode up to her and asked her where her village was. She pointed in the direction of it, but I could not see it. The next one that I saw stooped and concealed himself in the grass. Immediately he found himself observed. But I rode up to him and made him show himself, not wishing to have him think that he could escape unnoticed so easily. He accompanied me for a short distance until another of the tribe shouted to him from a hill, and he then left me. We encamped that night upon the prairie. At dusk, we observed the smoke of a campfire in every direction, and shortly we were visited by hundreds of Indians who entirely hemmed us in. But on their finding that we were not Mexicans, they did not offer to molest us. They were hostile on account of the continual abductions of their squaws and children, whom the Mexicans employ as domestic slaves and treat them with the utmost cruelty. We reached our destination in safety, and I delivered my dispatches. I was now inactive for some time again, and occupied my leisure in rambling about the environs of Monterey. I then engaged in the service of the commissariat at Monterey to carry dispatches from thence to Captain Denny's ranch, where I was met by another carrier. On my road lay the mission of San Miguel owned by a Mr. Reed, an Englishman, and as his family was a very interesting one, I generally made his home my resting place. On one of my visits, arriving about dusk, I entered the house as usual, but, a, but was surprised to see no one stirring. I walked about a little to attract attention and no one coming to me. I stepped in the kitchen to look for some of the inmates. On the floor, I saw someone lying down asleep, as I supposed. I attempted to arouse him with my foot, but he did not stir. This seemed strange, and my apprehensions became excited, for the Indians were very numerous about, and I was afraid some mischief had been done. I returned to my horse for my pistol, then, lighting a candle, I commenced the search. In going along a passage, I stumbled over the body of a woman. I entered a room and found another, a murdered Indian woman, who had been domestic. I was about to enter another room, but I was arrested by some sudden thought which urged me to search no further. It was an opportune admiration, for that very room contained the murderers of the family who had heard my steps and were sitting at that moment with their pistols pointed at the door, ready to shoot the first person that entered. This they confessed Subsequent, Thinking to obtain further assistance, I mounted my horse and rode to the nearest ranch, a distance of 24 miles, when I, where I procured 15 Mexicans and Indians and returned with them the same night to the scene of the tragedy. On again entering the house, we found 11 bodies all thrown together in one pile for the purpose of consuming them. For on searching further, we found the murderers as set fire to the dwelling, but according to that providence which exposes such weakened deeds, the fire had died out. Fastening up the house, we returned immediately back to the ranch from which I had started with my party, making 72 miles I rode that night. As soon as I could obtain some rest, I started, in company with the alcade for the St. Louis Obispo where it was believed we could get assistance in capturing the murderers. Forty men in detached parties, moving in different directions, went in pursuit. It was my fortune to find the trail, and with my party of six men, I managed to head off the suspected murderers so as to come up with them in the road from directly the opposite direction from Reed's house. 
When I came opposite, one of the men sang out, Good day, senors, I replied, but kept on riding in the lope. The bandits, thrown entirely off their guard, insisted upon entering into conversation, so I had a fair opportunity of marking them all and discovering among them a horse belonging to the unfortunate Reed. I then rode to Santa Barbara, a distance of 40 miles, with a party of 20 men, started boldly in pursuit. After much hard travel, we finally came upon the gang and camped for the night. Without a moment's hesitation, we charged on them, gave a volley of rifles, and killed one and wounded all the others, save an American named Dempsey. The villains fought like tigers, but were finally mastered and made prisoners. Dempsey turned state evidence. He stated that on the night of the murder, his party stopped at Reed's, that Reed told him that he had just returned from the mines, whereupon it was determined to kill the whole family and take his gold, which turned out to be the pitiful sum of $1,000. After the confession of Dempsey, we shot the murderers, along with the state's evidence, and thus ended the lives of two Americans, two Englishmen, and ten Irishmen they having committed the most diabolical deed that ever disgraced the annuals of frontier life. I continued in the service of carrying dispatches for four months, varying my route with an occasional trip to San Francisco. At this time, society in California was in the worst condition to be found, probably in any part of the world, to call it civilized. The report of the discovery of gold had attracted thither lawless and desperate characters from all parts of the earth, and the government constituted for their control was a weaker element than the offenders it had to deal with. The rankest excesses were familiar occurrences, and the men were butchered under the very eyes of the officers of peace, and no action was taken for the matter. What honest men they were, became alarmed, and frequently would abandon the richest places for the mere security of their lives and leave a whole community of rowdies to prey upon each other. Disorder attained its limit, and some reactionary means would naturally be engendered as a corrective to the existing evils. The establishment of vigilance committees among the better order of citizens operated as a thunderbolt upon the conniving civil officers and the rank perpetrators of crime. Scores of venues were snatched from the hands of these mock officers and summarily strung up to the limb of the nearest tree. Horse and cattle thieves had their necks disjointed so frequently that it soon became safe for a man to leave his horse standing in the street for a few moments while he stepped into a house to call upon his friend, and that widely practiced business was quickly done away with. Such sudden justice overtook murderers, robbers, and other criminals that honest people began to breathe more freely and acquired a sense of security while engaging in their ordinary pursuits. The material for crime still exists and it is yet present in California to an alarming extent, but order may be considered as confirmed in the supremacy, though inevitably many social evils still exist, which time alone will remedy. In the month of April, 1849, the steamship California touched at Monterey, she being the first steam vessel that had visited there from the States. I, with a party of fifteen others, stepped on board and proceeded as far as Stockton, where we separated into various parties. I left with one man to go to Sonora, where we erected the first tent and commenced a business in partnership. I had carried a small lot of clothing along with me, which I disposed of to the miners at what now seems to me fabulous prices. Finding the business thus profitable, I sent my partner back to Stockton for a further supply, and he brought several mules laden with goods. This lot was disposed of as readily as the first, and at prices equally remunerative. This induced us to continue the business, he performing the journeys backwards and forwards, and I remaining behind to dispose of the goods and attend to other affairs. Sonora was rapidly growing into a large village, and our tent was replaced with a roomy house 
clad corps of Indians in my employ to take charge of the horses left in my care by the miners and other persons, sometimes to the number of two hundred at once. I also employed Indians to work in the mines, I furnishing them with board and implements to work with, and they paying me with one half of their earnings. Their general yield was from five to six ounces a day, each man, a moiety of what they faithfully rendered to me. Among my earliest visitors was a party of eighteen United States dragoons who came to me be fitted out with citizens' clothing as they had brought to a certain period their service to this country. It was an impossible thing at that time to retain troops in California, for the produce of the mines held out a temptation to desert that none seemed able to resist, as more gold could be dug sometimes in one day than would pay a private for a year's service in the army. Even officers of considerable rank and not infrequently threw aside epaulet and sash and shouldered the pick to repair to the diggings. While at Sonora, I learned that Colonel Fremont was at Mariposa, and I made a journey over there for the purpose of seeing him. I was disappointed in my expectation and started to return home again, while proceeding quietly along, having left the main road and taken up a hollow, I perceived two men approaching me from the opposite direction, running at the top of their speed, and a crowd of Indians after them in pursuit. When they came up, they shouted to me to turn and fly for my life, or the Indians would certainly massacre me. I bade them stop and quiet their fears. Seeing my self-possession notwithstanding, the near approach of the Indians, they at length halted, and approached close to me for protection against their pursuers. I then commanded the Indians to stand, telling them that they were my men. They said they were not aware of that, and they should not have chased them. The Indians I was acquainted with, they had been frequently to my house to invite me to their village. They wished to purchase goods of me, and had promised me a mule load of gold dust if I would only supply them with what they were in need of. I accompanied them to their village, but my two rescued companions were not admitted into their lodges. They then renewed their promise of the mule load of gold dust if I would bring out the goods they wanted. I never went to them, although it was remiss in me, for they had a great quantity of gold dust. I left after a brief visit and rejoined the two men. They could not sufficiently express their gratitude to me for their deliverance, as they considered my opportune appearance alone saved their lives. Becoming tired of my business in Sonora, for inactivity fatigued me to death, I disposed of my interest in it for $6,000 and went on to Sacramento City with the money in my pocket. From this place I traveled on to Murderer's Bar, which lies on the middle fork of the American River. Here I found my own friend, Chapineau, housekeeping, and stayed with him until the rainy season set in. Thence I proceeded to Greenwood Valley to establish my winter quarters, but I was seized with an attack of inflammatory rheumatism, and I had a nice time of it that winter. Before I was able to get about, I was called on by the inhabitants to go several miles to shoot a grizzly bear, as I was unable to walk the distance. Several of them volunteered to carry me. The bear was in the habit of walking past the row of cabins every morning on his return to his den, he having issued forth the preceding night to procure his evening meal. They had fired several shots at Bruin, as he passed, but he had never deigned to pay any attention to the molestation. I mounted a horse and rode some distance along his customary path until I came to a tree which offered a fair shelter to await his approach. I placed my back against it as a, as a support while I awaited his coming, the neighbors drawing off to a safe distance to witness the sport. By and by, Grizzly came in sight walking along as independently as an alderman-elect. I allowed him to approach till he was in twenty paces, 
When I called out to him, he stopped suddenly and looked around to a certain whence the sound proceeded. As he arrested himself, I fired, and the ball entered his heart. He advanced ten or fifteen paces before he fell. The observers shouted to me to run, they forgetting in their excitement that I had not strength to move. The bear never stirred from where he fell, and he expired without a groan. When dressed, he weighed over 1,400 pounds. The grizzly bear is a formidable animal and has acted a prominent part among the settlers of California. They are seldom known to attack man unless wounded. In that case, if a tree is by, the hunter had better commence climbing. They are very plenty from the Sierra Nevada to the coast range of the mountains. I have, in the course of my sojourn in the country, killed a great many of them, and met with some singular adventures. On one occasion, while I was with the Crow Indians, there was a man of the name of Co who was trapping in one of the neighboring streams, and I became alarmed for his safety, as Blackfoot parties were skulking about in all directions, and were sure to kill him if they should find his camp. I found Coe and told him my fears. He instantly gathered up his traps and, mounting his horse, started towards me. When within fair gunshot, an old bear sprang from a thicket and landed upon the flanks of his horse, applying his teeth to the roots of the poor animal's tail and holding him as if in a vice. Cole leaned over his horse's neck and cried out, Shoot, Jim! Shoot quick! I could not help laughing to have saved my life. As he turned from side to side, though his situation was a critical one, I soon got in a favorable position and put a ball in the animal's head, just behind the ear, when he liberated the horse and his rider, falling on his back, apparently stone dead. There is a story remembered by the mountaineers of a person named Kairi. He was a man who never exceeded 100 pounds in weight, but was a clear grit. What little there was of him. He went out one day alone, and his horse came back. In the evening without his rider, and we thought that the Indians made sure of poor Kairi's scalp. The next morning, a small party of us started on the horse's trail and found Kairi lying beside a large dead grizzly bear. Kairi was horribly mutilated and insensible, but still alive, and must have soon died if no one had come to his rescue. We took him to camp and nursed him with all possible care. When he recovered sufficiently to tell his tale, his story was received with shouts of laughter and was rehearsed as a wonderful joke from camp to camp. Kairi stated that when he saw the grizzly, he got from his horse to shoot him, but unfortunately only wounded the animal. The bear, so Kairi says, caught hold of him and commenced a regular rough-and-tumble fight. Finally, Kairi got a good lick at the bear's head, knocked him down with his fist, and then attempted to run away. The bear, however, was too quick. When Kairi became desperate, seized the beast by the tongue, drew his knife, and stabbed the creature in the heart. Improbable as is the tale, it was a singular fact that when Kairi was found, his knife was up to the maker's name in the bear's side, and the body showed the effect of other severe stabs. But whether a man weighing 90 pounds can knock down the best of boxes weighing 1,200, the reader can decide. But Kairi ever told the same tale and became known far and near as the man that whipped the grizzly in a stand-up fight. Probably no man ever recovered who received so many wounds as did Kairi in this unequal combat. End of chapter 35「Chapter thirty six of the Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Chapter thirty six Discovery of Beckworth's Pass. No pecuniary reward for public services. Transformation. A new character. Emigrants at home and at their journey's end. Description of the Happy Valley, 
interesting reminiscences. The next spring I engaged in mining and prospecting in various parts of the gold region. I advanced as far as the American Valley, having one man in my company, and proceeded north into the Pitt River country, where we had a slight difficulty with the Indians. We had come upon a party who manifested the utmost friendship towards us, but I, knowing how far friendly appearances could be trusted to, cautioned my partner on no account to relinquish his gun, if the Indians should attempt to take it. They crowded round us, pretending to have the greatest interest in the pack that we carried, until they made a sudden spring and seized our guns and attempted to wrest them from our grasp. I jerked from them and retreated a few steps, then, cocking my gun, I bade them, if they wished to fight, to come on. This produced a change in their feelings, and they were very friendly again, begging caps and ammunition of us, which, of course, we refused. We then walked backwards for about 150 yards, still keeping our pieces ready should they attempt further hostilities, but they did not deem it prudent to molest us again. While on this excursion, I discovered what is now known as Beckwith's Pass in the Sierra Nevada. For some of the elevation over which we passed, I remarked a place far away to the southward that seemed lower than any other. I made no mention of it to my companion, but thought that at some future time I would examine into it further. I continued on to Shasta with my fellow traveler and returned after a fruitless journey of eighteen days. After a short stay in the American Valley, I again started out with a prospecting party of twelve men. We killed a bullock before starting out and dried the meat in order to have provisions to last us during the trip. We proceeded in an easterly direction and all busied themselves in searching for gold. But my errand was of a different character. I had come to discover what I suspected to be a pass. It was the latter end of April when we entered upon an extensive valley at the northwest extremity of the Sierra Range. The valley was already robed in freshest verdure, contrasting most delightfully with the huge snow-clad masses of rocks we had just left. Flowers of every variety and hue spread their variegated charms before us. Magpies were chattering and gorgeously plumaged. Birds were car caroling in the delights of unmolested solitude. Swarms of wild geese and ducks were swimming on the surface of the cool crystal stream, which was the central fork of the Rio de las Plumas, or sailed the air in clouds over our heads. Deer and antelope filled the plains, and their boldness was conclusive that the hunter's rifles was to them unknown. Nowhere visible were any traces of the white man's approach, and is probable that our steps were the first that ever walked the spot. We struck across this beautiful valley to the waters of the Yuba, from thence to the waters of the Trukchi, which latter flowed in an easterly direction, telling us we were on the eastern slope of the mountain range. This, I at once saw, would afford the best wagon road into the American Valley, approaching from the eastward and I imparted my views to three of my companions in whose judgment I placed the most confidence. They thought highly of the discovery, and even proposed to associate with me in opening the road. We also found gold, but not in sufficient quantity to warrant our working it, and furthermore the ground was too wet to admit of our prospecting to our any advantage. On my return to the American Valley, I made known my discovery to Mr. Turner, a proprietor of the American ranch, who entered enthusiastically into my views. It was a thing, he said, he had never dreamed of before. If I could but carry out my plan and divert travel into the road, he thought I should be a made man for life. Thereupon he drew me up a subscription list setting forth the merits of the project and showing how the road could be made practicable to Bidwell's Bar and thence to Marysville, where which latter place would derive peculiar advantages from the discovery. He headed the subscription with two hundred dollars. 
When I reached Bidwell's bar and unfolded my project, the town was seized with a perfect mania for the opening of the route. The subscriptions towards the fund required for its accomplishment amounted to five hundred dollars. I then proceeded to Marysville, a place which would unquestionably derive greater benefit from the newly discovered route than any other place on the way, since this must be the entrepot or principal starting place for emigrants. I communicated with several of the most influential residents on the subject in hand. They also spoke very encouragingly of my undertaking and referred me before all others to the mayor of the city. Accordingly, I waited upon that gentleman, a Mr. Miles, and brought the matter under his notice, representing it as being a legitimate matter for his interference and offering substantial advantages to the commercial prosperity of the city. The mayor entered warmly into my views and pronounced it as his opinion that the profits resulting from the speculation could not be less than from six to ten thousand dollars, and as the benefits accruing the city would be incalculable, he would insure my expenses while engaged upon it. I mentioned that I should prefer some guarantee before entering upon my labors to secure me against loss of what money I might lay out. Leave that to me, said the mayor. I will attend to the whole affair. I feel confident that a subject of so great importance to our interest will engage the earliest attention. I thereupon left the whole proceeding in his hands and immediately setting men to work upon the road went out to the Trutchy to turn emigration into my newly discovered route. While thus busily engaged, I was seized with erysipelas and abandoned all hopes of recovery. I was over 100 miles away from medical assistance, and my only shelter was a brush tent. I made my will and resigned myself to death. Life still lingered in me, however, and a train of wagons came up and encamped near to where I lay. I was reduced to a very low condition, but I saw the drivers and acquainted them with the object which had brought me out there. They offered to attempt the new road if I thought myself sufficiently strong to guide them through it. The women, God bless them, came to my assistance, and through their kind attentions and excellent nursing, I rapidly recovered from my lingering sickness until I was soon able to mount my horse and lead the first train, consisting of seventeen wagons, through Beckwards Pass. We reached the American Valley without the least accident, and the immigrants expressed entire satisfaction with the route. I returned with the train through to Marysville, and on the intelligence being communicated of the practicability of my road, there was quite a public rejoicing. A northern route had been discovered, and the city had received an impetus that would advance her beyond all her sisters on the Pacific shore. I felt proud of my achievements and was foolish enough to promise myself a substantial recognition of my labors. I was destined to be disappointed, for that same night Marysville was laid in ashes. The mayor of the ruined town congratulated me upon bringing a train through. He expressed great delight at my good fortune, but regretted that their recent calamity had placed it entirely beyond his power to obtain for me any substantial reward, with the exception of some two hundred dollars subscribed by some liberal-minded citizens of Marysville. I have received no indemnification for the money and labor I have expended upon my discovery. The city has been greatly benefited by it, as all much acknowledge, for the emigrants that now flock to Marysville would otherwise have gone to Sacramento. Sixteen hundred dollars I expended upon the road is forever gone. But those who derive advantage from this outlay and loss of time devoted no thought to the discoverer, nor do I see clearly how I am to help myself. For everyone knows I cannot roll a mountain into the pass and shut it up. But there is one thing certain, though. 
although I recognize no superior in love of country, and feel in all its force the obligation imposed upon me to advance her interest, still, when I go out, hunting in the mountains, a road for everybody to pass through, and expending my time and capital upon an object for which I shall derive no benefit, it will be because i have nothing better to do in the spring of eighteen fifty two i established myself in beckworth valley and finally found myself transformed into a hotel keeper and chief of a trading post my house is considered the emigrant's landing place as it is the first ranch he arrives at in the golden state and is the only house between this point and salt lake here is a valley 240 miles in circumference, containing some of the choicest land in the world. Its yield of hay is incalculable. The red and white clovers spring up spontaneously, and the grass that covers its smooth surface is of the most nutritious nature. When the weary, toil-worn emigrant reaches this valley, he feels himself secure. He can lay himself down and taste refreshing repose undisturbed by the fear of indians his cattle can graze around him in pasture up to their eyes without running any danger of being driven off by the arabs of the forest and springs flow before them as pure as any that refreshes this verdant earth when i stand at my door and watch the weary wayworn travellers approach their wagons holding together by a miracle their stock in the last stage of emaciation and themselves a perfect exaggeration of caricature i frequently amuse myself with imagining the contrast they must offer to the two ensemble and general opinion that presented to their daring friends when they first set out upon their journey we will take a fancy sketch of them as they start from their homes we will fancy their strong and well-stored wagon brand new for the occasion and so firmly put together that to look at it one would suppose it fit to circumrotate the globe as many times as there are spokes in the wheels then their fat and frightened steers so high-spirited and fractious that it takes the father and his two or three sons to get each under the yoke next the ambitious emigrant and his proud family with their highly raised expectations of the future that is before them. The father, so confident and important, who deems the eastern states unworthy of his abilities and can alone find a sufficiently ample field in the growing republic on the Pacific side. The mother, who is unwilling to leave her pleasant gossiping friends and early associations, is still half tempted to believe that the crop of gold that waits their gathering may indemnify her for her labors. So they pull up stakes and leave town in good style, expecting to return, withhold cartloads of gold dust, and dazzle their neighbors' eyes with their excellent good fortune. The girls, dear creatures, put on their very best as all their admiring beau assembled to see them and to give them the last kiss they will receive east of the nevada mountains for their idea is that they will be snatched up and married the moment they step over the threshold into california by some fine young gentleman who is a solid pile of gold and they joyously start away in anticipation of the event their hats decked with ribbons, their persons in long flowing riding dresses, their delicate fingers glittering with rings, their charming little ankles encased in their fashionable and neatly laced gaiters. At the close of the day, perhaps amid a pelting rain, these same parties heave wearily into sight. They have achieved the passage of the plains and their pleasant eastern homes, with their agreeable, sociable neighbors, are now at a distance it is painful to contemplate. The brave show they made at starting, as the whole town hurried them off, is sadly faded away. Their wagon appears like a relic of the revolution after doing hard service for the commissariat. Its cover burned into holes and torn to tatters, its strong axles replaced, 
with rough pieces of trees hewn by the wayside the tires bound on with ropes the iron linchpins gone and chips of hickory substituted and rags wound round the hubs to hold them together which they keep continually wetted to prevent falling to pieces the oxen are held up by the tail to keep them upon their legs and the ravens and magpies evidently feel themselves ill-treated in being driven off from what they deem their lawful rights the old folks are peevish and quarrelsome the young men are so headstrong and the small children so full of wants and precisely at a time when everything has given out and they have nothing to pacify them with but the poor girls have suffered the most their glossy luxuriant locks that won so much admiration are now frizzled and discovered by the sun their elegant writing habit is replaced with an improvised bloomer and their neat little feet are exposed in sad disarray their fingers are white no longer and in place of rings we see sundry bits of rag wound round to keep the dirt from entering their sore cuts the young men of gold who look so attractive in the distance are now too often found to be worthless of no intrinsic value their time employed in haunting gaming tables or dram shops and their habits corrupted by unthrift and dissipation i do not wish to speak disparagingly of my adopted state and by no means to intimate the slightest disrespect to the many worthy citizens who have crossed the plains i appeal to the many who have witnessed the picture for the accuracy of my portraiture so much good material constantly infused into society ought to improve the character of the compound but the demoralizing effect of transplantation greatly neutralize the benefits take a family from their peaceful and happy home in a community where good morals are observed and the tone of society exercises a salutary influence and over the thoughts of both old and young and put them in such a place as this where all is chaotic and the principles that regulate the social intercourse of men are not yet recognized as law and their dignity of thought and prestige of position is bereft from them they have to struggle among a greedy unscrupulous populace for the means of living their homes have yet acquired no comfort and they feel isolated and abandoned and it is even worse upon the children all corrective influence is removed from them and the examples that surround them are often of the most vicious and worst possible description all wholesome objects of ambition being removed and money alone substituted as a reward of their greed they grow up unlike their fathers and is only those in whom there is a solid substratum of correct feeling that mature into good citizens and proper men the girls too little darlings suffer severely they have left their worthy sweethearts behind and cannot get back to them and those who now offer themselves here are not fit to bestow a thought upon everything is strange to them they miss their little social reunions their quilting parties their winter quadrilles the gossip of the village their delightful summer haunts and their dear paternal fireside they have no pursuits except of the grosser kind and all their refinements are roughed over by the prevailing struggle after gold much stock is lost in crossing the plains through their drinking the alkali water which flows from the sierra nevada becoming impregnated with the poisonous material either in its source or in its passage among the rocks there are also poisonous herbs springing up in the region of the mineral waters which the poor famishing animals devour without stint those who survive until they reach the valley are generally too far gone for recovery and die while resting to recruit their strength their infected flesh furnishes food to thousands of wolves which infest this place in the winter and its effect upon them is singular it depilates their warm 
coats of fur and renders their pelts as bare as the palm of a man's hand. My faithful dogs have killed numbers of them at different times, divested entirely of hair except on the extremity of the nose, ears, and tail. They present a truly comical and extraordinary appearance. This general loss of cattle deprives many of the poor emigrants of the means of hauling their lightened wagons, which, by the time they reach my ranch, seldom contain anything more than their family clothing and bedding. Frequently, I have observed wagons pass my house with one starveling yoke of cattle to drag them, and the family straggling on foot behind. Numbers have put up at my ranch without a morsel of food and without a dollar in the world to procure any. They never were refused what they asked for at my house, and during the short space that I have spent in the valley, I have furnished provisions and other necessaries to the numerous sufferers who have applied for them to a very serious amount. Some have since paid me, but the bills of many remain unsettled. Still, although a prudent businessman would condemn the proceedings, I cannot find it in my heart to refuse relief to such necessities, and, if my pocket suffers a little, I have my recompense in a feeling of internal satisfaction. My pleasant valley is thirty-five miles at its greatest breadth. It is irrigated by two streams with their various small tributaries. These form a junction about ten miles from my house up the valley, which, as you remount it, becomes the central fork of the Feather River. All these streams abound with trout, some of them weighing seven or eight pounds. In the main ones, there are also plenty of otter. Antelopes and deer are to be found the entire year, unless the winter is unusually severe, when they cross the mountains in the eastern slope. Grizzly bears come and disappear again without asking leave of any man. There are wolves of every species, together with foxes, hares, rabbits, and other animals. Of the feathered tribe, we have wild geese, ducks, sage hems, grouse, and a large variety of smaller birds. Service berries and cherries are the only kinds of fruit that grow from nature's cultivation. The growth of timber about the valley is principally pitch pine, although there is a considerable intermixture of cedar. I have never yet sown any grain, but I have cultivated a small kitchen garden and raised cabbage, turnips, and radishes of great size. I have never known the snow to fall to a greater depth than three feet, and when the storms are over, it dissolves very rapidly, notwithstanding the elevation is many thousand feet above the level of the Pacific. The snow clings to the mountain peaks that overlook the valley to the eastward the year round, and as it is continually melting and feeding the streams, it keeps the water icy cold all the summer through. About a mile and a half distance from my house, there is a large sulfur spring, and on the eastern slope, in the desert, there are copious hot springs, supplying the traveler with boiling water for his coffee without the cost of fuel. The trunk tree rises on the summit of the Sierra Nevada. Opposite the headwaters of the Yuba, and runs in an easterly direction until it loses itself in Pyramid Lake, about fifty miles east of this valley. This lake is a great natural curiosity, as it receives not alone the waters of the Trunchy, but numerous other streams, and has no visible outlet. Its surcharge of water probably filtering into the earth like St. Mary's River and some others I have met with. There is no place in the whole state that offers so many attractions for a few weeks or months' retirement, for its charms of scenery with sylvan and piscatorial sports present unusual attractions. During the winter season, my nearest neighbors are 16 miles away. In the summer, they are within four miles of my house, so that social broils do not much disturb me. There is a pleasant hysterical incident associated with St. Mary's River, which, as 
it can be familiar to but few of my readers i will relate here the saint mary's river is known to most persons as the river humboldt since that is the name that has been since conferred upon it in honor of the distinguished european traveler i prefer the former name as being more poetical though less assuming an indian woman the wife of a canadian named chapineau who acted as interpreter and guide to lewis and clark during their explorations of the rocky mountains was suddenly seized with the pains of labor and gave birth to a son on the banks of this mysterious river the red-headed chief clark adopted the child thus rudely issued into the world and on his return to st louis took the infant with him and baptized it john baptist clark chapineau after a careful culture of his mind the boy was sent to europe to complete his education but the indian was ineffaceable in him the indian lodge and his native mountain fastnesses possess greater charms than the luxuries of civilized life he returned to the desert and passed his days with his tribe mary the mother of the child was a crow very pleasing and intelligent and may have been for all i know connected with some of my many relatives in that tribe it was in honor of this event and to perpetuate her memory that the river received its original name st mary's and as such is still known to the mountaineers End of chapter 36、Chapter、37 Mistakes Regarding the Character of the Indian Extent of the Western Tribes Their character, how a war against them should be conducted. Reflections, closing address to the Indian heroine. As an American citizen, a friend of my race, and a sincere lover of my country, and also as one well acquainted with the Indian character, I feel that I cannot properly conclude the record of my eventual life without saying something for the red man. It should be remembered when judging of their acts that they consider the country they inhabit as the gift of the great spirit, and they resent in their hearts the invasion of the immigrant just as much as any civilized person people would. If another nation without permission should cross their territory, it must also be understood that the Indians believe the buffalo to be theirs by inheritance, not as game, but in the light of ownership. Given to them by providence for their support and comfort, and that when an immigrant shoots a buffalo, the Indian looks upon it exactly as the destruction by a stranger of so much private property. With these ideas clearly in mind to the reader, it can be understood why the Indian, in destroying a cow belonging to white people or stealing a horse, considers himself as merely. Retaliating for injuries received, repaying himself, in fact, for what he has lost. For this act on the part of the red man, the United States troops are often turned indiscriminately upon his race. The innocent generally suffer, and those who have raised the storm cannot understand of what crime they can be guilty. But if the government is determined to make war upon the Western tribes, let it be done intelligently and so effectually that mercy will temper justice. To attempt to chastise the Indians with the United States troops is simply ridiculous. The expense of such campaigns is only surpassed by the inefficiency. The Indians live on horseback, and they can steal and drive off the government horses faster than they can bring them together. The Indians, having no stationary villages, they can travel faster, even with the encumbrances of their lodges, women, and children, subsisting themselves on buffalo slain on the way, than any force, however richly appointed, the country could send against them. 
an army must tire out in such a chase before summer is gone while the indians will constantly harass it with their sharpshooters and should several powerful tribes unite not an unusual occurrence many thousand men will make no impression it should also be recollected by our officers sent to fight in the rocky mountains that the indians have a mode of telegraphing by the aid of robes and mirrors and thus by having their spies stationed at convenient distances they convey intelligence of the movements of their enemies at great distances and in very few minutes thus informing villages whether it would be best to retreat or not some tribes telegraph by fire at night and by smoke in the daytime an officer might hear of a band of warriors encamped at a certain place he immediately makes a forced march and when his troops arrive at their destination these same warriors may be many miles in his rear and camped on his trail a village of three hundred lodges of crows or cheyennes could within thirty minutes after receiving an order to move have all their lodges struck the poles attached to the horses and their men women and children going at full speed and could thus outstrip the breast dragoon sent in their pursuit i have seen enough of indian treaties and annuities to satisfy me that their effects for good are worse than fruitless the idea formed by the indians is that the annuities are sent to them by the great white chief because he is afraid of them and wishes to purchase their friendship there are some of the tribes a very few who would keep a treaty sacred but the majority would not be bound by one for they cannot understand their nature. When caught at a disadvantage and reduced to enter into a compact, they would agree to any proposals that were offered. But when the controlling power is withdrawn and they can repeat their depredations with apparent impunity, no moral obligation would restrain them, and the treaty that was negotiated at so much cost to the country proves a mere delusion the officer having a charge of an expedition against the indian should rightly understand which band of a tribe he is commissioned to punish the Sioux, for instance which a few years ago could raise thirty thousand warriors are divided into many bands which at times are hundreds of miles apart one band of that tribe may commit a depredation on the emigrant road and the other bands not even have heard of it. They do not hold themselves amenable for the misdeeds of another body totally distinct from them in social relations, and to inflict chastisement upon them in such a case would be a manifest injustice. But in a case of extreme danger, all these bands coalesce. Other tribes have the same divisions into distinct bands, many are hence led into the belief that each band is a tribe the Sioux range over a territory upward of a thousand miles in extent from north to south and their country embraces some of the most beautiful spots in the world as well for natural scenery as for extreme productiveness of soil the crows have but one band proper although they are generally divided into two villages as being a more convenient arrangement to afford pasture for their immense herd of horses and also to hunt the buffalo but these two villages are seldom more than three hundred miles apart generally much nearer they come together at least once a year and have frequent accidental coalitions in the course of their wanderings they speak the grovan language from which nation they are an offshoot the pawnees are probably the most degraded in point of morals of all the western tribes they are held in such contempt by the other tribes that none will make treaties with them they are a populous nation and are inveterate against the whites killing them wherever met a treaty concluded with that nation at night would be violated the next morning those who engage in warfare with the western indians will remember that they take no prisoners except women and children 
It is generally believed that the Siouxs never kill white men, but this is a mistake. They have always killed them. I have seen white men's scalps in their hands, many still fresh, hanging in the smoke of their lodges. The Western Indians have no hummocks or everglades to fight among, but they have their boundless prairies to weary an army in, and the fastnesses of the Rocky Mountains to retreat to. Should a majority of these powerful nations coalesce in defense against one common enemy, it would be the worst Indian war, the most costly in blood and treasure that the national government has ever entered into. Coalition tribes could bring 250,000 warriors against any hostile force, and I know I am greatly within the limits of truth in assigning that number to them. If it is the policy of the government to utterly exterminate the Indian race, the most expeditious manner of effecting this ought to be the one adopted. The introduction of whiskey among the red men under the connivance of government agents leads to the demoralization and consequent extermination by more powerful races of thousands of Indians annually. Still, this infernal agent is not effectual. The Indians diminish in numbers, but with comparative slowness. The most direct and speedy mode of clearing the land of them would be by the simple means of starvation, by depriving them of their hereditary sustenance the buffalo. To effect this, send an army of hundreds among them to root out and destroy in every possible manner the animal in question. They can shoot them, poison them, dig pitfalls for them, and resort to numberless other contrivances to efface the devoted animals, which serves, it would seem, by the wealth of his carcass to preserve the Indians, and thus impede the expanding development of civilization. To fight the Indians via armies, the government could employ no such effectual means as to take into its service 500 mountaineers for the space of one year, and any one tribe of Indians that they should fall afoul of could never survive the contest. Such men employed for that purpose would have no encumbrances from super purposeless baggage to impede them in a pursuit or a retreat over their illimitable plains. The mode of life of a mountaineer just fits him for an Indian fighter, and if he has to submit to privation and put up with an empty commiserat, he has the means of support always at hand. He is so much an Indian from habit that he can fight them in their own way. If they steal his horse, he can steal theirs in return. If they snatch a hasty repose in the open air, it is all he asks for himself, and his health and spirits are fortified with such rich regimen. It is only by men possessing the qualities of the white hunter, combined with the Indian habits, that the Indians can be effectual and economically conquered. I have now presented a plain, unvarnished statement of the most noteworthy occurrences of my life, and in so doing I have necessarily led the reader through a variety of savage scenes at which his heart must sicken. The narrative, however, is not without its use. The restless, youthful mind that wearies with the monotony of peaceful, everyday existence and aspires after a career of wild adventure and thrilling romance, will find, by my experience, that such a life is by no means one of comfort, and that the excitement which it affords is very dearly purchased by the opportunities lost of gaining far more profitable wisdom. Where one man would be spared, as I have been, to pass through the perils of fasting, the encounters with the savage, and the fury of the wild beasts, and still preserve his life, and attain an age of near three score, it is not too much to say that five hundred would perish with not a single loved one near to catch his last whispered accent, would die in the wilderness, either in solitude, or with the fiendish savage shrieking and revolting triumph in his ears. I now close the chapter of my eventful life. 
I feel that time is pressing, and the reminiscence of the past, stripped of all that was unpleasant, comes crowding upon me. My heart turns naturally to my adopted people. I think of my son, who is the chief. I think of his mother, who went unharmed through the medicine lodge. I think of Bar Chiampi, the brave heroine. I see her, tearful, watching my departure from the banks of the Yellowstone. Her nation expects my return, that I may be buried with my supposed fathers. But none look so eagerly for the great warrior as Pine Leaf, the Indian heroine. I've seen her in her youthful years. Her heart was light and free. Her black eyes never dimmed with tears. So happy then was she, when warriors from the fight returned and halted for display. The trophies that the victors won, she was first to bring away. I've seen her kiss her brother's cheek when he was called to go, the lurking enemy to seek, or chase the buffalo. She loved him with her sister's love. He was the only son, and finally prized him far above the warrior's heart she won. I've seen her in her morning hours. That brother had been slain. Her head that off was decked with flowers, now shed its crimson rain. Her bleeding head and bleeding hand, her crimson clotted hair. Her brother's in the spirit land, and hence her keen despair. I've heard her make a solemn vow. A warrior I will be until a hundred foes shall bow and yield their scalps to me. I will revenge my brother's death. I swear it on my life, or never, while I draw a breath, will I become a wife. I've seen her on her foaming steed with battle axe at hand, pursuing at her utmost speed the Blackfoot and the Cheyenne. I've seen her weld a polished lance a hundred times and more, when charging fierce in the advance amid the battle's roar. I've seen her with her scalping knife spring on the fallen foe, and ere he was yet void of life, make sure to count her coup. I've seen her at full speed again, off draw her trusty bow, across her arrow take good aim, and lay a warrior low. I've heard her say, I'll take my shield, my battle axe and bow and follow you through glen or field, where e'er you dare to go. I rush amid the blood and strife, where any warrior leads, Pine Leaf would choose to lose her life amid such daring deeds. I've heard her say, the spirit land is where my thoughts incline, where I can grasp my brother's hand extended now for mine. There's nothing now in this wide world no ties that bid me stay, but a broken-hearted Indian girl. I weep both night and day. He tells me in my midnight dreams I must revenge his fall. Then comes where flowers and cooling streams surround their spirits all. He tells me that the hunting ground so far away on high is filled with warriors all around who numbly here did die. He says that all is joy and mirth, where the great spirit lives, and joy that's never known on earth, he constantly receives. No brother to revenge his wrongs, the war path is my road. A few more days I'll sing his songs, then high to his abode. I've heard her say, I'll be your bride. You waited long, I know. A hundred foes by me have died. By my own hand laid low. Tis for my nation's good I wed, for I would still be free. Until I slumber with the dead, but I will marry thee. And when I left the heroine, a tear stood in her eye. At last I held her hand in mine, and whispered goodbye. Oh, will you soon return again? The heroine did say, yes. When the green grass decks the plain, I said it came away. The end. End of chapter 37 
Recording by Gary Ullman, my village blogger, West Palm Beach, Florida. End of the Life and Adventures of James P. Beckworth by Thomas D. Bonner.